Preface and Chapter 1 of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand, a record of the first exploration of the chief glaciers and ranges of the Southern Alps. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Gail Timmerman Vaughan.co.nz. Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand. A record of the first exploration of the chief glaciers and ranges of the Southern Alps by Arthur Paul Harper. Preface and Chapter One. In the years 1889, 1890, 1891, 1892, I made holiday expeditions to the Tasman district of the Southern Alps, and in 1893, 1894, 1895, was employed by the New Zealand government to explore the valleys and glaciers of the west coast of the South Island. I do not pretend to have made many high ascents, but base my claim to be considered an authority on the Alps of New Zealand on the fact that I have shared in the first exploration of nearly every glacier in the central position of these mountains. It is not right in my opinion for one who has special knowledge on a subject of general interest to keep that knowledge to himself, and for this reason, as well as with the object of recording our work and helping others by our experiences, I have ventured to write the following pages. The work of map-making and topographical exploration is sometimes undervalued, and a man's capabilities and exploits too often estimated by the number of high ascents made and new routes discovered by him, without considering the usefulness of the results. It is impossible to map the country without a vast deal of hard and more or less monotonous work, and those who in after years make use of the maps are apt to forget this. We too frequently find climbers ignoring those who have preceded them and whose work has materially helped them. Some even attempt to add to their own exploits by omitting to acknowledge their predecessor's work. This is especially the case in the opening up of a country that is little known, and it is therefore right that a record of the first explorations should be made. I have, in the following pages, recorded all the pioneer work which has materially contributed to the present topographical knowledge of the central portion of the Southern Alps. Not having studied any of the standard books on glacier science, my theories and conclusions are the results of the observations of several years, and I may have dwelt unnecessarily on points which are well known to those who are authorities on the subject. Of adventures we had, of course, enough to satisfy any ordinary human beings, but they were so bound up with the work that we were apt to take them as a matter of course. I have, however, in recording our progress, described a sufficient number to convey an idea of the conditions under which the work had to be carried out. If the life was rough, I fear my account of it is rougher, but hope that the facts here set down may be none the less interesting because they appear in somewhat crude language. Should any fellow member of the Alpine Club decide to come and climb our peaks, I shall be only too glad to give him all the information in my power, and trust that he will take this offer seriously and write to me should he need advice. The map published in this volume has already appeared, excepting a few additional details which I have since added in Mr. E. A. Fitzgerald's publication. Before leaving the survey office in Hokitika, I helped the draftsman to record the results of Mr. Douglas's and my work on the map at Mr. Fitzgerald's request, in order that the tracing which was sent to him might be, quote, up to date, end quote, for though the last of the unexplored country had been mapped by us before his arrival in New Zealand, it had not been transferred to the standard map. Arthur P. Harper, January, 1896. Note. It is considered desirable to state that the letter announcing the transmission of the manuscript of Mr. Harper's book is dated Christchurch, New Zealand, March 18, 1896. The manuscript was received in England on May 18th. T. Fisher Unwin. End of note. Chapter 1. Introductory Remarks on the Southern Alps and Climbing in New Zealand. The main features of the mountain system of the South Island of New Zealand are tolerably well known and need only be generally referred to here. Beginning at the north end of the South Island, we find, in Nelson and Marlborough provinces, numerous ranges spreading from coast to coast, and reaching in some instances an altitude of 9,000 feet. Amongst these hills very little flat land is to be found, though there is a vast area of low undulating grass and forest country, well fitted for pastoral purposes. Though no glaciers exist in this part of the island, there are many grand peaks on which snow is found during most of the year, while the lower spurs are often clothed 
with luxuriant forest of which a considerable area has been cleared and opened up for settlement further south these ranges draw together till in the southern alps they form a great mountain wall running from northeast to southwest which sends off a number of spurs rising into bold ice-clad peaks and for upwards of one hundred miles presents a snowy barrier between the west and east coast districts to the eastward the southern alps send out great buttresses or offshoots terminating suddenly in the broad canterbury and mackenzie plains which form by their absolute flatness and vast extent a striking contrast to the peaks behind to the westward they slope rapidly and in many cases fall in sheer precipices for some thousands of feet to the coast leaving about ten miles of comparatively level country between them and the sea until the sounds of otago are reached here in the province of otago the chain spreads out again from coast to coast in lower hills amongst which are flourishing farms and sheep stations on the eastern side of the island while on the westward side the mountains rise abruptly out of the sea to a great height amongst the otago hills lie the beautiful lakes of wakatipu tianao wanaka etc which are backed by mounts aspiring Ernslaw and other fine alpine peaks reaching in some instances over nine thousand feet as the subject matter of this book is confined to the central portion of the southern alps amongst the larger glaciers and highest peaks a short description of the general topography of the mountains to the north and south of that district will be sufficient between christchurch on the east coast and hokitika on the west coast a coach road unsurpassed by any i have seen elsewhere runs over arthur's pass at an altitude of a little over three thousand feet a railway presenting some formidable engineering difficulties is now in course of construction by this route for some distances south of arthur's pass the southern alps only rise above the snow line in the peaks there being many passes free from snow in the summer many fine glaciers exist however at the head of the waimakariri river which rises near the pass and flows eastward south of this river is the rakaia which makes its rise from the glaciers on the main range and those of mount aerosmith and the surrounding peaks the chief sources being the ramsey and lyle glaciers both of considerable size the latter at present is practically unexplored the peaks in this locality are very fine the chief one mount aerosmith nine thousand one hundred and seventy one feet being an offshoot of the main range and forming a splendid group of rock peaks comparatively little beyond general information is known of this locality from an alpine point of view only one or two parties have been there for short visits but it is easily accessible as there are sheep stations and homesteads within easy reach of the chief points of interest note new zealand alpine journal volume one page one hundred and forty two end of note alpine passes ought to be found over the dividing range without difficulty at this point and no doubt before long we shall have more accurate and detailed knowledge of what ought to prove a very interesting district the only record of a transalpine pass in this district is that made by mr g j roberts and his survey party in the seventies when he ascended a branch of the wanganui river on the west coast and reached the watershed afterwards the same party having come round by coach to canterbury carried their triangulation up the rakaia river and joined the west and east coast surveys ascending to the same point on the divide thus proving a pass practicable south of the rakaia the rangitata river flows from two or three glaciers of more or less second-rate importance as compared with other alpine districts note new zealand alpine journal volume one page twenty two end of note here again we find some fine peaks lying on spurs of the main range the highest peak in this district is mount tyndall on the divide itself but practically unknown as indeed is the whole of this district above the snow line the next and last river flowing to the east coast which need be mentioned is the waitaki river one of the largest in the south island its two main branches take their rise from the chief glaciers on the eastern slopes of the main range the northern branch comes from the Classen and godley glaciers under the name of the godley river flowing into lake tekapo and leaves it as the tekapo river till it unites with the pukaki river the main or central branch comes from the four great glaciers the murchison tasman hooker and muller and flows for thirty miles under the name of tasman river into lake pukaki and thence continues as the pukaki river until it is joined by the tekapo river the two forming with other more southerly tributaries the great waitaki river 
my personal explorations on the eastern slopes of the southern alps have been confined to the headwaters and glaciers of the central branch of this river and i shall give more detailed information of that district in a later chapter the western slopes and offshoots of the main range are very precipitous and the rivers though of considerable size are comparatively short and descending very rapidly have cut deep impassable gorges through the mountains unlike the eastern slopes which are nearly all open tussocky grass-covered country the west coast ranges are covered with dense forest to a height of three thousand five hundred feet to four thousand feet beginning at arthur's pass on the western side the first river south is the hokitika which takes its rise from small glaciers on the dividing range and corresponds to the rakaia and waimakariri on the east some thirty miles farther south is the wanganui river which drains a large part of the main range and has four or five large branches at the head of which are glaciers of second-rate size this river has never been explored except the one branch up which mr roberts went in the seventies and i believe that it heads the southern tributaries of the rakaia river and part of the rangitata about twenty miles further down the coast is the wataroa another large river draining the main range at the head of the rangitata godley and murchison glaciers it also has many large branches in the mountains up which no doubt there are considerable snowfields and some fair-sized glaciers but except the tributary coming from the Sealy pass at the head of the godly glacier it may be said to be terra incognita some fifteen miles below the wataroa is the waiho which takes its rise from some magnificent glaciers namely the burton spencer and franz joseph from the head of which saddles lead into the upper portion of the tasman glacier still travelling south along the beach we come to cook river some twenty miles below the waiho this river has three branches and draws its supplies from the fox the balfour and la perouse glaciers all of first-class importance though these streams flow into the sea some distance apart they are all closely connected in the ranges separated only by narrow ridges over which passes could easily be made below cook river the karangarua river flows into the sea at a distance of some six miles it also takes its rise from large glaciers and has three branches the copeland river from the strontian and marchant glaciers the twain river from the horace walker douglas and fitzgerald glaciers and the main branch from no particular ice field but draining the northern end of the hooker range these last three rivers the waiho cook and karangarua draw their supplies from the highest and most important part of the southern alps and correspond with the tasman river on the eastern side at the head of the karangarua a saddle leads into the landsborough river which takes its rise from four or five first-class glaciers and flows southward along the foot of the main range for forty miles on its right bank the hooker range a large and important offshoot of the main range prevents it from finding a direct course to the sea after flowing for forty miles between these two mountain chains the river takes a sweep round to the west and finds its way to the tasman ocean at a point sixty-five miles from the mccarrow glacier at its head it is joined at the bend forty miles below the mccarrow glacier by the host a small unimportant stream coming from the pass of that name and for some unexplained reason giving its name to the main river from the junction to the sea from the rakaia river to a point twenty miles down the landsborough valley the main chain practically rises above the snow line the whole way sending off long spurs or ranges on the east and more precipitous ones on the west the peaks themselves gradually become higher till in mount tasman eleven thousand four hundred and seventy five feet the divide reaches its highest point, Mount Cook, 12,349 feet, being an offshoot of the main range, and sending down all its drainage eastward into the Waitaki. South of Mount Tasman, the peaks gradually become lower, and the range assumes a rocky, saw-toothed form, sending up high rock peaks with low saddles between them, which, as the Host Pass is approached, are uncovered by snow in the summer. The Host Pass itself is the best transinsular route, being only 1,800 feet above sea level. Below this pass, there are again fine mountain groups, rising to nearly 10,000 feet, containing many magnificent ice-clad summits and glaciers of no small size. The principal of these are Aspiring, Lydia, Robinson, Ernslaw, The Ark, Castor, and Pollux, etc., all untouched from an alpine point of view, with the exception of Ernslaw, a fairly easy peak by all accounts, near Lake Wakatipu. A few miles south of Mount Sefton, 
which lies at the head of the Twain River, the Hooker Range branches off from the main divide and continues some forty or fifty miles south. This range is higher and carries far more perpetual snow and ice on it than the dividing range which runs parallel with it, for though the latter has many peaks rising to a considerable altitude, which would be covered with perpetual snow if situated a little north or south of their position, yet it is a noteworthy fact that here they are almost devoid of ice. The only reason I can give for this state of things is that the Hooker Range, being higher, cuts off the moist sea winds from the main range, thus causing a smaller annual snowfall. The principal glaciers and ice-clad peaks of the southern Alps lie between latitude 43 degrees and 45 degrees south, and in spite of the fact that this is nearer the equator than the Alps in Switzerland, the snow line is much lower here than in Europe, and our glaciers descend to lower limits. Taken as a whole, I consider that the perpetual snow line in these mountains lies between 6,000 and 6,500 feet, or nearly 3,000 feet lower than in Switzerland. I have seen one or two peaks off the main divide, which have snow on them all the summer, from 5,000 feet upwards, but these are exceptions caused by their shape and position. The glaciers descend to an extraordinarily low level. On the eastern side, the terminal face of the Tasman is only 2,354 feet above the sea, and the Muller and Hooker, 2,500 and 2,882 feet respectively. On the western side, this peculiarity is still more marked. The Franz Joseph Glacier on the Waiho River has its terminal face in latitude south 43 degrees, 25 minutes 30 seconds and though it is within fourteen miles of the sea it lies only six hundred and ninety-two feet above sea level the fox glacier a few miles further south descends to within ten miles of the beach and to six hundred and seventy feet of sea level the balfour glacier at the head of the central branch of the cook river has its terminal face at an altitude of two thousand three hundred feet these facts at first sight appear to be extraordinary but i think they might be accounted for by the peculiar climatic conditions prevailing in new zealand the northerly and westerly winds which so frequently come over the tasman sea carry an immense amount of moisture and within a few miles of the coast they meet with the great wall of the southern alps the consequence is a very heavy rainfall in some parts of the ranges amounting probably to one hundred and forty inches in the year even at hokitika on the sea beach the fall reaches a hundred and twenty six inches and it is far heavier in the mountains this great rainfall combined with the height of the mountain wall which the wind meets and which forces the moisture to a great altitude no doubt produces a correspondingly heavy snowfall and consequently low snow line when the map of the fox and franz joseph glaciers is examined it is not difficult to account for the low altitude to which these two glaciers descend they have immense neve basins, and only a narrow outlet for the ice flow, which being forced out in considerable bulk down narrow and steep valleys, descends to a far lower altitude than those of the eastern side. The Franz Joseph, for instance, descends over 8,000 feet in eight and one-half miles, a fall of more than 941 feet a mile on an average, and from the lower neve to the terminal face, the fall is still greater. For scientific men, there are several most interesting problems to solve, and a great deal remains to be done by geologists, botanists, and others. Up to the present, only those who do not mind roughing it considerably have gone far afield. It is true that the main glaciers on the eastern side have been thoroughly explored, and parties have for some years made annual expeditions to the Tasman district, climbing a few peaks and making a pass here and there but even on the eastern side of the southern alps especially north and south of the tasman district there is an immense amount of work to be done by alpine climbers the details and general topography however of the eastern slopes of the central district are well known on the western side it is only during the last three years that the ranges in this locality have been explored and mapped so far as minor detail and topography are concerned the higher peaks however have for some years past been trigonometrically fixed by the survey department from the west coast to low country and it has fallen to the lot of mr c e douglas and myself to be the first to push up the rivers and glaciers and determine the details of the topography those districts lying at the head of the wataroa and wanganui rivers on the west and rakaia and rangatata on the east have practically been left alone by alpine men and as already stated 
the first two rivers named are almost wholly unknown in their upper valleys in the south there is work for years above the snow line on the virgin peaks of the aspiring group and also of the hooker range and unless more parties take up this most fascinating of all sports the completion of the work must be left to the next generation all the larger glaciers except those up the rakaia river have now been mapped and explored i know from personal experience every one of importance in the central portion of the southern alps with the exception of the spencer up the calorie river but many points of the greatest interest have still to be settled concerning their movement advance or retreat and also respecting the positions and effect of the large ancient glaciers on the formation of the ranges and valleys end of preface and chapter one Chapter 2 of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 2 The Tasman District. Tasman District. Mount Cook. First exploration of Murchison Glacier. First ascent of Harper's Saddle. Other climbs. Necessary conditions. The only locality in the Southern Alps which has been in any way opened up for tourists is the Tasman or Mount Cook district, which includes the four large glaciers at the head of the Tasman River and nearly all the finest peaks in the Alps. The leading features of this district have already been so ably and thoroughly described by the Rev. W. S. Green, Dr. von Lindenfeld, and Mr. G. E. Mannering that I shall not dwell on the description of the scenery but shall only give a short record of my own and others' work here, which has materially added to our topographical knowledge of the district, since von Lindenfeld made his exploration of the Tasman Glacier. Note. The High Alps of New Zealand, by Rev. W. S. Green, Macmillan. Der Tasman Gletscher und St. Ungeberg, by von Lindenfeld. With Axe and Rope in the New Zealand Alps, by G. E. Mannering. Longmans. The chief point of interest is Mount Cook. 12,349 feet. For some years past, an attempt has been made amongst those who climb in New Zealand to change the name of this peak to Aorangi, a Maori word. Some of those who write articles on their climbs are fond of saying Mount Cook, or to be correct, Aorangi, or some such expression, inferring that Mount Cook is not the correct name. I have always objected to the innovation, and have made inquiries in all directions, but can find no proof whatever that Aorangi was applied to the peak, or that it ever had a distinctive name amongst the Maoris. So far as I could learn from the Maoris of the west coast, who could see Mount Cook, and the other great peaks towering up within twenty miles, they had no name for any peak or range, except those lower hills on which they ventured. Again, the Maoris had a wholesome and deeply rooted fear of the mountains. None of the old west coast natives ever went far from the low country, so it can hardly have been necessary for them to have individual names for the great snowy range. On the east coast, the Maoris could have had little knowledge of this district, as it is so far inland, and most of the South Island natives lived near the sea beach, from which Mount Cook is only in one or two places visible, and can only be distinguished by persons well acquainted with the peak. It therefore appears that if any Maori name existed, it would be known amongst the west coast natives who could see Mount Cook every clear day within twenty miles of the sea at the mouth of Cook or Weheka River, while those natives who lived on the Grey River and those settled at Jackson's Bay in the far south would be able to see it from nearly every part of the sea coast, standing out in the most unmistakable manner. In 1865 I had a Maori, of whom more will be said, with me for two months, and a very good intelligent fellow he was. I asked him one day, what does Aorangi mean, Bill? To which he answered, It means a big white cloud. I said, I suppose that is why you call Mount Cook Aorangi? Oh no, Aorangi not mountain. Aorangi a big white cloud. Here, there, said Bill, pointing out sundry large fleecy clouds. I then pressed him more on the point, and told him he knew nothing about it, and that Aorangi was the name they had for Mount Cook. But he waxed quite indignant, saying, De Maori, he no named mountains, only where he go, to white man he name em. I afterwards made inquiries from other Maoris, and always had the same reply, that they had no name for the high mountains. It is not a matter of much importance. 
but it will be a pity to have the older name of Mount Cook superseded by a Maori word which has only been applied to the peak during the present generation. The name Aorangi is no doubt a good one, and if it is considered advisable, there is no reason why it should not be adopted officially, but it is wrong to state that it is the proper name for the peak. Mount Cook is not on the main range, but lies on a ridge which branches off in a southerly direction from a point a little south of Mount Tasman, 11,475 feet. Note. See Appendix Note 2. End of note. This offshoot is about 12 miles long and includes some lower peaks of 6,000 and 7,000 feet, besides the three peaks of Mount Cook itself. On the western side, between it and the main chain, which here, after bending away to the west, turns again and runs parallel to Mount Cook, for a short distance, the Hooker Glacier lies, and on the eastern side, the Great Tasman Glacier passes along the foot, receiving supplies from the peak. The Hooker Glacier gives rise to a river of the same name, which runs in a southeastern direction along the foot of the Mount Cook Spur, to join the Tasman River some four or five miles below. A mile from the outflow of the glacier, the Hooker Stream passes, sometimes along and sometimes under, the terminal face of the Muller Glacier, which winds in a northerly direction under Mount Sefton and the other peaks of the main range. Near the terminal face of the latter glacier, the Hermitage Hotel was built in 1885, and from it parties of climbers are able to make a comfortable start on numerous expeditions. To the north of Mount Tasman, the main range continues in a northeasterly direction to Mount Ellie de Beaumont, 10,200 feet, a distance of 11 or 12 miles, after which it takes an abrupt turn to the east, to the Hochstetter Dome, 9,258 feet, and thence, again, it gradually assumes a northeasterly direction past the Godly District, to the head of the Rangatata, and so on. From a point a little east of the last-named peak, the magnificent Multibrun range of rocky peaks branches off to the south, running nearly parallel to the main range and Mount Cook, and with them enclosing the Great Tasman Glacier, which takes its rise from the peaks of Elie de Beaumont and Hochstetter Dome. Still further eastwards, another and longer divergent ridge, the Liebig Range, branches from the main chain, running for a few miles in a due easterly direction, and then, sweeping sharply round, continues for twenty miles or more in a southwesterly direction. Between this range and the Malta Brun, the Murchison Glacier flows, having a saddle at its head leading into the Tasman Glacier north of Mount Darwin. 9,715 feet. Another saddle over the main range into the Wimper Glacier on the west coast, and a third in near proximity over the Liebig Range to the Klassen Glacier, which lies at the head of the Godley River. The Murchison Glacier is the third in size of the New Zealand ice fields, and draws supplies chiefly from the Malta Brun Range. Between the latter range and the main range, the Tasman Glacier, 18 miles in length, flows receiving several large tributaries from the peaks of the Divide and Mount Cook. About six miles from the terminal face of the Tasman Glacier, at the inflow of the Ball Glacier, the government in 1891 built an iron hut, and formed a few tracks for the use of climbers, and from that date mountaineering may be said to have assumed a civilized form, for previously a start had to be made from the Hermitage Hotel, and camping necessaries had to be carried on our own shoulders over trackless moraines. Since the building of the hut, I have only been for two expeditions in this district, and, rough as the present arrangements are, as compared with Switzerland, they are luxurious when contrasted with our experience before 1891. Even now, in the Tasman, our best-known district, any expedition entails, for one not accustomed to it, a large amount of very hard work. We have no guides, and porters are difficult or almost impossible to get. The few men who have gone in for systematic work have had to learn the art of mountaineering without help, and necessarily at considerable risk. Consequently, we can boast of three or four climbers, who are almost first-class men, never having climbed with guides, and yet able to top some of our finest peaks. Alpine workers, especially in a new country like New Zealand, may be divided broadly into two classes, exploring climbers, and climbers who wish only to top peaks. Of course, many do a little of both, but one class makes exploration its hobby, 
while the other cares for climbing only and is not particular about the topography or geography of the country, often adding very little to our knowledge of the mountains. Of the two classes, I think the explorer does the most useful work. True, he gets little credit for the hardships endured, because, after many weeks of hard work, he can often only prove which routes to avoid, and someone learning this important point appears on the scene with all his predecessor's knowledge, thus saving days of reconnoitering, and completes the climber exploration. On his return, we hear the first man mentioned only as having failed at a certain place, or having made such and such mistakes, there being no acknowledgment of the benefit derived from those mistakes, or of the time saved by making use of his experiences. In another way, too, the first man has to take a second place. He may, in the course of his exploration, bring information as to a likely pass. The other makes the said pass, and writes a glowing account of, quote, first pass by so-and-so, end quote, with no mention of the fact that Mr. Explorer gave him the whole facts as to the route. The result is that many who are better men with their pens than their axes gain great kudos, while the really hard worker who has borne the brunt of the battle is unknown except to a few, and has the misfortune of seeing the results of his work not only ignored but, to a great extent, appropriated by someone else. In January 1890, Mr. G. E. Mannering and I made an expedition to this district, originally with the intention of trying Mount Cook. We formed our main camp on the site of Green's Fifth Camp, which was close to the point at which the Ball Glacier joins the Tasman, some six miles above the terminal face. The above-mentioned hut now stands on this site and has a horse track to it. But in 1890, no sort of track existed, and we had to carry our heavy loads of from 30 to 50 pounds to the camp. The route, after reaching the terminal of the Tasman Glacier, had to be taken along the bottom of the V-shaped valley, formed on the left by the hillside, and on the right by the large lateral moraine of the glacier. In places, this valley is broken, or half filled up, by large shingle fans from the hill, and between these the bottom is filled with large boulders of ten feet or so in diameter, which have fallen from the moraine, or the hillside. Consequently, our progress was painfully slow, for we were always more or less in bad training at the commencement of our trip. I remember that I used to think at the time that there could not possibly be any worse ground to travel over, but my last two seasons' work on the West Coast rivers and glaciers have caused me to modify those ideals considerably. Yet from my knowledge of Switzerland, I can say without doubt that this district presents far greater difficulties on low ground than the former would present even before it had reached its present state of good tracks and huts. But as compared with some west coast valleys, it is easy country to travel over. From our main camp, we established a bivouac on the Hochstetter Spur, near the one used by Mr. Green in 1882, and from there intended to establish another on the lower snows of the Linda Glacier, which flows down from the northern slopes of Cook, between it and Mount Tasman. The weather looked threatening, and I did not at all care to risk so high a sleeping place. But after some discussion, we went on and reached the glacier dome, a rounded peak, over which the route lay to the great ice plateau. While climbing the last rocks and pulling our loads up after us, one of the straps broke and the swag made a rapid descent for some 700 feet into a Berkschrund. This put an end to the plan of sleeping out on the Linda Glacier. Therefore, after reaching the Great Ice Plateau, we made a return to the lower bivouac at 6,500 feet. The delay caused by the recovery of our lost load proved beneficial, for a howling northwest gale sprang up that night, and made us most uncomfortable, but would have been almost fatal had it caught us at the proposed bivouac on the Linda Glacier, some 3,000 feet higher. At daylight next morning, the gale was so bad that we continued the descent and retired to our main camp having been so far successful that we could boast of being the first New Zealanders to reach the snow plateau and glacier dome. I had done a few climbs in Switzerland in 1887 and 1888, and had therefore some slight idea of the work of mountaineering, and was convinced that we had not yet had sufficient practice or experience to attempt such a difficult peak as Mount Cook. Consequently, Mannering, much against his wish, decided not to try the mountain again that year, unless we could make up a stronger party. 
This attempt was the only one I ever made on Mount Cook, but Mannering with Mr. H. Dixon again tried it the next season, and nearly succeeded in conquering it by the same route as that taken by Mr. Green in 1882. Note, quote, with axe and rope in the New Zealand Alps, end quote, by Mr. G. E. Mannering, Longmans, end of note. Instead of returning to the Hermitage by the usual route, we made the first pass over the Cook Range, via a saddle at the head of the Ball Glacier, 7,426 feet above sea level. It was an easy day's climb, and led us into the Hooker Glacier about five and a half miles above the Hermitage, and has since become quite a favorite expedition for tourists, giving, as it does, good snow and ice work, combined with glorious views of the four great glaciers and the chief peaks surrounding them. Having replenished our supplies, and being joined by Mr. H. M. Hamilton, a tourist whom we met at the hotel, we returned on the 9th January to our main camp. It was decided to give up the idea of climbing Cook, and to spend the remainder of our holiday in exploring the Murchison Valley, which joins the Tasman Valley, just opposite our camp across the glacier. Though the terminal face of the Murchison Glacier has been seen for four miles distance from the lower portion of the Tasman Glacier, it had been up to that date entirely unexplored, and was supposed to take its rise from the southern slopes of Mount Darwin. We had no reason to suppose that this was not the case, but wished to make a personal exploration of the valley. Our plan was to proceed up the Murchison to the head and cross the Maltebrun range between Mount Maltebrun, 10,421 feet, and Mount Darwin, 9,715 feet, by the saddle which was supposed to be the head of the glacier, and return down the Tasman to our camp. We expected to be able to do this in one day, but on second thoughts decided to take a blanket and a day's provisions. Starting on January 10th at 9 a.m., with light loads of about 30 pounds, and crossing the Tasman, a distance of two and a half miles, in two hours we found ourselves in the river bed of the Murchison, which, after the bad surface moraine of the Tasman, proved good traveling. Every step opened up new glaciers and peaks, and we wasted some valuable time in deciding whether these peaks were unnamed or only new views of old friends, with the result that it was 3.30 before we reached the glacier. The ice was covered with debris even worse than the Tasman Glacier. It is difficult to give an adequate idea of these terrible moraines. They must be seen by anyone wishing to realize their extent and size. Imagine loose boulders of all shapes and sizes, up to 10 or 15 feet square, thrown into heaps and hummocks a hundred feet high, and in hopeless confusion, extending for miles, and a faint idea of what we had to travel over may be formed. With this sort of traveling, it may be supposed that progress was slow, and at 5 p.m. we had only gone a mile up the glacier. Here a tributary came in from the Malta Run Range, near which was some scrub for firewood, so we took advantage of such a convenient spot, and stopped for the night. So far nothing had happened to make us doubt that we should be able to cross the saddle at the head of the glacier and reach the Ball Glacier camp the next day. Therefore, we did not economize our food that evening or the next morning at our 5 a.m. breakfast. Two miles above our camp, the glacier appeared to come from the left, off the Malta Brun Range, but on reaching the spot and ascending a rise in the ice, we discovered that it was only a tributary stream, and the main glacier lay in front of us, stretching out for miles, and evidently coming from the northern side of Darwin instead of the southern slopes. A short council of war, as to the advisability of continuing an expedition which must involve another night and day away from camp, with only enough food for one meal left, ended in our deciding to do or die. Consequently, we made for the white ice now just ahead of us, and began to move more easily and quickly. At 1.30 p.m. we saw to our joy a saddle of some 7,400 feet on our left front, which appeared to lead over the Malta Brun Range to the Tasman Glacier, at the head of a large tributary, the main glacier apparently coming from a saddle a mile or two further to the north. After some rather difficult work amongst snow-covered crevasses, and in a thick mist, we arrived on our saddle at 4.30 p.m., in a short time the fog lifted, and we were fairly puzzled to know where we had got to. No Tasman was in sight, 
but far below us an unknown glacier swept away to our right hand instead of to our left, as we had anticipated. Suddenly Mannering saw the Hochstetter Dome, which he had ascended the previous season, and then it all became evident. Instead of being on a pass over the Maltebrun range, we had ascended a spur round which the Murchison Glacier came, and the ice below us was the head of that glacier, sweeping down to the right, previous to turning at right angles round the spur on which we were. Some distance to our left we could see a saddle leading into the Tasman hopelessly out of our reach, and in front, across the head of the Murchison, another saddle over the main range, evidently leading into the Wimper Glacier, which lies at the head of a branch of the Wataroa River on the west coast. Our pass, therefore, only led us into the neve of the glacier on which we had been for the last two days. Hamilton was somewhat out of training and wanted to rest badly, so we took an hour's spell and made a rough map. Some time after 5.30 p.m. we began to retrace our steps, having left a record of the ascent of Starvation Saddle in a cairn. At 8 p.m. we found a fair bivouac, and supperless rolled ourselves in our blankets, and were soon in the land of Nod. At daybreak, after a miserably small meal, which exhausted our supplies, we moved off, and in eight hours reached the head camp, I having gone ahead to cook a meal for the others, who arrived an hour later. The result of this expedition was topographically important. It proved that the Murchison was a large glacier, as far as was then known, the second in size in New Zealand. Also, that instead of coming from Darwin's southern slopes, it came from the main range at a point two miles north of that peak, which is, as I have already explained, on the Multiprun Range, an offshoot of the Divide. Therefore, the Murchison with a Tasman encloses the Multiprun Range, like a great island in a sea of ice. The government had this glacier surveyed during the next season and proved our topographical conclusions to be correct and also showed that our sketch map was practically right in all its features. In the early part of the next season, December 1890, I formed a party consisting of Messrs. R. Blackiston, W. Beadle, and myself. But owing to some terribly bad weather and heavy snow, we did nothing till January, except twice reach the Bowl Glacier, and on each occasion being driven back by terrific storms. The season was notable for one or two things only, but all of them important. In that year, Mr. Broderick, government surveyor, completed the survey of the district, and Mannering nearly succeeded in ascending Mount Cook, in company with Mr. Dixon, a most plucky attempt. And lastly, our Blackiston and I made the first complete traverse of the Hooker Glacier, and ascent of the saddle at its head, since called Harper Saddle, 8,580 feet. The upper basin of this glacier had never been visited, though two or three attempts had been made to reach it, rendered unsuccessful by the enormous crevasses about five miles up the glacier. The previous three weeks' bad weather and heavy snow, however, had so covered the ice that I decided to make the ascent. On December 29th, Blackiston and I left the Hermitage with a light camp, which we pitched some two miles above the terminal face on the western side of the glacier. On the morning of the 30th, an unfortunately late start was made at 6.30, and after an hour or so on the lateral moraine, we took to the snow-covered ice, which rose in a succession of ice-falls, on which the snow was disagreeably soft. Thanks to the heavy fall, we were able to cross all the broken ice, but not without considerable care, as some of the crevasses were of great width. Eight hours floundering above our knees, in soft snow, brought us to the foot of the saddle, which lay at the top of an ice-wall of 250 feet, rising very steeply to within sixty feet of the top. A large bergschrund skirted the foot of this ice slope and delayed us a good deal, as it was not easily negotiated. I took the lead, for Blackiston was new to ice work, and after cutting some one hundred and twenty steps, we stood on the saddle. I have never experienced in any other climb such difficulty in the way of step cutting. For the first one hundred and eighty feet, the slope was so steep that I had to lean my chest against the ice while cutting the next steps, and could see Blackiston below me by looking between my feet. In New Zealand, there is the same trouble with fog as in Switzerland. That is to say, it is very rare that a clear view can be obtained over the west coast, 
after ten a.m., because a low dense bank of fog drifts in from the sea and fills the valleys, only allowing of six thousand feet and upwards to be seen. This is, I imagine, very much like the fog so often seen on the Italian side of the Alps. The saddle led into the La Perouse Glacier at the head of the Cook River on the west coast, but we could see nothing of the valley owing to the fog, which lay five hundred feet or so below us, and which, though we tried to descend, prevented our completing a transalpine pass. The day had been intensely hot, which made it highly probable that several snow bridges would be gone and new crevasses exposed, hence it was necessary to waste as little time as possible and to reach them before dusk. At 3.30, after leaving a record of the ascent, we began to descend, blackest and going first, and both descending backwards. The steadiness of my companion on this ice slope is beyond praise, considering that this was his first expedition on ice or snow. Unfortunately, also, it was his last, for he has never been free to climb since, and we have lost a promising mountaineer. Opposite Baker's Saddle, which lies south of Mount Stokes, and leads into the Copeland River on the west coast, we found the crevasses very much exposed, and bridges gone. No less than ten had appeared, which were invisible in the morning. One crevasse we crossed on the snow by crawling was of great breadth. I believe it was fully twenty-five feet wide. So large and numerous are these that, except early in the season, I feel convinced a route up the hooker would be a most difficult thing to find. At 7 p.m. we regained our camp, and next day, in heavy rain, retraced our steps to the hotel, fearfully burnt and sore from the glare on the fresh snow. This climb was topographically of importance, and had we had a clear view over the west coast, we could have answered some interesting questions, which, however, I was able to decide two or three years later, as will be seen in a future chapter. The actual result was that the map of the hooker was proved incorrect as regards the head basin and the position of Mount Cook, which had been placed on the main range. As a matter of fact, it is on the eastern side and sends no drainage onto the west coast at all. Mount Cook branches off at Mount Dampier, 11,323 feet, which drops on one side into the Linda Glacier, on another into the head basin of the hooker, while its third side falls precipitously into the La Perouse Glacier on the west coast. From Dampier, the main range goes to Mount Hicks, or St. David's Dome, 10,410 feet, and thence past Harper's Saddle, 8,580 feet, to Stokes, 10,101 feet, whence it bends away sharply southwards to Sefton, 10,359 feet, and Mount Burns. 8,984 feet, which lies at the head of the Müller Glacier. Though our climb finally settled the position of Mount Cook as being off the main range, it is only fair to say that Mr. Roberts of the Westland Survey Department had practically decided the point and only wanted to have it confirmed by more sure evidence. When sitting on the saddle, I planned a route up Mount Cook, which seemed to be far easier and more direct than that followed by Mr. Green, but, unfortunately, I never had an opportunity of attempting it. However, Mr. Fife, who also considered it the best route, followed it when he made the first ascent of the peak on Christmas Day, 1894. Later on in the same season, namely February, 1891, Mr. P. H. Johnson and I made another expedition to this district, intending to climb De La Beche, 9,815 feet, and the Minarets, 10,058 feet, part of the same mountain. Unfortunately, my companion fell ill, and we did nothing for a week or more, and then only made two small climbs, namely, a pass over the Maltebrun range, the first climb done on that range, and an attempt at Mount Seely, from which we were driven by a terrific northwest gale when near the top. The following summer I made three attempts at Mount de la Beche, but had the most extraordinary bad luck. The first attempt was in company with M. H. Hamilton, and we reached a point close under the main peak, some 9,000 feet above sea level, when my companion became helpless owing to sickness. I then returned and obtained Jack Adamson from the Hermitage, and with him reached the same point in such a gale of wind that we could not stand. And two days later we again went for the peak, when my mate was seized with a cramp in the stomach, which forced us to return at 8 a.m. within 900 feet of the summit. 
The only fact worth recording with regard to these climbs is that I obtained the first photographs ever taken overlooking the main range. I have the somewhat melancholy satisfaction of knowing that my route, which lay up the Rudolph Glacier and up the rock face of the peak, was the correct one. Fife, who made the first ascent of this mountain later, wrote and told me he had followed my route, and it presented no real difficulty. Mount de la Beche is one of our most beautiful peaks, and stands between the Tasman Glacier and the Kron Prince Rudolf Glacier, a large tributary flowing into the main glacier some twelve miles up. At the point where these two ice streams join, a deep, triangular hollow is found, bounded on two sides by the high lateral moraines of the two glaciers, and on the third by de la Beche. This area is filled with large masses of rock, and under one, Adamson and I built a first-rate shelter, which is really as good as a hut, forming a convenient point from which to ascend fifteen or twenty of our highest peaks. For a really successful expedition in this district, a party should be composed of four men who are willing to do a considerable amount of rough work and ready to carry their own loads. They must also have plenty of time at their command, as nearly all our old failures are due to want of time which prevented our waiting for good opportunities, and compelled us to attempt all sorts of difficult expeditions in the face of doubtful weather. There are only two parties who have done any extended work in this district in one season, and both owe their success to having plenty of time at their disposal. Those of us who used to try and climb with only a short holiday always prophesied success to the first man who could spend a month or two at the Hermitage, and that prophecy turned out to be true. In 1893-1894 season, Fife spent a considerable time in the district, and could afford to wait for his weather. Consequently, he made the first ascents of three or four of our best peaks. Again, in 1894-1895 season, Mr. Fitzgerald, with his Swiss guide Zurbriggen, had a successful season, making several ascents, and owing his success as much to the fact that he could await fine weather and good opportunities as to the fact that he had Sir Brigham to guide him. Fife's climbs were, of course, guideless, and considering that he is, like all of us, a self-taught man, they are greatly to his credit. In fact, so far as peaks are concerned, his record exceeds that of anyone who has climbed in New Zealand for bona fide merit. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Three Westland. The West Coast of New Zealand, the Forest and its Plants, Birds. In August 1893, I applied to and obtained work from the Westland Survey Department in conjunction with Mr. C. E. Douglas to continue the exploration and mapping of the rivers and glaciers with their surrounding ranges. Mr. Douglas had been working for some twenty years, following and traversing rivers to their sources. But none of the larger glaciers had been explored, except the moraine-covered Strontian on the Copeland River and Balfour Glacier on the central branch of Cook River. This was owing to the want of a man experienced in ice work, Douglas having, as a rule, only carried his work to the snow line, and having neither companion nor alpine equipment, was unable to go into high altitudes. Before relating my own experiences amongst the Westland glaciers and Alps, it will be as well to give a short description of the country. This will allow my readers to form some idea of the conditions under which our work had to be carried on. Westland, or West Coast, as it is more commonly called, was rushed by gold diggers in the early sixties, and a large amount of gold was found and exported. Now, however, it has become, from a digging point of view, a field of far less importance. True, there are still many working the alluvial ground, but those making more than tucker are few, and it is many years since a rise of importance has been made by anyone. The country itself, except for a few clearings made by settlers, may be said to be covered with dense evergreen bush, forest, up to 3,000 feet above sea level, which gradually merges into a low, impenetrable scrub growing perhaps 500 feet higher, until it gives way to luxuriant snowgrass and other alpine plants. There is a narrow strip of more or less flat country, that is, rough, low hills, 
with patches of actually flat land between the ranges and the sea, varying from 25 to 5 miles in width. It is of little value from an agricultural or pastoral point of view, covered as it is with bush, forest, and costing more than its value to clear. Here and there are large tracts of swampy ground, useless to man or beast at present, but which may prove valuable if properly drained. These large swamps are usually to be found between the rivers on the flat country, and with few exceptions confine the settlers to the river flats near the sea, where the best land is to be found. To a casual visitor, there would seem to be in Westland an inexhaustible amount of marketable timber, both on the flat country and in the ranges. The truth is, however, that beyond a certain amount on the low country, there is very little. In the ranges and up the rivers, there is practically none of value, and those trees which are worth cutting are so scattered that they would be unworkable by any mill fixed in one locality. It is doubtful if the timber up the rivers will be more than sufficient to build and keep in repair culverts and bridges when such are constructed. On the Arawata and Blue Rivers in the far south of the country, there is a very fine patch of birch, really a beech, bush, which could be worked with advantage from one centre, Douglas speaks of trees 42 feet in circumference, with a clean trunk of 90 feet to the lowest limb, growing on the Arawata. At present, however, the means of communication with the rest of the colony are very poor, a fact which adds greatly to the difficulty of making either farming or any other industry remunerative. The gold industry is the mainstay of the southern part of Westland, and there is little doubt that, should the output of the precious metal cease, there would be small inducement for a population to stay in the district. A few, possibly, who prefer a free and unfettered existence in a part of the colony where they can easily make a small living may consent to dwell in such an out-of-the-way locality. It is, however, more than probable that the minerals of Westland will continue to give employment to some number, especially when better means of communication are provided, which will allow them to be worked at less cost with more chance of profit. The only connection with the rest of the colony is by steamer and coach, while south of Ross, the communication is precarious, to say the least, only a pack-horse mail running at present. In my opinion, Westland has a great future before it, if properly and energetically pushed, as a tourist resort. Nowhere else in New Zealand is there such magnificent scenery, equaling, if not surpassing, that of Switzerland and Norway in grandeur. But it is out of reach of the ordinary tourist, unless he is willing to rough it considerably, while to see the finest views in the southern Alps on this side, days and weeks of hardship must be faced, which would frighten most people. Before any noticeable benefit can be felt from tourists, some steps must be taken to make means of transit easier. At present, owing to the unbridged state of the rivers and frequent rain, there is great risk of loss of time by being stuck up by floods. But until we have a large neighboring population, a government would hardly be justified in going to great expense in making roads and bridges. The bush. Note. In New Zealand, the forest is always spoken of as bush, as opposed to lower growth vegetation, which is called scrub. End of note. Or forest of New Zealand has often been described, but even had nothing been said on the subject, it would require a more gifted pen than mine to depict its beauties. The fascination which it has over all those who see or work in it cannot be understood by one who has not experienced it. I will not attempt to describe the innumerable beautiful ferns and mosses, and the wonderful colouring of the bush, which never cease to exercise their power over even the oldest hand, if he has any love of fine effects. When toiling through dense undergrowth, cutting a track, or carrying a heavy load, I found time to enjoy the lovely effects and fairy-like scenes met with at every turn. Yet, in spite of its many attractions, it is a serious drawback to such work as ours, or, in fact, to any which entails much travelling. Even the oldest bushman may find himself temporarily bushed, but a good man can, by use of common sense and coolness, generally find his way out somewhere, not necessarily at the place he wants to go to, but at least to some locality from which he can easily reach habitation. Common sense is not, unfortunately, a strong point with some, if we may judge by the frequent absurd actions of persons lost in the bush. For half the year it is easy to build a shelter with bark, and at all times with ferns, while no one need be without a good fire unless, of course, he has no matches. 
those who have in the past suffered from exposure have done so for want of a little thought but many when bushed seem to lose their reasoning powers for there are cases in which it has not occurred to men in such a plight to kindle a fire even though they have a plentiful supply of matches nor to try and snare a bird or eat some of the edible plants in the bush when suffering from hunger when however we hear that there have been men who on being lost in hilly country covered with timber have on reaching a river actually gone upstream in order to get into the low country it is hardly surprising that the misfortune of being bushed is often serious in its effects though there are several edible plants they are not very nourishing nor can i honestly say very nice however a hungry man must eat what he can get and i have often been glad of even a small feed of pica pica fern asplenium bulbiferum this is perhaps the best of our natural foods and the curled crozier-like shoot is quite passable when boiled for an hour in addition to this is the head of the young supplejack parsimcia albiflora a vine which grows in immense quantities up to nearly two thousand feet above sea level and is about as bad an obstacle to force a way through as i know the kihiki Freycinetia banksii which grows on the lower hills near the sea wild parsley angelica geniculata spinach tetragonia expansa and root of the bracken fern terra sesculenta are also eatable in the low country that is below twelve hundred or two thousand feet the undergrowth in the bush is bad beyond descriptions especially where supplejacks and lawyers rubus australis abound for the benefit of those who have never been in new zealand it may be explained that a lawyer is a bramble which grows in very dense masses and is covered with small thorns it is so named because when once a man is unfortunate enough to get into its clutches he finds it hard to free himself these most obstructive plants are fortunately not found above fifteen hundred feet from sea level unless the hill has sea frontage besides the plants already mentioned as eatable there are others possessing valuable medicinal qualities the best known of these is perhaps the coromico a shrub belonging to the veronica tribe which makes a good tonic useful in cases of dysentery and has already been used to make a patent medicine a certain portion of the flax plant formium tenax has an effect opposite to the coromico for external use we have the gum of the miro pine podocarpus ferruginea the finest healing ointment for an open wound that i have ever used and a sure cure for warts the maoris often take the leaf of the pepper tree drimus axillaris and after chewing it apply it to a wound which it is said to heal very soon leaving a blue tattoo mark the leaf i think is more or less poisonous and should be avoided like all those shrubs which have leaves with white undersides and dark above for camping purposes it would be difficult indeed to surpass the new zealand forest and in the mountain ranges of the west coast though we grumble at the work it involves we really have great cause to be thankful for it the eastern slopes of the southern alps are open and grass covered a great contrast to the densely timbered ranges of the west coast in the one district the want of firewood for camping purposes is felt and in the other too much timber gives a party a great deal of heavy work when travelling if it were possible to split the difference each side would be all that could be desired for explorations easy travelling combined with good camping grounds between october and march in the mountains within three thousand feet of sea level it is really not necessary to carry canvas unless of course one is fastidious as to shelter it is always possible to build a good fare or mai mai with bark stripped from the rata metrosideros robusta totra podocarpus totra or cedar libocedrus bidwillii trees all or some of which are to be found up the rivers of firewood there is such an inexhaustible supply and good variety to select from that it is always possible to keep a fire burning without any necessity to economize a great consideration in wet weather there is the rata tree the prince of firewoods very hard and burning almost like coal dry or green miki miki aki aki kamahi or so-called red birch white and black birches which are really beeches the mountain broom ribbonwood broadleaf totra and many others all burning in a green state though the first six or seven are the best and always available in the ranges while enumerating thus shortly the advantages and disadvantages of the bush i cannot pass over one of the greatest charms of camp life and work in unexplored country namely 
the birds, to whom man is a stranger. They are not only useful as food, and enable two of us to do work which really required four men, but they provide us with endless amusement when together, and are especially welcome when one is working or camping alone. First and foremost of these is the weka, Ossidromus australis, woodhen or morihen, as he is variously called, as good a camp companion as one could wish for, with his tameness, impudence, and almost human power of expression. I have never studied a weka in or near civilization, but as found in the hitherto unvisited valleys, in which my last two years have chiefly been spent, he is only approached by the kia, or mountain parrot, as a source of amusement and interest. Often Douglas and I have sighed for the powers of the artist whose zigzags at the zoo in the Strand magazine helped many a wet day to pass, wherewith to depict the many knowing expressions of the weka and kia. Perhaps it is almost unnecessary to say that the weka is a bird with small, unformed wings, unable to fly, and varying in size from a partridge to a pheasant. In plumage he is not unlike the former, sometimes dark brown, and sometimes a very light color, according to whether his habitation is in narrow and gloomy valleys or open grass country. He walks with a very genteel step, and bobs his short tail up spasmodically, his whole action suggesting the exaggerated motions of a teacher of deportment, if such a person exists outside novels. The male and female only keep together during the breeding season, and if the place they choose for their temporary abode happens to be productive of the necessaries of weka life, the cock drives his mate and family away at the end of the season, remaining in solitary possession of a good feeding ground. Should, however, the locality be indifferently productive, Mr. Weka bids the family a glad farewell on completion of his domestic duties, and seeks happier hunting grounds for himself. As to food, he is omnivorous, eating everything from a pea-rifle cartridge to the remains of one of his own tribe, or even family. I remember an instance of this when our dog unfortunately killed a young bird before we could prevent it, which was too small to eat. The parents made a decent show of grief over their loss, and then, being quite sure that the little one was dead, they proceeded to eat its still warm remains. In camp, the birds are useful as scavengers, but they are incorrigible thieves, trying to take away everything at all white or glittering. And as they are able to move a weight of two or three pounds, it can well be imagined that a careful lookout has to be kept. The glance of mingled triumph and contempt which a weka gives over his shoulder as he walks off with your pipe is inimitable, and his whole attitude would make a most laughable picture if well drawn. One of these birds will take full possession of a camp, as soon as he discovers it, generally within a few hours of its being pitched, and rarely have we been without one or a pair. No other birds or rats are allowed to come near if he can help it, but are attacked without hesitation. And if another weka dares to intrude, the one in possession will, nine times out of ten, manage to make good his claim, though sometimes the combatants seem very unevenly matched for a fight. Possession is nine points of the law. They even rush wildly at a thrush or crow, though far out of reach above them, and often resort to stratagem to induce the object of their attack to come within reach. I have seen a weka run under a shrub on which a thrush was sitting and try to frighten him. This had no effect, so our friend walked away out of sight, and in a few minutes returned, and when he had come under the thrush he suddenly tumbled down, and with stiffened limbs and ruffled feathers feigned to be dead was a fine piece of acting, but he had one wicked little eye open. The thrush looked at the motionless weka for a second or two, and then began to sing, as much as to say, I've played this game before, leaving our friend to get up and try not to look foolish. The thrush never seems to fall into the trap. The weka, though very clever in carrying out his scheme, sometimes tries it on two or three times in succession, which shows some want of intelligence. For downright impudence, too, the weka is unequalled, and no doubt this fact will help to preserve him against his new foe, the weasel, so kindly turned loose by a paternal, or shall I say maternal, government. Though really no match for such an antagonist, he will by mere bluff frighten it, for if he sees the weasel first, he will charge it, though I fear if vice versa, he will run away. The weka will figure often in these pages, so for the present we will leave him. The robin, Miro albifrons, 
is a constant companion in some localities, as far as the bush limit. He differs from his English namesake very little, only having a yellow instead of a red breast. They are quite tame and generally called dear gentle little things, but in reality they are the most vicious and quarrelsome little birds it is possible to imagine. A family of four or five seem to spend their whole time in fighting, a great contrast to the Weka family. When one is cutting or climbing through the bush, a robin nearly always follows close behind, picking up grubs exposed in the footsteps and depositing them under moss or in holes in a tree for future use. Of songbirds we find a great number in the back country, away from the haunts of men, notably the crow, Glaucopus cinerea, which has a note like a rich-toned flagellate, the most beautiful bird I have heard in our ranges. Besides him are the bellbirds, mentioned by Captain Cook, and getting very scarce. The tui, canary, and many others, all of which swell the chorus, heard every morning and evening. The canaries, orthonyx or crocephala, and the little mountain wrens, Xenicus filviventris, are useful as foretellers of weather, for they always collect in flocks and keep up a lively chirping some hours before an approaching storm, a warning which we never allow to pass unnoticed. For the camp pot there is a varied choice. The weka is perhaps the most nourishing, having a large amount of oil when in good condition. Over a quarter of a pint can be obtained from a fat bird, which, though not very palatable, is sustaining and can be baked with flour to advantage. The kiwi is passable when one is hungry, though personally I do not like him, but being more nutritious than savoury, it is not to be despised, and is almost nice when boiled with piki piki fern and rice. The kiwi is a wingless bird, and still fairly plentiful in out-of-the-way places, but on the whole is fast becoming extinct. The west coast kiwi, Apteryx oani, is a small grey bird, differing from the North Island species, Apteryx mantelli, which is dark brown and more coarsely made. With the help of a good dog, they can generally be caught asleep in the daytime, being entirely night birds. Sometimes in the spring, one or generally two eggs are to be found with a pair in their retreat, but chiefly owing to cats and weasels, there are more solitary birds than originally. The only way to account for this is that, owing to the unknown enemy which has appeared, they become frightened and are unwilling to pair. Quote, and, end quote, to quote Mr. Douglas, quote, Mrs. Kiwi probably says, what is the good of my laying that awful egg if a weasel sucks it while we are actually sitting on it? End quote. The size of the egg is well known, and it is hard to believe that so small a bird can lay one so large. However, not one but generally two are produced. Both birds sit to hatch this, which is nearly as large as a black swan's egg. Note. See Appendix. Note 3. End of note. For one could not possibly cover it alone, and there is little doubt that the warmth of decayed vegetable matter contributes largely to the hatching. Though laying two eggs, they only hatch one, and I have heard it suggested that the second is laid later and used to feed the young one, for though there is only one young bird, there are generally the remains of two eggs, and two are frequently found before hatching. During the daytime they sleep in a standing position, with their heads tucked down between their legs, looking like a fluffy ball on two sticks. When taking a kiwi from its hole, great care must be observed if the skin is required for stuffing, for while the body is warm the feathers or hair fall out, in handsful, wherever they are touched, but after it is cold it is the hardest bird to pluck I know. The caca, Nestor meridionalis, cacapo, stringops habruptilis, and kia, Nestor notabilis, of the parrot tribe, the wood pigeon, blue, grey, and paradise ducks, are all excellent for eating, and if one is hard pushed for food, the smaller birds, such as the crow, tui, parakeet, and saddlebacks, are all acceptable. The cacapo, is found in South Westland, the Sounds country of Otago, and the Nelson province. He is rarely, if ever, seen away from the birch forests. He is a large ground parrot, with a bright green plumage, and, except for descending from a rock or bluff thirty feet in height, his wings are useless to him. Like the kiwi, he is a night bird, living in holes and under rocks all day. As food, he comes second only to the weka, having a large quantity of fine oil in his body, of a light straw color. We capture him with the help of our dog, and he shows a great deal of fight before he surrenders. This bird apparently performs an operation on his food, akin to chewing the cud, that is, 
he collects a large amount of grass in his crop and retires to his refuge to chew it and when all the juice has been extracted he throws the grass out in dry bowls after feeding these birds make a booming noise not unlike the grunt of a pig and though it can be heard for a great distance it is quite impossible to locate it probably the fact of the bird being in a hole will account for the deceptive nature of the sound i have heard the noise apparently within a few yards of me and have been surprised and angry at the dog not looking for the bird where i pointed but instead of doing so he has run off up the hillside for some considerable distance and in a few moments the shrieking of the bird and barking of the dog will show that the noise had deceived me completely the crop of a kakapo when freshly killed makes a capital poultice if applied to a sore drawing out all poisonous matter quickly and effectually so the maori say though one of our largest birds it has an egg not much bigger than of a pigeon a great contrast to the enormous egg produced by such a small bird as the grey kiwi it would be both reasonable and convenient i should imagine if they could change eggs blue or mountain ducks nestor rotabilis are not now found in any numbers except in the upper parts of hitherto unvisited rivers and make a very welcome addition to our supplies which are generally at a somewhat low ebb by the time we reach the head of a river they appear to have the rivers and creeks marked off in regular divisions never encroaching on the preserves of another or allowing intrusion by a strange couple i have seen many instances of this rule of division and proved it by driving two or three pairs downstream with their broods and finding them all in their own claims next morning many a fight can be seen between two pairs when a strange couple try to jump a claim their chief weapon of attack is a horny growth on the second joint of the wing unlike most new zealand birds the male and female are partners all the year round but the female alone sits on the eggs while the male keeps guard and feeds her the paradise duck casarca variegata is too much like a tough goose in my opinion but the flappers or young ones are very good indeed when roasted here again we find a peculiarity these ducks will sometimes build their nest in a tree thirty feet from the ground but by what means they bring their young ones to terra firma or water i cannot say possibly they carry them on their backs but if they follow the usual happy-go-lucky laws of nature in new zealand it is as likely as not that the promising brood is allowed to tumble out one by one and trust to providence scientific descriptions and names of our birds can be found in sir walter buller's birds of new zealand the above short description is not intended by any means to be complete for that would be unnecessary but certain interesting habits of the birds can be noted by those who see them in their undisturbed and natural haunts which scientists may not have been able to obtain having had few opportunities to go far from civilization it is a sad fact that most of the native birds of the country are gradually disappearing in the early days those who went into unknown country found thousands of birds of all kinds but now even in localities hitherto unvisited by man birds are scarce sometimes of course they are as numerous as formerly but i have been into valleys where hardly a bird was to be seen of any kind this is largely due to cats and weasels the digger is very fond of his cat and nearly always carries one with him but in the past when new rushes were frequent he would go off at a moment's notice from his camp or hut and if the cat was not at hand it was left behind and naturally became wild these have increased and multiplied enormously and i have seen their tracks miles up unexplored valleys it has been several years since the coast was overrun by wild cats and now weasels are added to the list of enemies which the birds have to contend against it is therefore only a question of time before our most interesting birds those that cannot fly become extinct the government has widely set apart two large islands on which to preserve birds and plants and they seem to be answering their purpose these are little barrier island in the north near auckland and resolution island near the sounds in the southwest no doubt in the unexplored country behind the sounds there are still plenty of birds but there again it is only a matter of time before they are exterminated though there are wild dogs escaped from civilization they are in no great numbers as a wild life does not seem to suit them and they soon die out End of chapter three Chapter Four of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 4. The Waiho River. Franz Joseph Glacier. Journey Southwards. Waiho River. Lake Maporica. Terminal Face. Camp 1. Attempts on Glacier. Hot Springs. Camp 2. Camp 3. Icefall. Baffled. Return. On the 6th of October, 1893, Mr. C. E. Douglas and I left Hokitika with instructions to map Lake Ianthi, some 40 miles south along the road, and thence traverse the Wanganui River to the sea from the ferry on the road, after which we had to make our way further south to the Waiho River and explore the Franz Joseph Glacier. A daily coach runs to Ross, a small mining township of 500 inhabitants, 20 miles from Hokitika, and thence there is a weekly pack-horse mail service to Gillespie's Beach, 88 miles south of Ross, and near the mouth of Cook River. We therefore put our small supply of clothing on the coach as far as Ross, and here obtained three weeks' stores and a pack-horse to carry them to Lake Ianthe. It took us to the 20th to finish our work on the lake, and on the 22nd we started in a small dugout or canoe hollowed out of a tree down the outlet which flowed into the Wanganui River, and on the 24th went down the river to the sea, having some very narrow escapes in the foaming rapids. Our craft was only six feet by two feet, and very clumsily made, so we had a good deal to be thankful for in getting down safely. It was largely due to luck, helped by Douglas's steering. Next day we returned on foot to our camp, some seven miles up the river, and thence carried our impedimenta five miles on to Hendy's Ferry, which is on the main south track, thirty miles south of Ross. This road, after leaving Ross, skirts along the foot of the hills, and crosses the Wanganui at Hendy's Ferry, 30 miles, the Wataroa River at Gunn's Ferry, 50 miles, branches off to Lake Mapurica on the left hand, and Ocorito, 64 miles from Ross, on the right hand side. From the latter place, which lies on the sea beach, the road is non-existent, and it is just possible to take a wheeled vehicle to that point the journey occupying about three days from Hokitika. From Hendy's Ferry, where we slept, we carried our loads and tramped to guns on the Wataroa, and on the 20th of October went on to the Miner's Rest at the Forks, a settlement at the point where the road branches. The Forks is a township which can boast of a public house and one digger's hut, though in old days it had a large population when plenty of gold was being obtained there. Now, however, only two or three parties are working near it, and, on mail night especially, the whole neighboring population, of perhaps ten, assemble at the miners' rest. I am sorry to say they do not confine themselves to tea. On these occasions politics form the chief topic of conversation, because numbers of diggers, having Hansard's parliamentary reports sent to them gratis, and religiously reading every word, are keen politicians. I cannot conceive anyone wading through these reports, for when it is remembered that there are some members in the house who speak for no other reason than to see themselves, or for their constituents to see them, in Hansard, it can be imagined what sort of reading they afford. One evening, when we were waiting for pack horses to take our stores as far as possible up the Waiho River, I became involved in a political discussion. One of the diggers charged me with being a capitalist. How can I be a capitalist when I've no money? I answered. Money, he explained, has nothing to do with it. I remonstrated. He said, Well, I don't know about your money, but you speak like a capitalist. I again objected that I could hardly be called a capitalist if I had no capital. So he changed his ground and said, Well, you're a conservative anyway. Being of opinion that there were no conservatives in this colony, and objecting to the expression, I thought this a good opportunity to find out what politicians meant by it. So I replied, Ah, uh, yes, I may be a conservative, but you must tell me what a conservative is before I can answer. A conservative, he said hesitatingly, is, er, is a man you don't agree with. I always suspected this to be the truth of the matter, for each party generally dubs itself the great liberal party, which I suppose implies that the other side are conservatives. On the 31st we obtained two horses and went on towards Franz Joseph Glacier. About three miles from the Forks is Maparika Township, which consists of a store and a public house, with a small population of ten or twenty diggers. Here we procured our necessaries. 
a horse can be taken right up to the terminal face of the glacier, so there was no need to procure all our stores at once. We therefore only ordered enough for a month or six weeks, for we might perhaps finish our work in that time, if favoured with fine weather, and if not, could easily have more sent up. After leaving the township, the road, or horse track, skirts the beautiful Maparico Lake, and many lovely views are to be seen through openings in the bush. To see this lake to advantage, it is necessary to stay a day or two at the township, and hire a boat. I camped on a promontory, halfway up the lake, for a week, in January 1894, when surveying it, at the time of the full moon, and the views day and night were glorious. At the southern end, the snowy peaks of the Bismarck Range tower into the sky, with Mounts Cook and Tasman just appearing over them. And at a distance of nine miles, the Franz Joseph Glacier is seen coming out of the valley, between bush-clad hills, and apparently pushing its way into the bush at the head of the lake. In the foreground are numerous promontories, with great trees overhanging and reflecting in the perfectly still water, or perhaps the limb of some fallen giant stands naked out of the placid surface of the lake. After my day's work, I used to get into my boat and drift about on the lake, smoking the pipe of contentment and watching the last rays of the sun, throwing a pink glow over the great snow peaks and the gloom gradually deepening over the glacier and lower valleys. Then the moon would rise and shed its white light over the whole scene and make me loth to return to my camp in the bush with its mosquitoes. About eight miles from Maporica Township, after leaving the lake, the track passes a farm on the river flats of the Totra and Waiho rivers, on which sheep and cattle are grazed, and which is one of the few farms in the south where more than a living can be made. This is chiefly owing to the fairly large number of diggers in the district. The homestead is only a small house, but it is surrounded by a few acres of cleared land laid down in grass, and forms a pleasing contrast to the sombre-colored bush and hills behind. Crossing the Totara River, the track continues for two miles to the Waiho River, where some four or five parties are gold-digging and have their huts, one of them Mr. Jim Nisbet, having been there for over twenty years. His hut is on the north side of the river, just below where the left-hand branch, or Callery River, joins the glacier branch, or Waiho. From Nesbitt's hut, a small foot track runs along the bank of the former river for half a mile to a wire suspension footbridge, which spans the stream some fifty feet above the water, at the mouth of a magnificent gorge. This is one of the finest gorges I know, within easy reach of tourists. The river is a large glacier-fed stream, and descends very rapidly through a deep and narrow rocky gorge, above which the mountains rise abruptly to the height of three thousand or four thousand feet. The contrast of dark green bush on the almost precipitous hillsides, with the grey rock walls of the gorge rising one hundred feet sheer and overhanging out of the river, which comes boiling and roaring down over immense boulders, is very grand, while in the distance between the bush-clad hills can be seen the glaciers of Drummond's Peak, some miles up the Callery River. On the small level piece of ground, between the two branches, and at the foot of a rounded hill, the Doughboy, there's a digger's hut called the Hospital, and a few chains further on, the bank of the glacier, or right-hand branch, are some hot springs, of which more will be said. The county council bought this hut for the use of tourists and others who visited the hot springs, but as only one or two come in the year, Andrew Gordon and A. Woodham, working a claim close by, had taken possession. By the hot springs, another footbridge spanned the glacier branch, but that was swept away in February, 1894, by a flood. However, we used it constantly while there. The government are now building another across the Waiho, below the junction of the two rivers, from Nesbitt's hut to the south bank, and have formed a fair horse track to the terminal face of the glacier. After crossing the second footbridge, we had only one and one-half miles to go to the spot chosen for our head camp, which we pitched on November 1st, in some tall scrub, within 400 yards of the glacier. To this point numerous persons had been in the past, but the glacier and the upper valley had not been touched, presumably because no one having any knowledge of ice craft had been there. Our camp has not yet been described, and, as it is the simplest and best form of shelter for a party of two, working in rough country and near forest or scrub, an exact description of it may prove useful. It is an invention of Douglas's, 
and we call it a bat wing. In the ordinary course of camp life, survey parties can have their loads packed on horseback and carry tent and fly, with a second smaller fly to pitch at the end of the tent to shelter the fire. We, however, have to carry all our goods and chattels on our backs and over very rough, unexplored country, so could not afford to take such a weighty camp. We therefore pitch an ordinary six-foot by eight-foot canvas tent on a ridge pole with an eight-foot by ten-foot fly, six inches above it, and cut the tent in half along the ridge, and taking away one half, leave the other standing. This is just large enough to allow two men to lie heads and tails. The front or side is left open, and one side of the fly, which was over the half taken away, is raised about four feet in the middle, and the two corners slightly less. Under this the fire burns about three feet away from the remaining half of the tent, so that in wet weather we have shelter for ourselves and fire, and save more than half the weight, and though rather cramped for room, are fairly comfortable. Should a heavy gale of wind make the shelter too cold, or cause discomfort by blowing the smoke into the bat wing, we make a break wind of ferns or branches across in front to protect us. We never have more than this to cover us, and often when necessary to travel in light order, trust to finding some friendly rock to sleep under, or build a mai mai with bark and ferns. Our stores arrived by pack horse next day from Maporica, a ford rather below Nesbitt's hut, having been found for the horses. Having made ourselves fairly comfortable and ready for a long stay, I spent the afternoon in looking about the terminal face and reconnoitering to determine our best mode of attacking the very rough glacier in front of us. The exact position of the terminal face of the Franz Joseph Glacier is lat south, 43 degrees, 25 minutes, 30 seconds, long, east, 170 degrees, 10 minutes, 58 seconds, or rather nearer the equator than Florence in Italy. It comes down to within 14 miles of the sea, to an altitude of only 692 feet, above sea level. It is about half a mile broad, and showed an upper layer of white ice pushing its way over a lower layer, which carried dirt and stones. There are five isolated roches moutonnées standing at intervals across the valley at the terminal face. On the right-hand side is the Sentinel Rock, 236 feet high, the largest. A few feet to the left comes the Müller Rock, 60 feet high, the Strontian Rock, lies nearly three chains further to the left, and is about 160 feet high. And lastly, the barren rock, 50 feet in height, lies near the river, which flowed out on the extreme left or east side of the glacier. Behind the sentinel rock, with the ice still pressing against it, is a rock, since named the Harper Rock, about 170 feet in height, with some moraine debris on its summit, which must have been deposited within the last few years as no moss or vegetation was to be seen there. Some eight chains to the left, and still surrounded by ice, the park rock, 190 feet, lies behind the strontian, and is raked by a running fusillade of falling ice from the towering pinnacles behind. For the purpose of understanding this interesting array of rocks across the valley, reference can be made to the sketch plan of The Terminal Face of Franz Joseph Glacier, given in Chapter 11. The best point from which to get a general idea of the valley in Glacier is the Sentinel Rock, and thither I went as soon as possible to form a plan of attack. The glacier being in such warm latitude and low altitude, and having such a rapid descent, is naturally very much broken and crevassed. From the Sentinel the great icefall can be seen at a distance of two and three quarters miles, descending in a little over a mile one thousand eight hundred feet. Even from such a distance, it presents a grand appearance. Below it, the glacier sweeps round a slight bend, and comes straight down in gigantic waves to the terminal face. There are evidently rocks of the same kind as those exposed at the snout, under the ice for some way up the valley, as the glacier has the appearance of heaving or lurching from side to side on its way down between high rocky walls, which rise out of the ice. The idea conveyed to my mind was that of water forced at an angle into a narrow rocky channel and forming waves which rebounded from one side to the other obliquely across the course of the stream. The extent and height of these waves 
may be seen from some measurements taken just above Cape Defiance, assuming the south bank to be zero. The heights taken every 160 yards across the glacier were as follows. Zero, twenty-one, eighty, forty, ninety-five, fifty-five, one hundred and seventy-seven, two hundred and twenty-nine, and two hundred and five feet. The glacier flows from south to north, and after leaving the neve and coming down over the steep slope which forms the ice fall, it enters a narrow rock-bound valley of a little over half a mile in width. On the eastern or left-hand side, looking up, the rock slopes back for some two hundred to three hundred feet, and then disappears into luxuriant timber, which close the hills up to the usual limit. This rocky bank is cut here and there into deep gorges and bluffs by streams from the hills. On the western side, the range rises abruptly out of the ice. For the first three hundred to five hundred feet, a bare, ice-worn precipice, fringed with scrub and bush, growing on almost precipitous hillsides, for some thousands of feet above. Here and there, fine waterfalls drop over the cliffs into the ice. The surface of the glacier, contrary to the general rule with New Zealand glaciers, is practically clear of debris, with exception of a narrow strip along the western side coming from a patch of rocks near the head of the ice fall. This accumulates in the bend above Cape Defiance, a promontory of rock which obstructs the flow of ice on the western side about two miles up the glacier and continues until it joins a larger piece of surface moraine about half a mile from the terminal face evidently caused by a slip a year or two previous the debris left by the slip will no doubt have fallen over the terminal face and entirely disappeared by the end of eighteen ninety eight the very broken nature of the glacier is the real cause of its cleanliness and freedom from surface moraine. As the debris falls into crevasses and comes out at the terminal face in the lower layer of dirty ice. From the general appearance of the valley, it was evident that the best plan would be to cross the river and get on to the eastern bank, for the ice looked too rough for a practical route, and the western side was too precipitous to attempt. Accordingly, on November the 4th, after some heavy rain, I went across to the outlet and endeavoured without success to pass over the river on the glacier, while Douglas went down to Nesbitt's hut to bring up the remainder of our stores, which had been left there owing to a flood in the river. I found that the ice was very soft and broken all along the side, and that it was unsafe to attempt a landing on the bank near the terminal face. In fact, it was a decidedly difficult business to get up the sheer ice face onto the glacier. The only course left open to us was to try and force a way straight up the glacier. On the 7th we managed, after some gymnastic feats, to reach a point about one mile up the glacier on the western side, but the last 120 yards, having taken an hour amongst very bad seracs, we gave up the attempt and returned to camp. The following morning was spent in again, trying to get over the river on the ice to the eastern bank, without success, and in the afternoon we went on to the glacier behind the sentinel rock, which appeared, from subsequent examination, to be the only possible route to reach the more level ice in the center. From this point we made our way up and across the glacier by slow degrees, crawling between crevasses and cutting steps up and down high and almost perpendicular hummocks and after three hours were able to step ashore on the eastern bank, about a mile from the terminal. For two or three hundred feet above the ice, the hillside is bare, ice-worn rock, sloping back at an angle of twenty-five degrees, and along this we went for a short distance until a deep gorge stopped us. As it was late, we decided to return to camp and move it up to a suitable place on this bank, at the same time bringing up a spare rope to fix at the gorge. We always take a dog with us to catch kiwis, etc., for food. But as our work for some weeks would be on the ice, it was necessary to dispense with the dog's company. When I joined Douglas, I found he had an old friend, Betsy, a black, purebred mongrel, as he called her, and up to this point she had been a faithful, though somewhat useless, companion. Accordingly, while Douglas took her down to the beach for an old digger friend to look after her for a time, I went off to the small farm on the Totara River, obtained half a sheep, and returned to the hospital to sleep. Before returning to camp on the following day, I had a bathe 
in the hot springs. On nearly every river on the west coast, there are mineral hot springs. Their heat is not due in any way to volcanic agency, and though I have tried to obtain an analysis of the water, some accident has always happened, and I have failed to get particulars. It is generally the case that a mile or so before the river emerges from the hills, a mineral spring is to be found in the bed of the stream, in which case the water will be hot. Sometimes, however, the spring is a few feet above the river level and only warm. The two best I know are those on the Waiho, a mile and a half below the glacier, and on the Fox River, a mile from the Fox Glacier. In each case they are situated in the river bed, covered at flood time, and often, after the river has resumed its normal level, they are completely buried in gravel. On the flat near the hospital, hot water can be found almost anywhere. At the depth of six feet, it would be warm. At eight feet, below the surface, or on the edge of the river bed, the temperature is 120 degrees. And at ten feet, or two feet below the river bed, the temperature is 132 degrees, the hottest I obtained. Their rise and fall correspond with that of the river, showing great activity when the latter is high. In order to have a good bathe, the plan was to take a long-handled shovel, scoop out a hollow, and letting it fill in with water, lie down in it and stew. If, however, the bath proves uncomfortably hot, it is easy to let in a little ice water from the river a yard or two away, or even catch a piece of floating ice and place it in the pool. It was a new and pleasing sensation to lie in a hot spring under the shade of tree ferns and enjoy the glorious view of a glacier within a mile and a half, ploughing its way down between steep hills clothed in luxuriant forest and backed by high snow and ice-clad peaks. When going up a river, there is no difficulty in locating these springs, for their smell is strong and rather objectionable. Douglas said that, quote, You smell as if you've been having tea with the evil one inside an old gasometer, end quote, after having a bathe in one of them. I cannot vouch for the correctness of the comparison, as I have never had tea under such conditions, but can quite imagine the combination would produce much the same effect. On Douglas's return, we moved camp and some three weeks' provisions across the glacier and along the eastern side to a point about a mile and a half up the valley, and ascending four hundred feet up the ice-worn rocks, found a capital camping place amongst great rata trees and alongside a clear stream of water which ran in a deep, water-worn channel down to the glacier with many small pools in which to bathe. Situated as we were at Camp 2, in fine rata bush, with a luxuriant undergrowth of tree ferns and other plants, which in England would be called semi-tropical vegetation, it was difficult to believe that we were a mile and a half up and three hundred feet above a glacier. Through an opening in the trees in front of our batwing, lofty snow-capped peaks could be seen a mile away across the valley, rising in precipices from steep slopes, clothed with dark green bush, while below a pure white glacier flowed at our feet, presenting as fine an instance of crevassed and broken ice as could be wished. A near view of alpine peaks, with a foreground of trees as of course, met with in many places, but it is doubtful whether the beautiful combination of tree ferns, semi-tropical vegetation, glacier and snow-clad mountains can be seen anywhere else except on the Fox Glacier. From the rocky platform at the edge of the bush, a few yards from the camp, we overlooked the glacier flowing past in great broken waves, down to the terminal face, beyond which were glimpses of the river as it wound in and out of the old moraine hillocks, covered with luxuriant timber, to the large river flats below. And fourteen miles away, the blue sea was plainly visible, with the white horses raised by a squall of wind. One result of the neighborhood of the ice is that alpine plants such as the nai-nai, broom, daisies, and edelweiss are found growing amongst the vegetation of the low country. I found one plant of the last named growing within 800 feet of sea level on the sentinel rock. It does not appear to grow more luxuriantly at so low an altitude, but on the whole is rather stunted. Finding the ice at the side of the glacier very rotten, we attempted to continue along the side, and succeeded in reaching a rocky cape, 
which rose about a half a mile further up the valley. On ascending the point, we discovered that the rock side had lost its gentle slope and rose out of the ice in a perpendicular face of several hundred feet, smooth and ice-worn. There was no route along here, so we returned, looking out for a place where we could cross the rough side ice and reach the more level surface in the center of the glacier. The whole of the 16th was spent in trying to find a route onto the glacier. At 70 or 80 yards from the side, broad crevasses ran across and along the line of flow. Consequently, though the surface was fairly level, it was cut up into huge seracs and hummocks. After five unsuccessful attempts, we found a fairly good route, which, however, necessitated some peculiar acrobatic performances. Twice or thrice, I had to let Douglas down bodily into a crevasse, so that he could cut steps up to me, the side being too perpendicular to allow us to cut downwards in comfort, and then I had to cut steps up again on the other side for perhaps forty feet, using the axe with only one hand, and holding onto the ice with the other. No doubt, had the glacier been at a higher altitude, there would have been no difficulty in finding several routes, but here the ice was terribly rotten. Occasionally we would hear a report like a pistol shot, or louder, and feel a tremble under our feet, or see a large serac fall down, which looked strong enough to stand for days. Under these circumstances, therefore, we had to be most careful to choose a good line, because it had been decided to move camp again to Cape Defiance, a mile or so further up, on the opposite side, in order to have a good point from which to attack the great icefall and do our work on the neve. If weather came on and delayed us in the upper camp for a week, it would be possible that our retreat to camp too would be cut off by reason of the frequent changes in the surface ice. Having spent some days in survey work and wet weather, on the 22nd we each took 40-pound loads, including camera and instruments, and made for Cape Defiance, 2,864 feet. It occupied just an hour and a quarter to go some 200 yards before we reached the good traveling in the center. When fossicking for this route the week previous, our gymnastic feats were most interesting and amusing, as we had only a camera to carry. But now, with our loads, we found it not only trying, but most difficult. The swags had to be lowered and pulled up again frequently, receiving very rough handling, regardless of their contents. The center of the glacier was fairly good going for a short distance, and then we got amongst some bad crevasses again, with long narrow ridges between. Often after crawling along several of these razorbacks, we would find our way blocked by a break in the ridge and be compelled to retrace our steps and try another line. Luckily, anticipating some such work as this, I had brought a bundle of leafy twigs of rata to stick into the ice and mark our route, to save time on the return, because had we taken the wrong razorback at the start, we might have had an hour's work for nothing. Consequently, when we emerged from the rough ice close under Cape Defiance, there was a trail of rata twigs behind, which would ensure more speedy travel in the future. At Cape Defiance we found the only real piece of lateral moraine on the glacier, about eighteen chains long. This cape, or point, is formed by a spur, which projects across the flow of the glacier, and, narrowing the valley by a quarter of a mile, causes the ice to back up behind it to a considerable height. On the upper side of the spur, the lateral moraine lies at right angles to the general flow of the glacier, the ice having swept down into the bed, and then, turning in an eddy, flowed along and around the cape. In the valley formed by the moraine and hillside, we built a level floor of large stones on which to place our batwing. Heavy rain had set in at noon, so we were fairly wet through and uncomfortable by the time we had pitched the camp. Behind us, the hillside had dense alpine scrub on it, and rose very steeply to the rocky pinnacles of Mount Moltke. To the right, a stream, quote, Harper's Creek, end quote, it has since been named, came down from the ice fields of the same peak. The valley down which this creek flows is very steep, and on the upper side has sheer rocky precipices, which are 2,000 feet high near the glacier, and as the valley rises they gradually become lower, until at the head they are only some 500 feet. Over this rock wall, a waterfall, the Unser Fritz, descends in one leap 1,000 
209 feet being the drainage of the Andermatten and Baumann glaciers on Mount Rune. In front of us was the grand ice fall in all its glory, 1,800 feet or more in height and a mile wide, presenting a dazzling array of towering seracs and deep blue crevasses. I have seen many fine ice falls in Switzerland and New Zealand, but very much doubt if any, except perhaps the Haast glacier on the Tasman, is as grand as that of the Franz Joseph. Though I call it 1,800 feet in height, it may be said that for 3,000 feet, at the least, the glacier is really an ice fall. On the 24th, we made an attempt to force a way to the Neve. After three hours, we reached the head of the ice fall by means of a fairly smooth strip of ice caused by the inflow of the Almer glacier on the left. It is generally the rule that where two glaciers join, the crevasses and seracs are much smaller than elsewhere. But after passing the junction, nothing could be done. The Neve snow was within a quarter of a mile, smooth and white, but between us was a field of ice broken into seracs and crevasses in a manner which it is impossible to conceive without seeing. Douglas said it looked like a bird's eye view of an eastern town with a deep blue streak between each and every house. The seracs were all square and flat topped, but surrounded by apparently bottomless crevasses. I could see that the only way to make a successful traverse up this glacier was in the early spring when the winter snow would form bridges over this impossible piece of ice. It would only be waste of time to attempt to go any further, because nothing could be done without a ladder of at least twenty-five feet. It was also raining heavily, so we returned to camp, and spent the afternoon in making sundry observations, etc. On the following morning we went up the spur behind the camp, to five thousand feet or so, in order to get some compass shots into the upper basin of the Neve, from this point the outlook was splendid immediately on the right across harper's creek within a few chains was the great unser fritz waterfall with its two small glaciers and enormous precipices on each side to the southeast we got a clear view for a short time into the main neve coming off mount de la beche and the saddles leading into the tasman glacier opposite us we saw the elmer glacier a fine open ice-field coming off Stirling Rock, behind which Drummond's Peak showed a peculiar array of tooth-like rocks rising out of the field of snow. On the other side of this range lies the Callery River, which joins the Waiho by the hospital. Over the low country to the north, the view was good, but limited. The glacier to the terminal face lay two thousand feet below, at the foot of great precipices, over which a grand series of waterfalls fell with a roar into the ice. Beyond it lay Lake Mapurica, and the sea coast was easily visible to the Wateroa Bluff. The clouds, however, soon hid everything, and more heavy rain compelled our descent to camp. Next morning, in still bad weather, we retired down the glacier to camp too, having decided that no route lay up the ice to the Neve. The ice on the line of route had altered very much, even during the last three or four days, and had it not been for my rata twigs left on the way up, we should have had hard work to find a way. Sometimes we would see a piece of rata thirty feet away and take a quarter of an hour to work round to it. The ice at the place where we had to leave the glacier was even more altered than elsewhere, and it was difficult to recognize the way which we had followed when getting on from the rocks. However, by lowering Douglas to cut steps once or twice, we were able to come off safely and reach camp, too, at 4 p.m., pretty wet and hungry. We now decided to try a high-level route along the top of the range, behind the camp, onto the Elmer Neve, and across it, over a shoulder of Stirling Rock, to the main Neve. This would involve a considerable amount of track-cutting, or blazing, in the dense bush and scrub, and probably with the bad weather we were having, would take some time. I therefore went to Camp 1 at the terminal face, and Douglas went on to the township at Macparica for more stores. Unfortunately, while there, he had a bad attack of influenza, lasting nearly three weeks, and so, beyond perfecting the survey and taking some observations of glacier motion, little could be done for the present. 
in naming the tributary glaciers and peaks which had not already received names from the low country trigonometrical stations we used those of swiss guides in almer cross bauman glaciers etc it is often hard to find names so we use those of one class for one valley and another class for another locality as far as possible End of chapter 4Chapter 5 of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 5 Waiho River, the High Country. Trek Cutting, Dry Camp, Number 5. Wekas, Another Failure. Mapurika, Mount Moltke Spur, Camp 6, Camp 7. Gale and Shipwreck, Return, Callery River heavy flood, marching orders. On Douglas's return we began to blaze our track to the grass line behind Camp 2. This very trying business is so constantly necessary that I must try and convey some idea of the work. The undergrowth in the bush is, as a rule, so bad that progress is very slow, even without a load on one's back. But when carrying anything, it is almost impossible to make any way at all. It is therefore a saving of time to take a billhook and blaze, or cut a narrow track, before attempting to carry any load through the undergrowth. When climbing a hill to reach the grass line, this is more necessary than when travelling on flat country, and an ascent of 1,500 feet is a good day's work. Often in the ranges, the bush is fairly open, from 1,500 feet to 2,500 feet above sea level, consisting of large trees and little undergrowth but at the latter altitude mountain vegetation begins to appear amongst the trees, and at 3,000 feet the true impenetrable mountain scrub has to be faced. This varies from 10 to 3 feet in height, and its denseness can hardly be appreciated by those who have not experienced it. I have seen it thick enough to walk and crawl on top of, and in nearly every locality a 5,000-foot ascent is a good day's work, Sometimes it is literally too tangled to force a way through without a billhook to clear a track, even when carrying no load, and any attempt would leave very few garments on the back of the man who tried. The only stuff I know which is impervious to the stiff pointed ends of the stunted vegetation is, quote, gabardine, end quote, made by T. Burberry and Son, Bassingstoke, England. The track which had to be cut from Camp 2 to the grass line was my first experience of this sort of work, and I can safely recommend it to anyone wishing to test his vocabulary. Five hours' hard work only took me six hundred feet up the hill, and now, after considerable experience in blazing, I have decided that a distance which takes an hour to cut will only take four or five minutes to go with a load on one's shoulders after it is cleared. We only clear a width of about two feet, sufficient to get our loads along in comfort. Owing to the wet weather and various other delays, it was 23rd of December before we had our camp pitched in the last piece of mountain scrub, some 4,000 feet above sea level, on the opposite side of the glacier to Cape Defiance and the Unzerfritz Fall. We named this Dry Camp, or Number 5, because there was only one small drip of water from an overhanging rock, which took some hours to fill the billy. A thousand feet above the camp, there was a small peak from which the finest panorama in the district without going above the snow line, can be obtained. Looking south from here was the great Neve basin of the Franz Joseph Glacier, with its tributary ice falls, the Agassiz, Melchior, etc., and beyond them were the fine rock peaks of the dividing range, including Mount Spencer, 9,157 feet, Gervois, 8,675 feet, and another, 9,511 feet, which I named Conway's Peak, lying on the divide at the point from which the Bismarck Range branches to the north. Across the valley, this range, with its peaks, glaciers, and waterfalls, was seen for the whole of its length, and to the north the coastline could be followed, bluff after bluff, to the Wanganui River, and still further we could see the Paparoa Ranges north of Greymouth, between 90 and 100 miles away. When Douglas had rejoined me on the 16th December, we brought up some ten days' stores only, thinking that would be ample for our projected expedition to the Neve. However, the rain and Douglas's illness had kept us back, so we were compelled to economize our food. 
on Christmas Day we were in fog and could do nothing, so we reluctantly decided to kill one of the pair of wekas which had honoured us with their presence. As they had two young ones, we were unwilling to kill either of the birds, but a Christmas dinner looking very doubtful, we shot the male. Previously, I had shot a crow, and on opening the weka's crop, we had evidence of their extraordinary ideas of food, for in it was the copper cartridge case which had been used for the crow, already partly polished by the stones. Mrs. Weka seemed to take a great interest in our method of preparing her late husband for the stew, and on my throwing the remains aside, her reason was obvious. She at once seized the discarded parts and carried them in triumph to her young ones, no doubt saying, here, my dears, is part of your poor old father for a Christmas dinner. She then returned, carefully picked up, and gave her promising young family all the remains of the stew. In the West Coast ranges, it is the exception if hilltops are clear of fog after noon in the summer, and generally the clouds form on them as early as 9 or 10 a.m. Consequently, though the weather is fine in the valleys, we are often unable to do any work on the tops, except in the very early morning. For three days fog prevented our taking observations at or near dry camp. Until we had done this, it was useless to go on to the neve. The delay necessitated further supplies, and was the more inconvenient because our drip of water had ceased. On the 27th, Douglas went to camp too for some flour, and I took the two billies down to a creek, 6,000 feet below, for water, and shot a bird or two. The twenty-ninth saw us with light loads of thirty pounds, pushing along the rotten rocky spur toward the neve of the Elmer Glacier, but again we were doomed to disappointment. At noon we came to a deep gorge, walled by rotten cliffs, down which stones were constantly falling. After an hour's work we managed to find a fair route into the gorge, but the other side was too rotten to ascend. There is no doubt a party of three could traverse this side without much trouble, but we did not consider it safe for two men to put so much dangerous ground behind them, if any other route existed, because should any accident occur to one, I doubt if the other could have got out alone. Also, Douglas had been shaken by his recent attack of influenza, and was not fit to do such a difficult and long day as we should have before us. Wherever the schist formation ends and the slate begins, we find terribly shattered rocks, and when this occurs in a precipitous locality, it is often quite impossible to traverse the steep faces with real safety. The gorge that turned us back was near the point of junction of the two formations, and had enormous masses of rotten rock ready to fall. In fact, we could hardly touch any projecting stone, however large, without dislodging it. Having christened the gorge No-Go Creek, we returned to dry camp and, gathering all our goods, left them at 5 p.m. for Camp 2, which we reached at 8 p.m. On the last day of the year, we moved to Camp 2, down to our old terminal face quarters, and found that the ice behind the Sentinel had so changed that it gave us great trouble to find a route off the glacier at all. During the next three weeks, we had some very bad weather and floods, which considerably delayed my work on Lake Mapurica, which I had been sent to survey before we did any further work at the glacier. This and other lakes on the low country lie between high moraine hills left by ancient glaciers. They are all supposed by the inhabitants to be bottomless. I do not know why, except that people seem to look upon a bottomless lake as a luxury, and are very angry with the man who destroys the illusion. The general rule is that they are not quite so deep as their height above sea level. Maparica lies about 275 or 300 feet above the sea, so I offered to bet that the lake was under 300 feet in depth, but no one would accept, for they said they knew the lake was bottomless. When I sounded in 14 places and found bottom always within 280 feet, many of the inhabitants of the district took it as a personal insult and have never quite forgiven me. While camping on the shore of the lake, I heard the cry of the rua, or large brown kiwi, now nearly extinct and very valuable. I believe there are one or two pairs in this locality. Thanks to a flood putting one of my camps four feet under water and otherwise delaying my work, it was the 25th of January, 1894, when I rejoined Douglas at the glacier. He had been laying off a line for a horse track from Nesbitt's to the terminal face. We now decided to go along the spur on the western side of the glacier, and if necessary ascend Mount Rune, so as to complete our map of the neve. As Douglas was yet feeling far from well, we asked A. Woodham, one of the diggers, to come and give us a helping hand for the ten days we expected to be away. 
It was two days before we had our track blazed and camp pitched 2,700 feet above the flat. The view from Camp 6 of the glacier was quite the prettiest picture we saw, for the glacier could be seen from the neve to near the snout through a framework of nainai and other trees. The nainai is a mountain scrub and grows up to 30 feet in height. Its foliage is like a large pineapple head. Some plants have only straight stems with one head, while others have gnarled and twisted limbs with a hundred heads. The shape of the tuft on the head of the branches gives a tropical appearance to the scene, and as it only grows in any quantity near the grass line on the west coast, it is rarely difficult to obtain a foreground of apparently tropical vegetation with a distance of snow and ice, a combination at once curious and beautiful. The grass line was 1,000 feet above Camp 6, and it took Woodham and me two and a half days to cut through the scrub for that height. I never experienced before or since such an impenetrable tangle of vegetation, of stunted, hard, stubborn, akiaki, broom, etc. This mountain scrub to a great extent grows downhill, that is, when ascending you have the branches pointing towards you. Consequently, it is difficult to get into a shrub to cut a limb off near the ground. In places, it is not unlike meeting a number of fixed bayonets pointing at you and trying to cut the rifle off at the stock with a billhook without room to swing it properly. On the 1st of February, we shouldered our loads and made along the high ridge towards Mount Moltke, but at noon a fog came up, and at 3 p.m. the dry fog changed to a wet mist, a sure sign of a storm. We could not see 30 yards ahead, so decided to go down on our right and camp, because it was the lee side of the ridge, and also because the slopes toward the glacier were practically precipices. After descending 500 feet in the fog, we came to a precipice, and on going to the right and left, found more sheer rocks. The mist was too thick to see how deep, or of what kind these faces were, so having found a small patch of scrub growing on the hillside, we decided to stay where we were. It took an hour to cut a flat shelf, six feet by eight feet, out of the hillside with our ice axes. On this shelf we pitched our fly, stretched on a rope between two ice axes, and tied down in every possible direction to the long snow grass. We were thoroughly wet by this time, and the wind was whistling over the ridge above us from the northwest. Douglas had a dry shirt, and I had a pair of light canvas trousers to put on, and Woodham had a complete change, so we hung our wet garments outside, there being no chance of a good enough fire to dry them, and put our blankets round us. We were, however, able to make a small fire of scrub for boiling the billy, and having a good drink of hot cocoa turned in. All that night and the next day it blew a hurricane, but this did not affect us much, as we were on the lee side of the ridge. Over our heads we could see the grass and lily leaves whirling about, having been literally torn up by the roots, and between the blinding squalls of rain we watched the sea whipped into one sheet of foam by the squalls. The high wind and heavy rain dispersed the fog of the previous day, and enabled us to look at our surroundings and see where we had got to, a point which we had been unable to decide the previous evening. From Conway's Peak, at the extreme south corner of the Franz Joseph Glacier, the Bismarck Range branches off in a northwesterly direction towards the coast, dividing for a mile and a half its neve from that of the Fox Glacier. At this point, a short ridge, the Chancellor, branches off for five miles nearly due west, and a mile and a half further on the Bismarck Range is Mount Andereg, 8,360 feet, which sends an offshoot to the west for about seven miles. Between these two diverging ranges the Victoria Glacier lies, and beyond them the Fox Glacier flows, first along the Chancellor Ridge, and then passing the snout of the Victoria Glacier, continues along the foot of the second range. Andereg's Peak and Mount Rune, 7,344 feet, which lies a mile north of it, gives rise to the Fritz Glacier, which is bounded on the south by the second range, and on the north by a spur, which comes off Mount Moltke, 6,509 feet, a peak a little north of Rune. The Fritz Glacier is the source of the Waikukpa River. On Mount Moltke is a small ice field, which sends its drainage to the east down Harbour's Creek, by Cape Defiance, and to the north gives rise to the Oemorua River. After leaving Moltke, the Bismarck Range continues north for four miles, sending off several short, abrupt spurs to the west, between which are valleys some 1,500 feet in depth, walled by high precipitous sides. These are drained by Dry Creek, which flows into the Waiho River, six miles below the glacier. Some idea of the great steepness of these valleys and ridges may be gained by the fact that, near the head of Dry Creek, 
a straight line could be taken for a mile and a quarter in length, which would cross three ridges of 5,090 feet and two valleys of 1,500 to 2,000 feet deep. This is often the case on the West Coast ranges. The main chain of the Southern Alps sends off more spurs and branch ranges of considerable altitude on the western slope than on the eastern. All these have deep valleys between them and descend from 10,000 feet and upwards to within 500 feet of sea level in a distance of less than 10 miles. Those valleys in which there are glaciers present high precipitous sides of rock, and in the lower portions the rivers descend through dark bush-clad or bare rocky gorges, beautiful scenery, but ugly from the unfortunate explorer's point of view. On the 2nd of February, when the fog cleared, we found ourselves camping on a very steep hillside near the head of one of the branches of Dry Creek. The other side of the valley, for 1,000 feet or more, was almost a precipice, with grass and stunted scrub clinging to it in places. The storm still raged furiously, and as our aneroids had fallen 1.10 inches during the night, Douglas and I put on our wet clothes and made the fly ropes taut, gathered some bits of scrub for the fire, and retired again to our blankets. So long as the wind came from the northwest, it was fairly warm, and we were more or less sheltered by the spur above us. But, about two hours after dark, it veered round as usual to the southwest, and blew with all its force onto our shelter, bringing with it hail and sleet instead of rain. There is a fixed rule, which rarely has an exception, as to weather on the west coast, namely that northwest wind always brings heavy rain, followed by southwest hail and rainstorms for a day, and then fine weather again till the next nor'wester. As soon as the wind therefore veered round to the southwest, we knew that twenty-four hours would see fine weather, and as the temperature fell, our spirits rose. Douglas had turned in, in his dry shirt. I was in my thin canvas trousers only, but Woodham, luckily for himself, had on plenty of clothes. Towards midnight the gale increased, and the wind howled round us in furious gusts, trying to dislodge the fly, which was flapping about in an alarming manner. Douglas had just said, it's deuced lucky that we tied her down so well, when a squall struck us again, and after a brief struggle with the canvas, it broke a rope, and in half a second the whole arrangement had gone away in the darkness. Up we all scrambled, Douglas and I in our airy costume, as there was no time to find and put on our wet clothes, and began to struggle with the canvas. The wind seemed literally to leap on us, driving the hail with almost irresistible force and making it very difficult to rig up any kind of shelter. After nearly a quarter of an hour battling with the fly, tumbling over one another in the dark, and slipping down on the wet and steep grass with our bare feet, we managed to put up a rough shelter. Cold as I was, with my almost naked body, I almost smiled at Douglas's wild appearance, seen at intervals in the uncertain light, when we came near one another, his solitary garment fluttering in the wind and every moment a hasty remark would be heard as he slipped with his bare legs on the wet grass. Neither Douglas, in his long years of exploration, nor I, have had our shelters blown away before. And if the hail stung his bare legs as it stung my bare back and chest, I feel sure neither of us will ever neglect a precaution which would prevent another such experience. As soon as we had any shelter at all, we got under it, and allowed Woodham to finish fixing the ropes. We then donned our wet garments, having wrung them out, and, rolled in our wetter blankets, lay waiting for dawn. Poor old Douglas was chilled to the bone, and I really feared he would be unable to face the storm and journey down at daybreak. As soon as the first streak of light allowed us to see, Woodham began to kindle a fire. Everything was wet as possible, but by burning a candle and dropping the grease onto a piece of rag, and lighting that, he gradually charred and dried enough twigs to make a blaze. In two hours, we had a billy full of boiling cocoa, and with the help of that, soon made Douglas warm. My young bones and blood did not get the cold into them like his, for there is a great difference in the staying powers of a man under thirty and one over fifty years of age. At noon, the wind was still blowing a gale, so we decided to go down to the hospital and leave everything where it was. When we reached the top of the ridge, the fog came again, and we found the force of the wind very great. Several times we had to lie down for some seconds, or we should have been blown away like flies. Whenever possible, we descended and traversed the steep face on the lee side of the ridge. At one time we must have been in a thundercloud, as our axes hummed. In three or four hours we reached the shelter of the bush, 
and at seven p.m. arrived at the hospital where dry clothes, a good fire, and hot tea made us happy. This was Woodham's first experience on the higher country, and he said it would be his last. He thought it a very poor game. But his disgust was only temporary. He was far too enterprising a man to be so easily daunted. In two days the weather cleared, and we returned to the scene of our late discomfort to complete our work and bring down the things. On the way we called in at Camp 1, at the terminal face, and found it blown down, and all my photographic plates, which had been exposed up the glacier, had been exposed a second time to two days' rain. Eventually it proved that not many were spoiled, but this is an instance of the difficulties which I had to contend against for my photographs. Having gone along the ridge beyond our camp to a point from which we could get observation into the neve and complete the map, we picked up our camp and returned to the diggers' huts. The only incident worth mentioning which occurred on our second trip along the ridge was one which might have been a serious accident. The outer ranges often have deep and narrow fissures in the rock after reaching the grass line. Sometimes these are three hundred feet deep or more, and only a few feet broad, easily hidden by the long snow grass. On this spur there were several small ones, a foot or two broad, and perhaps twenty to fifty feet deep. Coming down the grass ahead of Douglas, I heard a cooee from above, and being unable to see him on looking up, I returned and heard another below me. So I went down again, thinking I had been mistaken, when a third cry came from behind. Putting down my load, I was again ascending when I heard a voice on my right. You might pull a chap out of a hole. It appears that poor Douglas had walked into one of those fissures, which was luckily narrow, and his load had jammed, preventing him from falling below his shoulders. We soon had him out, none the worse for the mishap. On reaching the diggers' huts with our various belongings a day or two later, we were greeted with news of the gale, which had done an immense amount of damage all over the district. Roads were blocked, houses blown down, and no prospect of the mail getting through for some time. Douglas now had another attack of his influenza, brought on by the recent chill, and he retired down to more comfortable quarters at the lake. I stayed on the hospital with the diggers, and spent my time in preparing the map and going up and along the Burster Ridge on the north side of the Callery River, to get bearings and photographs into the head of that river and the Totra. There is gold in the reaches of the river above the gorge, and several diggers have been into the upper valley. No possible route exists through the gorge itself, owing to the very precipitous sides, so a track has been blazed up Mount Muller, 3,700 feet, and along the ridge to the grass line. This ridge is easy but tiring, yet the inhabitants of the district look upon it as a breakneck and difficult journey. Several young fellows have been so frightened by the traveller's tales told by the older diggers that they would sooner do anything than try to go over the burster. The Callery River drains Mount Ellie de Beaumont, 10,200 feet, which sends down two fine ice fields, the Burton and the Spencer, both primary glaciers. The saddle at the actual source of the river, a mile or two above the Burton Glacier, leads probably into the Wataroa River, nearly under the Lindenfelt saddle, which lies at the extreme head of the great Tasman Glacier. At present, the topography of the upper waters and tributaries of the Wataroa River is very uncertain, but I think it is safe to assume that the Lindenfeld and Callery saddles lead into the same valley. I have never been on the former, but knowing the western ranges so well could easily decide the point, and hope before long to be able to do so. From the Burster, Mount Ellie de Beaumont is a beautiful cone, rising out of the two glaciers, to its right Mount Green, 9,325 feet, and the minarets are seen rising out of the neve of the same glacier, the Spencer. A pass could be made between Green and Ellie de Beaumont, on to the head of the Tasman Glacier, opposite Mount Darwin. About the middle of February, we had five days of heavy rain, and several slips occurred on the glacier branch, causing the bed of the river to rise eight or ten feet, with gravel and other debris. The result was that the water overflowed its usual flood channels, and, cutting in behind the wire bridge above the hospital, washed away its supports. The bridge consequently gradually became less taut, and at last touched the water. Strong as the wire ropes were, they hardly resisted the rushing torrent for a second, but snapped like twine, and the whole structure collapsed. A flood of such magnitude is worth seeing. On the glacier branch, great icebergs, which had broken off from the glacier, careered madly along, crashing and colliding against one another, and huge boulders could be heard bumping down under the water. 
In the Callery Gorge, the water was thirty feet above its normal level, and on emerging from its narrow rock-bound channel onto the more open ground, it spread out right and left in huge waves. Trees and stones were swept along with tremendous speed and force. After the river subsided, we found a mass of ice blocks stranded amongst the trees in the bush by the hut. All the claims were filled with debris and unworkable for days, and in some cases the men had to wait for weeks until the river had scoured out some of the gravel in its bed and lowered its level, thus enabling them to get sufficient fall to carry away their tailings. As soon as I could find a horse on which to ford the river, I went up to the glacier to see what damage the flood had done. In places, the terminal face had retreated five or six yards, owing to the masses of ice which had broken away, and at the outlet on the east side there appeared the finest ice cave I have ever had the pleasure of seeing. It was one hundred feet high and about the same breadth, while quite fifty yards inside a ray of sunlight could be seen coming through some crevasse which had opened through the ice above. At that point the cave seemed to still maintain its dimensions, but beyond was inky darkness. This glacier had since 1867 been well known at its terminal face, as it only necessitates a ride of fourteen miles up an open river bed from the sea. Beyond, the snout only had been explored. Twenty years or more before our visit, Douglas says he remembers hearing of some Maoris who were prospecting for gold with the early diggers on the river flats, going up to look at the ice. At that time it came down to the Sentinel Rock, and the large cave out of which the river flowed was between the Muller and the Strachan Rocks. The Maoris, on seeing this, imagined that it was a tunnel through the ranges to some unknown country on the other side, from which all gold came. So they brought up a large dugout canoe, and having obtained some short poles with steel hooks on the end, they started into the cave on a voyage of discovery, using the hooks against the icy walls. After they had gone in some little distance, it is presumed, a block of ice fell near them, or they heard one of the cracks or groans, which we so often heard on this glacier, because the canoe suddenly shot out into daylight again, and her crew jumped ashore, saying the typo, devil, was in the cave. I ought perhaps to have mentioned before that Waiho means smoky waters. It is difficult to decide whether the Maoris named it because of the very milky appearance of the water, or because of the peculiarly thick white fog which hangs over the stream, not encroaching at all on the banks, but only covering the actual water. The river has more silt coming down it than any other on the coast, and its water is very milky at the mouth. End of chapter 5「Six of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand » by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 6. Cook River, Balfour Glacier. Old Moraines, Beach Travelling and Digging, Gillespie's, Ryan's Range, Balfour Glacier. A Race with the Clouds, Topsy. At the end of February instructions came for us to go without delay to Cook River, and explore all its branches. Some years ago, the track or road which skirts the outer hills southwards from Ross was continued from Mapurika, across the Waiho River, some three miles below the glacier, and thence over the Oimarua and Waikukupa rivers to Cook River. The distance by this road does not exceed twelve miles, but it had been allowed to grow over, and is now worse to tackle than bush in its natural state. Why the authorities should have allowed a trek which cost a good sum of money to grow over is hard to say, possibly because the powers that be in Ocarito and Gillespie's had sufficient influence to prevent its being kept open, for it diverted all the southern horse traffic from these two townships. However, the fact remained that, instead of being able to ride in an hour or two from the Franz Joseph Glacier to Cook's River, we had to go down the Waiho to the sea beach and along it to Gillespie's township, and strike inland some eight miles to a small farm on Cook River Flats, thirty-five miles of bad going, taking a day and a half. Having procured a horse on which to carry our property, we left the hospital and our digger friends on the 7th March, and followed the Waiho River bed to the beach, went to the Mr. Gibbs store and farm at Waikukupa, where we slept. Beach travelling is a distinct feature at present on the west coast. At low tide the sand is generally good, but at high tide the traveller is forced up into soft sand or gravel, and the going becomes tedious and painful. The whole of the lower country is formed of low moraine hills and terraces, 
reaching 400 feet in height, left there by the ancient glaciers. These have been cut through here and there by the rivers, and in many places they form high bluffs along the seashore, at the bottom of which large erratic boulders, loosened by the sea, are lying in confusion. At high tide the surf, which is nearly always heavy, dashes over this mass of rocks and beats against the hard mass of moraine above them. Some of the bluffs are practically impassable except at low tide, and these have had narrow tracks cut over or round them. Others are in their natural state and are impassable at high water. Consequently, travelling along the beach has its excitement, for seas have to be dodged amongst the loose masses of rock strewn along the shore at the foot of a bluff. Frequently, after a storm, the sea throws up sand and gravel to such an extent that no rocks are visible, and the bluff can be passed on a good beach, but the next tide may destroy the good ground and leave the rocks naked again, or possibly the bluff may be filled up for weeks. Two bluffs have to be passed before reaching Gibbs's house, both easy ones, and the Oemerua and Waikukupa rivers have to be forded at their mouths. The rivers often have large lagoons behind the seawall, and these have an outlet into the sea, the lagoon filling up at high tide, and nearly running out before the next tide. To cross the water, rushing down over shifting sand is never pleasant, and can only be done at lower half tide, for the surf causes a strong undercurrent when it runs up the narrow channel against the stream. Fording, when the river is in dangerous condition, or without due experience, has been the cause of many deaths. Hardly a river or creek on the coast exists, which has not been answerable for one or more lives. From the Waikukupa, we reached Gillespie's by noon, a township consisting of two public houses, a store, and a few huts. It is indeed difficult to imagine a more dismal or depressing place than Gillespie's Beach, or town, as they call it in the district. Some six or seven huts and houses are scattered along the old sea wall of sand hills in a row, facing the sea. These include two public houses, a government school, and one store, the other store being part of one public house. On approaching it, no one is seen about the sandy track which connects the scattered houses, but suddenly one of the many canine mongrels, which are plentiful here, becomes aware of a stranger's presence. He gives tongue to his indignation, and, followed by other curs of low degree, notifies to all whom it may concern the fact that someone is coming. Up to this moment nothing worthy of notice has occurred, but no sooner has the signal been given than children of all ages and sexes spring up on every side, and after a short stare to see if they know you or not, bolt like rabbits to their houses, leaving the place again deserted. The stranger then, feeling that he cannot so insult the publican as not to look in for a drink, turns up from the beach to the sand hills and proceeds down the street towards the hotel. As he passes each house, out come the inhabitants, and, by the time he has reached the shelter of the barroom, the whole available population of some ten adults and thirty children are gazing at him. A few diggers live here, working for gold on the beach, or just behind the old seawall, and the rest of the population practically owe their means of livelihood to supplying these men and others in the district. This beach combing is sometimes profitable, as a great deal of surfacing, or black gold-bearing sand, is now and then deposited after a storm, and can be taken above high water mark before the next tide washes it away again. The gold obtained from this sand is very fine, sometimes not much coarser than flour. Above high water mark, on the sand hills forming the old sea wall, gold-bearing sand is worked in many localities, but it is not on the whole profitable, only fifteen shillings to thirty shillings a week being made. The average, however, is increased when a rich patch of surfacing is thrown up by a storm and good gold obtained from it by those who are on the vive. When journeying along the beach, huts belonging to men working the black sand are passed at long intervals, in lonely seclusion, on some flat amongst the tall flax or scrub above the high water mark. Behind these is generally a piece of swampy ground to the foot of the morainic hills, which are covered with tall bush. Beyond again, within twenty miles, the great snowy ranges can be seen, towering up to ten thousand or twelve thousand feet, with dark, gloomy valleys and rocky spurs, descending very rapidly to the lower country. It is a wonderfully fine effect to see this magnificent panorama of mountains so close, closed with bush at their base, and rising range upon range to their ice-clad summits, 
while standing on the sea beach with the heavy rollers just at one's back crashing onto the shingle and roaring as they retire and draw the stones after them from the beach near the waikukupa to the summit of mount cook is about twenty miles as the crow flies and is eight or nine miles to the foot of the outer flanks of the ranges five hundred feet above sea level therefore the southern alps and their many buttresses rise at this point twelve thousand feet in eight miles and can be seen for their whole height a track has been formed from gillespie's township up the cook river flats where mr ryan has a small farm about eight miles distant at the foot of the hills to this we made our way in the afternoon after two hours delay at the store ordering provisions and necessaries all the way down the coast our ice axes had created great curiosity and douglas who is of course known to every man woman and child south of the wanganui river overheard some remarks concerning these dangerous-looking implements four or five men were standing round the swags speculating as to the use of the ice axes the first suggested that they were grubbers which had been sent down for ryan another believed they were picks for fossicking gold in the ranges and so on ad lib at last a brilliant idea struck someone and he said why their fixings charlie has invented for spearing eels this appeared to solve the difficulty as they adjourned for a drink cook river has as i have already explained three branches the fox the balfour and the main branch the first name comes from the fox glacier which drains the dividing range from conway's peak to mount tasman and is bounded on the east by the bismarck range and its branches on the west by craig's range a high offshoot from mount tasman running northwest the balfour river flows from the glacier of that name lying between the latter range and the balfour range which branches off the divide from near the silberhorn of tasman and runs due west for nine or ten miles the main branch takes its rise from la perouse a fine glacier which drains the divide from the silberhorn of tasman to mount stokes and flows west between the balfour and copeland ranges the latter range is an offshoot of mount stokes and runs a little north of west past mount copeland seven thousand eight hundred and ninety five feet and little's peak seven thousand three hundred and eighty six feet to ryan's peak at this point it branches in two directions the northerly spur coming down close to the lower extremity of craig's range having curled round past the lower end of the balfour range the main branch of the river is joined by the balfour stream about three miles before it leaves the hills and after flowing for three or four miles on the flat country is joined by the fox river the hut to which we went on ryan's farm after leaving gillespie's is situated a mile or so above the inflow of the latter river at the point where it leaves the hills the main stream is spanned by a wire rope and cage placed there for the benefit of three or four men who are digging a mile further up on the south bank gold has been obtained in the main branch and balfour river but is now nearly all worked out only two claims existing at the present our plan of campaign was firstly to make an ascent on the lower end of the copeland range towards ryan's peak in order to get some general observations and photographs into the upper portions of the two branches and the surrounding peaks and then make our way to the balfour glacier taking the fox glacier and the main branch afterwards on march twelfth we took our camp to near the diggers huts and began to cut the track up a spur behind them it took two days before we had cleared a track and pitched our camp at three thousand feet and owing to wet and foggy weather it was the seventeenth before we were able to do our work on the top of the range even then we should have been unsuccessful had we not made a point of reaching our station by seven a m so as to finish the bearing before the fog came however luck was on our side and we were able to fix the station and return with the camp to the diggers huts by the evening of the seventeenth from the shoulder of ryan's peak we got a good idea of the topographical features of the watershed of cook river and could see the dividing range from mount ellie de beaumont to the footstool this is a good example of west coast work as compared with that of the eastern slopes of the southern alps it will be seen that to fix a station at five thousand feet took us six days necessitating a camp at three thousand feet whereas on the eastern side of the main range with its open grassy slopes and more certain climate the whole thing could have been done in one day from our lower camp on march eighteenth we moved off again crossing by the cage to the opposite side of the river and pitching camp in a perfect deluge of rain about half a mile above the diggers huts 
everything we had was wet, so the following morning was spent drying a few things before a large fire, and at noon we continued up the river to the inflow of the Balfour stream, at which point another, Craig's Creek, also joins the river, flowing from a small ice field on Craig's Peak. Douglas had explored this branch some years previously, and found the gorge impassable. The route therefore lay up the creek for a mile or more, and thence over the spur which comes from Craig's Peak to the gorge, a climb of about four thousand feet. Accordingly we turned up the creek, which comes down very rapidly over large stones and between rocky sides, a stiff piece of going for us with our usual handicap of fifty pounds. Towards evening we reached a large erratic boulder, about forty feet high and two hundred and fifty feet in circumference, under which we could find very fair shelter for the night. So we kindled a fire and turned in. Even this little valley had signs of ancient ice. The sides were two thousand feet high, and showed terraces of smooth, ice-worn rocks. It is possible that a glacier originally came from Craig's Peak down here, and joined the main ice streams, but the valley is so short that it is difficult to account for a body of ice large enough to leave such distinct marks and so many erratics. Half a mile above the bivouac, a tributary stream comes off the spur over which we were going. We therefore next morning followed it up for half an hour, and then pitched the batwing in the last patch of mountain scrub. Douglas, on his previous visit, had found some good crystals on this spur, so we spent the day crystal hunting and found some nice specimens. I took my camera to the ridge, some 1,700 feet, above camp, but failed to secure views owing to the inevitable fog. On the 21st, I made an early start with my load in order to obtain some photographs before the fog obscured the higher ranges, leaving Douglas to follow at his leisure. The view from the ridge will ever live in my memory as one of the most striking I know from a long range, because not only was it of surpassing grandeur, but of more than ordinary interest. In the first place, no one could suppose from a distance that there was room for more than a small valley here, but on closer inspection, there proved to be not only a broad valley and glacier, but a comparatively large tributary valley. The reason of this is that the ranges are of exceptional steepness and very narrow, allowing room for broad valleys between. The point on which we were standing was upwards of 5,000 feet above sea level, and overlooking a quadrangular basin seven miles in length, and increasing in breadth from one mile at the upper to two miles at the lower end, the floor of which lay 2,500 feet below. A spur from the Balfour Range, and that on which we were standing, forms the western wall of this basin, a deep gorge having been cut through it by the river. Craig's Range and the Balfour Ranges form the northern and southern sides respectively, while the eastern end is blocked by the stupendous buttresses of Mount Tasman. On the north and south of the valley the sides rise in rocky precipices, to the height of more than 2,000 feet, and at the western end Mount Tasman rises fully 7,000 feet, its black and frowning cliffs only relieved by one small ice field, which lies halfway up its sides. The small glacier is apparently of second-rate importance, but so far as was then known, it formed the neve of the Balfour. That a large glacier six miles long should draw its supplies from so small a neve was more than doubtful, and I was of opinion that the snowfield which we could see between the Balfour Range and Mount Dampier would prove to be the real neve, coming through some unsuspected gap in that range. This point we could not determine from here, and hoped to finally settle it by going up the glacier. There is only one small flow of ice joining the neve and trunk of this glacier. Most of the ice drops over a cliff over 1,000 feet in height, bringing with it a great deal of debris, which covers the glacier with heavy moraine for its whole length. Over the Balfour Range, Mounts Dampier, Hicks, and Stokes could be seen, with Harper's Saddle at the head of the Hooker Glacier, and behind again, dominating all, was the upper part of Mount Cook. These great peaks rose in apparently a wall, within seven miles of us, 7,000 or 8,000 feet of their height being visible. The original name given to Mount Stokes was La Parousse, and it seems a pity to have changed it. How appropriate the latter name is cannot be realized better than from Craig's Spur, because from this point there is a group of peaks standing alone, and from their position dwarfing all others. This group could hardly be surpassed, and being all closely connected, should have similar names. 
At present the name Stokes spoils the uniformity, and if La Perouse were again adopted, we should be able to call the group of five navigators, namely Tasman, 11,475 feet, Dampier, 11,323 feet, Cook, 12,349 feet, Hicks, 10,410 feet, and La Perouse, 10,101 feet. Fortunately, I had an hour or two on the top to obtain photographs before 9.30, when the fog closed in upon us. Douglas having arrived in due course, we began our descent over steep treacherous grass slopes and bare rocks, and in two hours arrived at the terminal moraine of the glacier, and pitched our fly, having left the bat wing behind, to lighten our loads. When travelling with a fly only, we arrange it as follows. Placing a pole horizontally, about five feet from the ground between two uprights, we hang the canvas over and peg it to the ground behind, giving it a slope of forty-five degrees. The front is then stretched out, and the corners made fast at three feet, and the center at four feet from the ground. The two ends of this lean-to are blocked with screens of scrub and fern, making walls of about three feet in width. Under the back part we place our bedding, which consists of twigs, branches, and grass, and kindle our fire in the shelter of the front portion. The bed is about the same size as in our bat wing, namely six feet by four feet, and on turning in we lie heads and tails in our blanket bags. This shelter is practically the same as our bat wings, only with walls of fern at the ends instead of canvas, but it has the disadvantage of only a single instead of a double canvas roof. To remedy this in heavy rain, we make a large screen of ferns or grass, and fix it about six inches above the back portion, letting it act as the fly does in the bat-wing camp. However good the quality of canvas, a certain amount of moisture always comes through in heavy rain, either in drops where the roof has been touched, or in fine spray, hence the necessity of an extra roof over the portion in which we sit or sleep. A single piece of oiled canvas would be waterproof in any weather, but has not sufficient lasting qualities, for it dries and cracks in a few weeks, and being nearly twice as heavy as ordinary canvas, it is just as convenient to take two pieces of the latter, if one takes any. Our camp was situated on the bank of McKenna's Creek, which drains some ice fields on Craig's Peak, and the range to the east. The valley in which the creek flows is broad and flat, for two and a half miles, and is separated from the Balfour Glacier by an ice-worn, narrow ridge which we named Hen and Chickens, descending from 1,500 feet at the upper end of the valley to 500 feet at the lower end. This ridge has been abraded by ice on both sides, and on the top for a greater part of its length. A few chains below our camp, the creek joins the Balfour River, at a point about a quarter of a mile below the glacier. After leaving the ice, the river flows on a fairly level course, through a series of terminal moraines, some of no great antiquity. There are five terraces of old lateral moraines along the lower part of the glacier, and three of these have their corresponding semicircular terminal moraines, from which the position of the glacier at different periods of its existence can be determined. The highest terrace of these five was formed by the ice when the glacier reached the present gorge, or possibly when it pushed its way still further through the narrow outlet. Almost immediately below the inflow of McKenna's Creek, the valley begins a rapid descent, and the river becomes a rushing torrent over, under, and through large erratic boulders, until half a mile below it leaps into a gloomy gorge walled by sheer rocky precipices of fully one thousand feet. Though I could see generally that the gorge narrowed and descended very rapidly, and also the enormous precipices overhead, it was impossible, owing to scrub and boulders, to obtain a photograph of more than a general idea of the gorge. It is a most helpless feeling to get mixed up with the large boulders met with in such places. One feels like Gulliver in his journeys amongst the giants, and can often neither get under or over one of these smooth-sided obstacles. The Balfour joins Cook River about three miles from the glacier, and must have a descent of 1,500 feet in a little under two miles while passing through the gorge. On March 22nd, we traversed the glacier from the terminal face to the foot of the precipices off Tasman, Douglas taking the southern and I the northern side. Rain, however, set in at noon, and by 3 p.m., when we reached the foot of Tasman, the clouds were so low that we could see nothing. 
It was therefore impossible to clear up the doubt about the neve of the glacier, but we still inclined to the opinion that the snowfield from Mount Hicks found an outlet into the Balfour, otherwise it was difficult to account for so large a trunk. The ice was completely covered with surface moraine, nearly every stone of which sparkled with minute crystals, and some of the larger stones bristled with crystals an inch long. My diary entry for March 23rd begins as follows, quote, Two and one-half miles of creek bed, 700 feet climb at the end, 55 minutes exciting race with fog, thought I'd done it, sold, end quote. Such races with the fog, to obtain bearings or photographs from a high point, were constantly taking place, and I think the fog has won as often as I have. On this particular occasion, I wanted to get a clear view from a point at the head of McKenna's Creek, which should finally settle the doubt with regard to the Balfour Neve. My route lay through some rather bad scrub for two hundred yards, and then along an open creek bed for two and one-quarter miles to the foot of a saddle, which lay nearly seven hundred feet above the creek. I took Betsy the dog, who, by the way, rejoined us after leaving the Waiho, and travelled at a jog-trot to the foot of the grassy slope of the saddle, because I had seen a small insignificant piece of fog form and disappear again on Ryan's Peak below the gorge. By the time the foot of the saddle had been reached, a dense bank of fog was crawling through the Balfour Gorge, and had apparently met an opposing current of air from McKenna's Creek, as it remained stationary to all appearances at the lower end of the valley. The saddle I was making for lay on the above-mentioned ice-worn rocky ridge, between the creek and the glacier, and as it would be only three or four miles from Tasman's great cliffs, it ought to command a grand view of the western face of that peak. I had just begun the ascent, when a wisp of fog came over the top of the ridge through another saddle, and I realized that though it had stopped at the end of McKenna Valley, it was passing up the Balfour Glacier on the far side of the Hen and Chickens. Never did I travel uphill so fast before. Betsy, now barking and biting my heels, now running ahead, was madly excited, while I scrambled frantically up to get at least one photograph. The fog now crept along the McKenna Valley, and was close up to me when I reached the bridge thoroughly done, having travelled just over two miles along the creek, and climbed seven hundred feet in fifty-five minutes, with twenty pounds of camera instruments, etc., on my back. It was all to no purpose, however, for though I had raced the fog behind in the McKenna Valley, it had crawled up along the Balfour Ridge, and only allowed me a momentary glimpse of Tasman's giant buttresses, obscuring everything above the six-thousand-foot level, before I could get my camera out of its case. Did you swear? I am generally asked, when relating this experience. No, I did not say anything at all. I merely upset a large rock lying near me, over the eight-hundred-foot precipice, under the Balfour Glacier, to relieve my mind, and then lay down to recover my wind. It happens so often, this mad rush uphill to forestall the fog, that one gets used to disappointments. The only way to secure good photographs is to reach the point by six or seven o'clock in the morning, and sit down quietly until the light improves. Directly the first bit of fog forms anywhere in sight, a set of plates ought to be exposed, whether the light is good or bad. Never wait till the last minute, but secure one set at least, and if the fog does give a farther chance of exposing in better light, then take another set. I have seen the whole landscape blotted out within three minutes of the first sign of fog, and as I was waiting till the last minute to let the light improve, I was on that occasion badly sold, and never again did I omit to make one complete set of exposures on arrival. The rocks above me on Craig's range were broken into very fantastic shapes, and numerous detached blocks lay on the hens and chickens, which I believe to have been left by the ancient glacier. Betsy and I spent two hours on the ridge, trying to catch some keas, and also dropping stones over the great precipice onto the glacier below. A most fascinating occupation is this, of rolling stones from a great height. Douglas and I have spent hours, when waiting for a fog to lift in various places, rolling down large rocks, and working as hard as if our lives depended on it, to dislodge one of exceptional dimensions. We often used to try and suggest some reason which would account for the fascination, for I suppose it may be said to be universal. I have never met a man, even amongst those who spend their whole lives on these hills, who did not only thoroughly enjoy seeing a stone career madly down a slope, but who would not go to considerable trouble to start one rolling. On returning along McKenna's Creek, 
we got two ducks, but the dog took them both to the far side of the creek, and left them there, compelling me to wade across for them, a cold task, as the stream was ice-fed, and took me up to the waist. Douglas, some years before I joined him, used to work alone, and had a wonderfully clever and awful useful dog named Topsy, which used to keep him well supplied with birds. She would go away to hunt as soon as he began to pitch camp, and return with three birds, two for her master and one for herself. It would be a very poor locality for birds if she couldn't find any. A better forager never existed. In another way, too, she proved useful. Douglas says that when going up a river he might find a rocky bluff rising out of the water, which seemed likely to necessitate a high climb. In order to avoid the risk of going forward some distance, and being compelled to return, owing to an impassable corner, he would send Topsy ahead and sit down for a smoke till she came back. On her return, he could always tell from her manner whether the route was practicable round the bluff. So well did she know what he could do, that on one occasion she gave him to understand that there was no possibility of going round, but as he was anxious to avoid the high climb through the bush, over the bluff, he picked up his load and started off to find his way round. Topsy, who was lying down, merely looked up, and seeing him going where she had been, stayed where she was, and made no attempt to follow, knowing her master would have to return to that spot to begin his climb over. When Douglas came back, having failed, he said Topsy got up, stretched herself, and followed him up the hillside, with a superior smile on her face. The weather became very threatening on the 24th, so we decided to get out of this valley, before a storm came on and stopped us, as provisions were coming to an end, and we had done all that was necessary. The very steep grass slopes and smooth rock faces, up which we had to go to reach the spur again, were treacherous, and would have been very dangerous but for our ice axes. It was annoying to have to take such a high and roundabout route to and from this glacier, when, had the gorge been passable, it would have only taken an hour or two to reach the junction with Cook River, instead of a long day. On Easter Sunday the storm came on, so we pushed along from our bivouac, where we slept on the previous evening, and reached Ryan's hut before dark. A week's bad weather followed, putting all the streams into high flood. Therefore we had good reason to congratulate ourselves on having got out of the Balfour Valley in time, for another day's delay, and we should have been cornered like rats in a trap, without the cheese. One evening some of the diggers working up Cook River above the cage, who had been down to town, Gillespie's, called in at the hut on their way back, and stayed for the night. Conversation turned to ice work, and after explaining the use of our axes, I began to give them a rough idea of the effects of glaciers. In the course of the conversation I spoke of the Tasman glacier, and one of those present said, Is the Tasman as large as the Fox River? Oh, yes, much larger, I said. Is it on a big river, too? said another. To which I replied, Yes, the Waitaki. What a rum thing, said the last speaker. It is that nearly all the glaciers are on rivers. It is curious, I said humbly, feeling ashamed that my discourse had not conveyed a better idea of the causes and effects of glaciers. End of chapter 6《Chapter 7 of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand》by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 7 Cook River, Fox Glacier. Slight Mishap. Douglas, the Chancellor Ridge, Victoria Glacier, Kias. Fogged again. Even when out of the ranges, our communication with the civilized world was casual. A weekly pack-horse mail came as far as Gillespie's Beach, and was generally punctual, except when rain put some of the rivers in flood, which occurred about twice out of five trips, and then we had to be thankful if there was only a week's delay. In addition to this, many of the inhabitants at Gillespie's are not on speaking terms, and as we relied on the thoughtfulness of someone coming up to the hut to bring our letters, it often happened that the person who came had not been to the post office, because he was not on good terms with the people there. On returning from the Balfour Valley, we found letters awaiting us in the hut, urging that our reports be completed and sent to the office in Hokitika before we again went into the ranges. This took some days, 
and when I had completed my portion of the writing, I decided to go to the Fox Glacier and work there until Douglas had finished his report and could join me. Regardless of possible bad luck, I left Ryan's hut on All Fool's Day, 1894, with Johnny Ryan, taking food for a fortnight, batwing, etc., in two forty-pound loads on a pack horse. The snout of the Fox Glacier, which lies 670 feet above sea level, is easily reached, but at present a horse cannot be taken within a mile of the ice. If, however, a track was cleared through the bush, there would be little need of formation, and a horse could go to the terminal face with little trouble. At a mile and a half below the glacier, I sent Ryan back with the horses, as they were of no further use, and leaving one load to bring up later, I started up the river with the other. The traveling was rather rougher than I expected, and it was 2 p.m. before I found a good camping place amongst some rata bushes near a tributary creek. Returning for and bringing up the second load occupied another two hours, leaving just enough daylight to clear a space and pitch the bat wing. When there is a probability of staying more than one night in a camp, we put some flat stones under the fire to keep it dry, and also a few between the bedding and the fire, as it is more comfortable and cleaner than the bare, damp ground. Intending to be here for a week at least, I made the camp as snug as possible before dark, and having had a meal, proceeded to read the papers which had come up by the mail before I left Ryan's. The Fox Glacier had been visited during the previous twenty-five years by many who were either in search of fine scenery or gold, but no one had been beyond the terminal face. The map then existing, as in the case of most of the western watershed, was made from distant trigonometrical stations on the sea bluffs and lower hills, and I anticipated some interesting work on such a large field of virgin ice. It was a decided drawback being alone, but still, one man can do a great deal by himself with due care, even on a glacier. The valley is broader than that of the Franz Joseph. The northern side rises nearly sheer from the ice, in high precipitous hills, a considerable amount of bare, ice-worn rock showing here and there through the dark vegetation. The southern side for the first three miles slopes gently back from the glacier for some distance, showing several old lateral moraines and terraces to the foot of Craig's Range, which rises abruptly for some 3,000 or 4,000 feet. The terraces and hillsides are clothed with dense bush and scrub to the usual altitude. On the right-hand side of the terminal face, when approaching the glacier, a large isolated rock stands in the center of the valley, which appears to be a perfect cone from below, but is in reality a narrow, glacier-worn ridge of nearly a mile in length. The ice, which, at a comparatively recent date, divided and flowed down on each side of the rock, now only flows along its northern face. The cone rock, as we named it, is 825 feet from base to summit, and shows marks of abrasion by ice all over it, with a number of huge erratic boulders strewn along its narrow ridge. These, however, are not seen until one is on the top, because the trees grow to a considerable size wherever they can obtain a hold. On the south side, a large creek coming off Craig's Range, down a steep course, flows against the cone and is turned at right angles to its original direction, and, continuing along the foot of the rock for a mile, joins the main river a few yards below the glacier. About half a mile from the river, up this creek, I made my camp, at the foot of the cone rock, in a nice patch of rata trees. The first thing to do next morning was to ascend the rock, and obtain a good general view of the glacier, to form some idea of the route to take up the ice. On reaching the top, I found it heaped with large erratic blocks, lying in hopeless confusion on one another along the narrow ridge, and sometimes from their size and position rather troublesome. Fine rata trees were growing amongst and on the top of these, and prevented my getting a clear view or opening for a photograph. I generally use my ice axe by an arrangement of my own for a camera stand, never carrying a tripod, as we must economize weight in every way. Here, however, a stand would have been useless, for the trees were too large, so climbing a rata until I could overlook its neighbors. I arranged cross sticks between two branches and made three exposures, one of which ultimately proved very good, the others having been spoilt by movement. From such a central position as the cone, a capital idea of the glacier can be obtained. Of the dividing range, Glacier Peak and Hedinger could be seen rising out of the neve, 
while more to the right the top of Tasman was visible over Craig's Peak. From the neve the ice descends over a good icefall, part of which is in view from the cone, and thence for three or four miles the glacier flows white and smooth to the terminal face. Two small portions of broken ice form the only apparent obstacles to easy travel as far as the great icefall. In the map then existing, the Fox Glacier was shown as flowing down in two large streams, divided by the Chancellor Ridge, a branch of the Bismarck Range. The southern ice flow drained the dividing range, and the northern came from the snowfields of Bismarck's Peak. I had fully anticipated a magnificent view of two great ice falls descending on each side of the Chancellor Ridge, and joining at its base, but there was nothing of the kind visible from the cone, presumably because the northern stream, or Victoria Glacier, flowed at a lower level, and joined the Fox without an ice fall. Below the Chancellor Ridge, the descent of the glacier is gradual, not nearly so steep as the Franz Joseph, and its course is over a smoother bed, no obstacles, apparently, to cause such broken waves and undulations as were seen on its neighbor. Having decided on the best route to follow, in order to reach the Chancellor Ridge, I climbed from my high perch in the rata tree to the ground. Though not very superstitious, I have one or two harmless ideas about luck, and one is that the first of April is an unlucky day to start on an expedition. However, up to this point all had gone well. I had a good camp, plenty of provisions, the promise of a day or two of really fine weather, and a fine glacier to explore. But such good fortune was not to last, for on descending from the top of the cone I had to go along a ledge overhanging a drop of about twenty-five feet, in the middle of which a single tree had to be passed. Catching a branch in one hand, I was in the act of swinging round on the outside when the limb broke and sent me backwards over the drop at the bottom of which I landed with one leg somewhere under my back. Before rising, I naturally looked at my camera, which was under me with some apprehension, and found it unhurt, but on getting up to go on, the pain in my ankle showed that it had been badly twisted. There is only one thing to do in a case like this, namely, keep moving, to prevent the joint from stiffening. An hour's hobbling brought me to camp, where I filled the billy with water, cut two days' supply of firewood, and generally fixed up the camp before resting. Within a quarter of an hour of sitting down, I could not put my foot to the ground, and had the pleasure of lying in camp during the third and fourth, before I could move about at all freely. An accident like this, though slight, would be quite enough to lead to fatal results if it occurred far away from camp because no anxiety would be felt by those on the low country for a week or two at least. Generally, indeed, two or three months might pass before a search party would be organized, as we often do not know how long we are going to be away. Even allowing that a search party was sent out within a week or two, they would not know where to begin operations, as the country would only be known to the object of their search. Douglas, who has in the past done most of his explorations alone, has been fortunate, except in one or two cases, one of which would have proved fatal but for his extraordinary pluck and determination. It was, if I recollect rightly from his account, in the seventies that he was crossing the swamp between the Karangarua and Cook River, jumping from, quote, niggerhead, end quote, to, quote, niggerhead, end quote, when he slipped and sprained his ankle badly. He only had a little oatmeal with him, and was nearly two weeks before he could get to Hunt's Beach, the nearest habitation, on coming some days after to the river Karangarua, he found it was rising, for rain had been falling, but in spite of his ankle and the fact that he couldn't swim, he crossed that evening and reached the hut thoroughly exhausted. He says it was a case of neck or nothing, because had he not crossed that night, the river would have been too high, and a day or two more of exposure would have been too much for him. Had he had any matches to kindle a fire, he would have got on much better, but even though it had been raining most of the time, he was without fire and only a little shelter. Making a crossbow, he killed two pigeons, but the bow soon lost its spring, and except these two birds, he had to rely on three pounds of oatmeal and a chew or two of tobacco. Had the accident occurred in the bush, probably more birds could have been obtained and a good shelter built, but this was in an almost open swamp. The fact that my little mishap and Douglas's accident turned out to be harmless is no excuse for working alone, nor does it alter the rule that a man should never go into rough country, away from habitation, by himself. But we cannot always act according to rules, however sound they are. It is often a choice of doing the work alone or not at all, 
and if no one took any risk, the country would be unexplored for years. I must plead guilty to having done a fair amount of solitary work, and to liking it quite as well as, if not better than, with a companion. But I admit that it is a mistake. On the fifth, I went up the glacier some three miles, to a point where the ice fall could be seen to advantage. The route lay up the creek from camp, for half a mile or so, to the upper end of the cone rock, though at the time I did not anticipate more than three hundred yards before reaching the ice. A few chains below the end of the rock, the creek bed turns at right angles up Craig's Range, from which it flows, and at the bend there is an old water course from the glacier into the creek down which there has been an outflow of water from the ice at no distant date. By taking this route, a rough piece of going is avoided, caused by the cone rock having compressed the glacier into a narrow channel. As far as the ice is concerned, one can get on or off almost anywhere along the sides, except where high rocky precipices render it impossible to land. Travelling on the glacier is easy to anyone accustomed to ice work, and it only has to be left once in order to skirt a small icefall nearly three miles up. Here there was, so late in the year, a short piece of complicated work amongst crevasses. About a mile and a half from the terminal face, there is a quarter of an hour of roughish ice, which had to be manoeuvred rather carefully, but which would give no trouble whatever earlier in the year. Soon after midday I had reached the small icefall, and having thus far seen no sign of the ice of the Victoria Glacier, I began to suspect some great error in the map. Landing on the south side, immediately below the rough ice, thirty minutes climbing and crawling over large boulders, forming a lateral moraine, brought me to the rocky point of a spur off Craig's Peak, round the foot of which the glacier bends. From this point of vantage, looking across to the Chancellor Ridge, it was evident that no tributary ice stream joined the main glacier, nor indeed did it appear that any glacier existed behind the ridge, because no water was visible coming over the rocks. The glacier is narrower here than its neighbor, but its total average width is slightly more. The surface ice is good, and though hummocky is fairly free from crevasses. The only surface moraine is at the terminal face, which is covered from side to side for perhaps a 150 yards up the glacier. It would be necessary to cross over the Chancellor Ridge, in order to settle the doubt concerning the Victoria Glacier, but my ankle was still too weak for a long day's work, so I returned to camp. On the following day I got up at dawn, intending to take blanket and provisions for a bivouac on the Chancellor Ridge, but the foot was still stiff and required another day's spell. Therefore, after going halfway up to a small icefall, I gave it best and went back to camp. It was evident that the sore ankle would not allow much work if I carried even a light load, so I decided to only take a quarter-plate camera and one day's food and trust to luck in the shape of a good stone, if necessary to sleep out on the Chancellor Ridge. Leaving camp at dawn, or 6 a.m. on the 7th, I reached the rock bluff below the ice fall in two hours, and went on to the foot of the fall to see if any practicable route could be found up to the Neve. Though not stupendously broken, as the upper part of the France Joseph, the ice fall of the Fox Glacier would be better left alone, as the seracs are large and constantly falling. Turning back again, towards the lower end of the Chancellor Ridge, I intended to cross it, and if possible go up some peak or saddle on the Bismarck Range, to command a view of the Fritz Glacier and head of the Waikukupa River. At the lower end of the ridge it was easy to reach the side, which is of smooth rock, sloping gently under the ice. About, above and below, the glacier is lined by sheer, and in places overhanging precipices, of four hundred or five hundred feet in height. At the foot of this rocky wall the ice flows level and unbroken. It was not rotten or crevassed, as is the usual case at the side of a glacier. In one place it was possible to walk up to the foot of the cliff, and, standing on the ice, lean my back against the rock, only a foot or less space intervening. The ice is evidently of great depth at the side here, which accounts for its unbroken surface and the rock must be perpendicular for a considerable distance, below the level of the glacier. It was now evident that there was a fair-sized glacier in the valley between the Chancellor Ridge and the Bismarck Range, as a large stream of dirty water fell over the precipices, making a fine waterfall. It had worn a curiously shaped funnel down the face, which completely hid the stream until quite close to it, and which accounted for my not seeing it from the opposite side of the glacier. The old saying, more haste, less speed, 
is generally true, but never more so than in new country, as I have often found to my cost. After leaving the ice and being in too great a hurry to reach a good point of view into the valley beyond the Chancellor Ridge, I began to climb up and across the lower end of the spur. This is very steep and rotten, and the whole face being shattered rock, it was not without considerable trouble that I reached the arete, having got into one or two decidedly ticklish places. In half an hour I topped the ridge, and could see into the valley beyond, where lay, three hundred feet below me, the Victoria Glacier, slightly over four miles in length, and about thirty chains in breadth, covered with a very heavy surface moraine for a third of its length. This glacier comes off the Bismarck Range, from Bismarck's Peak and Mount Anderig, with two tributary glaciers, from the Chancellor Ridge on the south, and from a long offshoot of Anderig on the north. It flows past the end of the Chancellor onto a plateau, 3,685 feet, lying at the top of the perpendicular rocky wall already described, which rises out of the Fox Glacier. Large erratic boulders lie scattered on the plateau, amongst dense mountain scrub and grass, showing that in the past the Victoria found its way over the cliffs to the main ice flow of the Fox. As it exists at present, the Victoria is as perfect an example of a small primary glacier as could be found, with its little neve, tributary ice streams, and complete system of surface, lateral, and terminal moraines. I had been looking for a likely alpine pass to the Tasman Valley since the beginning of the season, and had come to the conclusion that, for all practical purposes, the Franz Joseph Glacier had better be left alone, so far as its lower extremity was concerned. There now appeared to be a good route up the Victoria Glacier, over a low call, to the head of the Fritz Glacier, and thence, behind Rune, to the head of the Melchior, a branch of the Franz Joseph Glacier, and then across the broad Neve Basin of the latter, over Graham's Saddle, near De La Beche, down the Rudolph Glacier to the Tasman. I had been close up to Graham's Saddle from the Tasman, and knew the Franz Joseph Glacier and the Victoria, so excepting the call over the Bismarck Range, there was little new ground to cover. Therefore, while I was in Christchurch during the winter, following this trip, I tried to persuade someone to come and make this pass and though Mr. Fife arranged to join me, he was at the last moment unable to do so. However, I am glad to say, I ultimately had the satisfaction of being one of the party to make the first complete pass, as will be seen later, when I told Mr. Fitzgerald of the route, and with him and Zurbriggen crossed it a year later. Ever since sunrise, I had been the object of considerable attention from some kias, or mountain parrots, at first only two or three, but afterwards their number had increased to fifteen or more. They joined me on the south side of the Fox Glacier, and annoyed me considerably by their inquisitiveness while I was taking some bearings and photographs, one of them alighting on my back, just as I was looking through the compass. These birds are not found except in high country, and their eggs are very rare, as they probably choose some crevice in the face of a precipice for their nesting place. They have cruel beaks and great power in them, being able to tear any cloth with a single stroke, but are tame and harmless, except in certain localities where they kill sheep. This weakness of theirs has given them a bad name, and it is generally supposed that all kias are naturally inclined to attack sheep. Such, however, is not the case. The fault lay in the first instance with shepherds or persons who had to skin the sheep on the station. Kias naturally feed on berries, but they are possessed of an intense desire to investigate everything they see and, if possible, tear it with their beaks. Consequently, near homesteads in Otago and Canterbury, when they see sheepskins hanging up to dry, they go down to examine them. If the skins are carefully cleaned, little harm results, but if not, the kias have a chance to taste the fat, and when once a kia tastes fat, he is a ruined bird, and would sell his soul, if he had one, to get more. To satisfy this craving, he attacks the sheep with fatal effect causing in some localities very heavy loss to the stations. Note. These birds, when attacking live sheep, settle on the back of the animal and deliberately drive their beaks into the skin until they have reached the kidney fat. They never wound a sheep in any other part of the body. End of note. The birds are not migratory, and as far as I have been able to ascertain, rarely leave the valleys they live in. This is evidenced by the fact that while some stations lose many sheep, owing to the kias, an adjoining owner may suffer no loss whatever, owing to the fact that the birds have not learnt the taste for fat. 
When crossing the Chancellor Ridge, the keys which I referred to followed me on the wing, but owing to the ice being very slippery, my progress was too slow for them. Therefore, alighting on the ice, they began to follow on foot. Whenever a kia makes its appearance, we are prepared for some good fun, as their actions are most ludicrous, and their conversation, which is incessant, is almost expressive enough to enable one to understand what they mean. I have had considerable experience with these birds, but have never seen such an intensely funny proceeding as on this particular morning. The kias, having settled on the ice, began to follow in a long straggling line, about fifteen of them. They have a preternaturally solemn walk, but when in a hurry they hop along on both feet, looking very eager and very much in earnest. To see these fifteen birds hopping along behind in a string, as if their very lives depended on keeping me in sight, was ridiculously comic. The ice was undulating, with little valleys and hummocks, and the birds would now, for a second or two, disappear into a hollow, and now show up on a hummock, pause for a moment, and then hop down again out of sight, into the next hollow. To judge by their expressions and manner, they were in a great state of anxiety, on emerging from a hollow, onto a hummock, as to whether I was still there. Now and then the one in front would appear, craning his neck, and on seeing me still ahead, would turn round and shriek, Yeah! as much as to say, It's all right, boys, come up and along. And the others, putting their heads down, would set their teeth and travel all they knew, a fat one in the rear evidently making very heavy weather of it. On the Chancellor Ridge they became offensively inquisitive, and I really could hardly take any photographs, owing to their anxiety to ascertain the maker's name on my camera. However, such is the perversity of affairs in general, that it was only when it occurred to me that a picture of ten or fifteen kias examining my ice-ax would be interesting, that they suddenly seemed to remember an appointment elsewhere, and disappeared. Had the idea occurred a few minutes earlier, a good picture could have been obtained. After having descended to the Victoria Glacier, I saw a small cloud appearing on Craig's range, which warned me that the usual fog was coming, so I hastened back to the ridge, and along it to a point from which I could get a view over the neve of the Fox Glacier. The climb gradually developed into a race with the mists creeping up the valley behind me. On reaching the top I was rewarded by a momentary but magnificent view of Haidinger and the great northern face of Tasman, before the fog descended like a curtain and shut everything from view, leaving no time to take a photograph. I have been fortunate enough to have been all over the central part of our Alps, and to have seen the great peaks, both far and near from every side. And I think the northern face of Mount Tasman is as fine as anything I know, except perhaps Mount Sefton. It rises out of the neve of the Fox Glacier in great brown precipices, capped with hanging glaciers, and the graceful curves of the summit are unsurpassed for beauty. When the fog had once closed in and shut out surrounding objects, it is really little use waiting for it to clear. But for some reason, I always hope against hope, and spend a miserable hour or two under a rock, before finally giving it up as useless. On this occasion I stayed for nearly two hours, on the side of the ridge, now and then catching a fleeting glimpse of the main glacier, far below me, winding in ghostly whiteness down the valley, and beyond it the sea, with its two or three lines of breakers, crawling in towards the beach. Of the upper portion of the valley nothing was again visible, beyond one tantalizing peep of Tasman's mighty shoulders appearing over the fog. At one-thirty I could not see an object fifteen yards away, and the dry fog changed to a wet mist, a sure sign of an approaching storm. So I began to cast about for a shelter in which to spend the night, and from which to make an ascent on the Bismarck Range, if the morrow proved fine. However, in half an hour, the drifting mist having wetted my clothes completely, I gave up all idea of staying out for the night, and decided to get back to my camp without delay. End of chapter 7「Eight of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 8. Fox Glass here continued. Return to camp. Unpleasant surprise. Result. Weckus. Back to Ryan's. Remarks on the glacier. To return in such a dense fog was by no means easy especially as I could not think of descending the rotten rocks, up which I had come in the morning, 
for even had it been possible to find a route, the falling stones would have been too risky. Fortunately, my bump of locality is strong, and by dint of dropping, sliding, and scrambling over steep faces of unpleasantly smooth rocks and slippery grass, I managed to hit off the point to a nicety at which to cross the ice. On reaching the south bank and skirting the small icefall, the few minutes' work amongst the crevasses gave some trouble in the fog. It is no easy matter to travel down a glacier, even when one knows it well, in such a dense white mist, but to find a good route after only once traversing it was rather difficult business. After travelling till 5 p.m., it seemed that I had gone far enough to have reached the point where I first took the ice in the morning. There are no large stones on the glacier by which to guide one's course, so it was not surprising to find, on turning towards the bank, that I had gone about one hundred yards too far, and was abreast of the precipice under the cone rock. Another half hour, however, saw me on my way to the camp, and though wet to the skin, decidedly pleased at being well out of an awkward position, and looking forward to dry clothes, good fire, and snug camp. Hurrying along in the deluge of rain, which had set in, splashing down the creek and clambering over the boulders, I arrived at the camp about ten minutes before dark. Instead of my comfortable little shelter and dry clothes, I found only a wreck. The batwing and a quarter of the fly had been burnt. The little canvas bags of food and the pea-rifle, which usually hung on the ridge-pole under the fly, were lying scorched on the ground. In one corner a heap of ashes, a button or two, and a large hole in the scrub bedding were all that remained of my dry clothes. This was the crowning disaster of an unlucky expedition. A man familiar with his Virgil would probably have consoled himself by saying, Forsen et he olum meminis ejuvabit. I fear, however, that I made some other remark, not in Latin, and did not think of Virgil till afterwards. With only a few minutes of twilight to work in, I commenced to fix up some sort of shelter out of the remains in which to pass the night. A more weatherproof shelter would have to be left till the morning in spite of the heavy rain. The fly I pitched as we had had it on the bow for glacier, and one end was blocked to a height of two feet with a few branches. This was all that could be done that night, and having kindled a fire and put the billy on to boil, I sat down to see what remained out of the wreck. The first things to be missed were the candles, which had of course been burnt, and their loss at once put an end to further investigation till daylight. Fortunately, I had a few matches in my pocket, and could manage with care to hold out for a few days as far as they were concerned. Having had something to eat, and some half-burnt tea without sugar to drink, I put on kilts, i.e. wrapped the blanket round me, and proceeded to dry my clothes. By ten o'clock some of the garments were fairly dry. So, thoroughly tired after the long day, I rolled myself in the blanket, and in spite of the storm, soon forgot this miserable world in a sound sleep. However long or hard a day's work has been, we cannot sit down and have a spell on returning to camp at night, because possibly there is firewood to gather, bread to bake, and a meal to cook. Indeed, sometimes a meal has to be found with a pea rifle. It would be to either of us a luxury beyond belief to have a third man whom we could occasionally leave in camp, and to find things ready on our return in the evening. The extra work in the evening is far harder than one would imagine, even supposing a permanent third member to the party was impossible. It would have made our work considerably quicker and less trying had we been given a man who could carry a good load of provisions for two or three days from habitation and then be sent back. This would give us a good stock to fall back on and possibly save a long tramp back for food or else a period of starvation. It is a trial to one's powers to have to do mental work and heavy packing at the same time in such terribly broken country and for a prolonged season of seven or eight months. The authorities, however, did not consider it necessary, not having any idea of what rough work it really was. In fact, on one occasion when mention was made of the necessity of carrying heavy loads, someone asked, Why do you not employ a spring dray or pack horse? Imagine a spring dray over fifty-foot boulders, or along a narrow arete. It was often difficult to get the dog over the country. The driving rain and high wind whistling under the fly woke me early, and at daylight I set to work to build a more satisfactory shelter. The creeks and rivers were in flood and uncrossable, so there was every prospect of two days' delay before I could get away. 
it did not take long to put up two good windbreaks with branches and ferns at each end of the fly and to generally fix up a shelter in which i was as happy as a sand boy in spite of the storm there was now time to examine the effects of the fire which had been very erratic in the first place it is hard to explain why the fly had not been totally destroyed for it was only pitched six inches above the batwing it would seem impossible for the latter to burn from the bottom so completely as it had without setting fire to the fly which is the most inflammable portion of the camp owing to the fire always keeping it dry at each end of the batwing we have two pockets a large one for field books etc and a small one for watch matches and so forth in the two large ones i had left some photographic plates notebooks and a pound of candles the books and plate boxes were charred a little and the candles had disappeared. In one of the smaller pockets were a box of fifty pea-rifle cartridges and two boxes of matches. The cartridges were unhurt, while one box of matches had exploded and the other only melted in a solid mass. On the bedding, my dry clothes and tobacco were in one corner, and within a foot of them the blanket with the half-plate camera and some newspapers on it. Of these, the clothes and tobacco had gone absolutely, leaving a hole burnt to the ground in the scrub where we slept. The other heap was untouched, except the papers on the camera, which were burnt to an ash. Douglas has only once been burnt out, and his experience is the same as that of others, namely, that nothing escapes. My misfortune was, therefore, not as bad as it might have been, and there was good cause to be thankful that some provisions were still left since my retreat was cut off shelter was not of so much importance because had all the canvas been destroyed i could have knocked up a mai mai of bark and ferns in an hour it is impossible to say how the fire originated unless i had left the candle burning when leaving camp at dawn in which case no doubt one of the wekas had pulled it over while looking for buttons or some such digestible food the white candle would be an irresistible temptation after all it is of little consequence how the thing happened the fact remained that I had to sit and sigh in idleness for three days. Whilst turning out the contents of one of my pockets, I came across a scrap of an old world, on which was a most appropriate poem entitled, Every Hour Has Its End. This fact is often too true to dispute, but was open to argument under the present circumstances. With nothing to read and very little to smoke, the hours appeared to have at least one hundred minutes. The family of Wekas, which had taken possession of the camp, were very welcome, and I was able to watch their mode of procedure when dissolving partnership for the time being. As already stated, when the male bird thinks he has done his share in the education and bringing up of the family, he dissolves partnership. If in a good locality for food, he drives his mate and young ones away, but if in a poor locality, he departs to happier hunting grounds himself. The parent birds, while rearing their young, hardly eat anything themselves, and grow as poor as a church mouse, everything they find is carried to the youngsters. When a pair has only one chick, it is very ludicrous to see them rushing up to it and jostling one another in their eagerness to give it a piece of bacon or bread, and sometimes asking it to try a piece of jam tin or tempting it with a choice copper cartridge case. The parent finds some such rubbish, and rushes off to the overfed fledgling, which is sitting and squeaking under a fern, and holds the tempting morsel out in its beak. The old one looks sideways at it, as much as to say, so good, while the youngster, having got it successfully down, sits with ruffled feathers, and looks at the world in general, as if it would say, that old food will be the death of me one of these days. The first intimation I had that the pair at camp were going to dissolve partnership was when I threw out a piece of bread one morning. Paterfamilius, instead of passing it to one of the chickens, swallowed it himself, while the rest of the family looked on reproachfully, and seemed to know they must look out for squalls. After the old boy had got all he could, he suddenly turned round and attacked his wife, and then the male youngster, the female chick having wisely disappeared, pro tem. When I saw he was going to drive the family away and stay at the camp to enjoy all the good things himself, I decided to put a stop to his little game and gave him a rifle bullet to digest. He made a capital stew, and a sorrowing family thoroughly enjoyed his remains. The next day, Mrs. Wecca found the two half-grown chickens rather a large order. In the first place, they both tried to shelter themselves under her from the rain, which upset her mentally and physically, 
and secondly, the task of feeding them was too much for her. She therefore proceeded to drive away Master Weka. That young gentleman, however, was not going to leave his family home without a struggle, and seeing his sister still petted and fed, he used to give her a good peck when the old hen was not looking, and then run for his life before she caught him. I again interfered in the proceedings, and by dint of some coaxing, persuaded Master Weka to come on to the bedding in the shelter, where he would eat from my hand. By degrees he gained confidence, and came in without fear, having a good feed, while the old hen remained outside, waiting for him. On finishing the meal he used to dodge about inside, trying to make his escape, and the old bird dodged about outside, to cut him off. I would then throw a piece of bread away into the bush, and while she went after it, the youngster would slip out and run for dear life, rolling his more favoured sister in the mud on the way. On the tenth, the weather cleared, and gave me an opportunity to go down to Ryan's hut. Therefore, leaving my friends to settle their own family affairs, I rolled up my goods and started down the river, meeting Douglas and Betsy, who were coming up to join me. However, my ankle was still weak and wanted a rest, so we went back to the hut to make a new batwing and generally repair damages. It required another ten days' work to map the glacier, so we returned on the 16th and took the camp three-quarters of a mile further up the creek than my first camp, intending to make some observations as to motion, etc., and complete the map of the valley. Fate seemed to be against us on this glacier, for out of the thirteen days away from Ryan's hut, we had only two fine ones, and those were the day we came up to camp and the day we returned to Ryan's. We were, however, able to make a more thorough exploration of the Fox and Victoria glaciers below the Neve, and take a few more bearings. On the twenty-ninth, our stores had come to an end, so the weather cleared and the sun shone out beautifully, but one or two snowfalls had taken place during the previous week, warning us that winter was approaching, and that if we intended to reach the head of Cook's River and the La Perouse Glacier, we must do so at once and waste no more time over the Fox Glacier. In any case, there was little left to be done there, while Cook River might prove troublesome, and there was a danger of further snow preventing our expedition. Consequently, we packed up and carried our loads back to Ryan's hut. The Fox Glacier is more attractive than many places much advertised and visited. It certainly has not nearly such a grand terminal face as the Franz Joseph, but it is in every other way superior for tourists. It is quite as easy of access, it has fine surroundings, and there are hot springs within a mile of it. But the chief attraction to my mind is that anyone with ordinary care can go a mile or so along the ice, or three miles along the south bank, on the old lateral moraines. This would enable many who have never seen a glacier to gain some idea of an icefall at close quarters, for though not so fine as that of its neighbor, the icefall of the fox is by no means a poor one. An easy and safe expedition could be made to the Chancellor Ridge, from which a grand view of the great peaks and the neve can be gained. If the government desired to open up the district, a track could be taken up to the glacier, and even along its south bank, at a small cost, and a hut placed on the Chancellor. To go even a short distance on to the Franz Joseph Glacier with safety would require an expert at ice work. There are many interesting features on the Fox Glacier, which are more marked than on other ice streams in New Zealand. On no other glacier in the southern Alps is the veined structure of the ice so apparent. In fact, I have never seen such a fine example of this anywhere. The ice is laminated to such an extent, just above the Cone Rock, that it resembles a ploughed field, and the furrows being from six inches to a foot in depth, and the same distance apart in places, are very troublesome to walk over. The lamination does not run in one direction, and though most of the lines are longitudinal, they sometimes curve gracefully toward the margin of the ice. Wherever a crevasse occurs, the effect is beautiful, and the lines can be seen descending perpendicularly as far as there is light to see. Another peculiarity on the fox is the number of moulins, or funnels in the ice. Abreast of, and above the cone rock, they are most noticeable, and though not as fine as many I have seen elsewhere, they are very good specimens, from six to ten feet across at the top, and two or three feet a little lower down. For Roche-Moutonnet, this valley does not equal the Franz Joseph, but has a splendid example of a great isolated rock in the cone. The northern bank, too, from the terminal face to the icefall, 
presents a good instance of steep faces of rock abraded by glacier action. Lateral moraines of various ages can be examined on the south side of the valley, and large erratic blocks found on the top of the cone rock. The individual points of interest may be surpassed, with the exception of the first mention, in other localities, but nowhere else in New Zealand can they be seen to such perfection, collected in one valley, easy to reach, and easy to inspect and examine, owing to the smooth surface of the glacier. In addition to this, there is the fact of still more peculiar interest, namely, a glacier in approximate latitude, 43 degrees, 29 minutes, 30 seconds south, descending over nine miles to 670 feet above sea level, within 10 miles of the beach. This can also be said of the Franz Joseph, but it does not at the same time possess all the other interesting features mentioned above, nor is it so easy to travel on. The very easy travelling and unbroken surface of the Fox Glacier shows, I imagine, that the ice is of greater depth than that of the Franz Joseph. It may be that this smoothness is due to the bed of the valley having fewer obstructions. That there are several rocky obstacles under the ice of the latter cannot, I think, be doubted, and accounts for the heaving appearance which the ice of that glacier has. I am not aware that the old saying, still waters run deep, can be applied to a glacier, but it appears to me that the Fox Glacier must be of considerable depth, or it would not flow down as steeply as it does without having a rougher and more broken surface. At the terminal face the ice pushes its way under the level of the river bed. In several places holes in the gravel, caused by subsidence due to the melting ice, can be seen towards the end of the summer. The water, too, does not come out in an ordinary manner, but bubbles up like a great spring, to a height of three feet in ordinary weather, and five or six feet during rain. This shows that the streams, which flow under the ice, are considerably below the riverbed level when they reach the terminal face, and on being released from the ice rush up to the surface with great force. In July 1894, Douglas and Mr. Wilson paid a brief visit to the glacier, and the former noticed a very marked change in the ice. As will be seen in a later chapter, we anticipate a decided winter advance in the Franz Joseph Glacier, and were disappointed to find that a retreat only was evident. The fact of these two glaciers descending to such a low altitude would lead one to expect a greater proportional winter motion than is to be found on higher glaciers, for the melting would be less by a great deal than in the summer, and yet the rapid descent and frequent rain would cause a movement greater in comparison to the melting than we should find in the hotter months. This was fully borne out in the case of the Fox Glacier, for Douglas found some of my flags, which had been as usual visible from each other, invisible from points where originally they could be seen owing to the ice having banked up considerably. Also, on two rocky points or capes on the north side, the ice had completely covered a large portion of rock visible in the summer. I do not know why this advance or increase was visible on the Fox Glacier, while on its neighbor a general decrease was found. It may be, and probably is, due to the different aspect of the two valleys. This one faces slightly north of west, and therefore loses the winter sun for many hours in the day on its lower portion, while the Franz Joseph faces due north and receives the whole heat of the day. Again, this glacier has the steep hillsides on the sunny side, while the other has them on the opposite side. When reliable observations as to the motion of the ice are taken, we shall probably find a much higher rate of flow on the Franz Joseph than on the Fox Glacier. An unnamed peak, generally confused with Hedinger from the west coast, and not visible except from high points on the eastern ranges, stands at the head of the Fox, and is the most prominent summit from the terminal face. This I have seen from several different points, and always held that it is distinct from Hedinger. When Fitzgerald made his ascent of the latter, he left a large cairn on the summit, and he and I distinctly saw this from the Fritz Glacier when we were there during the next season. I had explained my contention to him before we started, and we therefore made a point of deciding the question. Since Hedinger was first named from the Tasman, and the name has been put on the wrong peak by the West Coast Department, it should be retained on the summit seen from the eastern side. I have generally called this unnamed peak the Horn, for it is a distinct horn from the west coast, De La Beche, and Darwin. Hedinger proper does not show as a peak at all from the Fox Glacier, though one of the finest as seen from the Tasman. The first impression I received 
on looking at the surroundings of the Fox Neve was, the peaks rising from it would be most troublesome to climb from this side, but the fog cut off my view so soon that the mistake was excusable. Since then, however, a second visit has shown that so far from being more difficult, they would seem to be easier on this side than from the Tasman. From the Chancellor Ridge, the Horn, Glacier Peak, and Hedinger are all accessible, as also are the chief peaks of the Bismarck Range. Good passes may be found between Mount Tasman and Mount Host, also between the latter and Hedinger. In fact, so many expeditions of interest are to be made from here that I hope it will not be many years before we see a good hut placed on the Chancellor. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan Chapter 9 Cook River Main Branch Rough Work Large Boulders Castle Rock Rata Trees Shelf Camp Bad Weather Short Commons Cave Camp The main branch of Cook River had been prospected for gold some years previous to our exploration, but as the diggers never bring out any information concerning the topography or appearance of the country, their visits are not taken into account. In fact, it is often quite impossible to find out how far they had been up a valley. Sometimes the distances they say they went would land them, in reality, some miles out onto the Mackenzie Plains. Oh, I remember one fellow saying he had been eight miles along a certain ridge, a fact which I doubted, but on being pressed he admitted that, when he turned back, he had not reached the open grass, but he had gone quite eight miles by that time. Knowing the ridge well, I was able to say that he had not gone a mile and a quarter, as that would have brought him well up to the grass. While waiting at Ryan's, on our return from the Fox Glacier, for some provisions, which were to come up from Gillespie's, the weather was perfect. But the fates were against us, and on the day the stores arrived, rain set in and prevented a start until the 29th of April. Sending our camp, stores, and instruments in three loads of fifty pounds each, by pack horse to the diggers' huts, we followed on foot and crossed by the wire rope and cage. With the usual colonial freedom, we boiled the billy and had a meal in one of the huts before shouldering our loads. Such is the hospitality of the West Coast digger, that the owner of the hut would have been much hurt if we had not made ourselves at home, or had troubled to unroll the swags to get out our own provisions. Leaving about fifty pounds to bring up later, we took forty-five pounds each, and starting at one thirty p.m., traveled till nearly five o'clock without stopping, covering a distance of about four miles. This was my first experience of following up to its source, a river, which came down for any distance through the ranges. Hitherto this year, on the Waiho and Fox Rivers, the glacier and ice work predominated, and on the bow for the gorge prevented our following the actual river. In Cook River, however, we had to follow the valley, and very rough, slow work it proved. The distance covered on our first day was the longest we made during the trip, but on going over the same ground again, the time was reduced considerably as we not only knew the route, but had bush tracks blazed where necessary. The first mile or two were simple enough, merely alternate beaches of small stones, i.e. stones under three feet in diameter, and short stretches of large boulders or rocky bluffs against which the river ran deep, compelling us to take to the bush. I have already described what taking to the bush involves in the way of track cutting, so need only add that when compelled to leave the open river bed, the loads had to be put down, a track blazed, round or over the obstacle, to the next piece of open going, and a return made for the loads. After the junction of Cook and Balfour Rivers, the hard work began. The valley narrows considerably, and has very steep sides, covered with dense bush and undergrowth, while below the bush, for perhaps thirty feet to the water, the valley is filled with gigantic boulders, varying in size from three feet to one hundred feet, and even one hundred and fifty feet, in diameter. These giant masses are not only lying in hopeless confusion in the bottom of the valley, but for some distance up the hillsides, where it is not too steep, boulders are found amongst and on top of which the great trees of the bush are growing. I should thoroughly enjoy a day or two travelling over such ground with nothing to carry, but it is far from amusing with forty or fifty pounds on one's back, even with one man helping the other. I really doubt whether in some places further up the river 
a man by himself could have managed to make any progress at all in the riverbed. Often, when an impassable bluff rendered it necessary to go into the bush, one of us would slip down between two boulders into a wedge-shaped hole concealed by ferns, and after scrambling out again probably bark a shin in another hole. On finding the bush very bad going, we would decide to choose the least of two evils and go back to the open river bed. This probably necessitated a crawl under two boulders through a small tunnel, perhaps ten or twenty feet long, with a muddy bottom or trickling water. The aperture would appear large enough to allow one to crawl through with a load, but after going a little way on hands and knees, one would have to lie down because the load had proved too high for the tunnel. Then wriggling along, snake fashion, a little further, and the tunnel becoming smaller, the load would stick, leaving one lying face down, in mud or trickling water, fairly unable to move. The only way out of the difficulty is to allow the other man to lay hold of one by the heels, and to submit, in silence if possible, to the ignominious and uncomfortable operation of being pulled out against the grain. I do not know anything more trying to the temper than this operation, and I think it speaks volumes for Douglas and myself that the dog came back alive. After emerging from a hole backwards, with trousers above the knees, shirt ruffled up round the neck, and generally muddy, many men would want to kill something, on the same principle that some men swear at the caddy when they take their eyes off the ball at golf and come to grief. Having smoothed down the ruffled feelings and feathers, we would take off our loads and go through, passing them in front or pulling them behind. It really makes little difference whether the swag is passed in front or behind, because both methods involve sundry bumps on the head and skinned knuckles. In addition to these performances, boulders are met with, to pass which one man has to stand on the other's shoulders and swarm up a smooth round stone, then let down a rope and hoist the loads and the other man. Or the reverse is necessary in other places, followed by more crawling under boulders, and so on, ad lib. Considering these obstacles and the necessity of carrying our loads, it is not surprising that in one part of the river we were four days traversing four and a half miles in the narrowest part of the valley, climbing, crawling, sliding, scrambling, and track-cutting most of the time. In Westland there are many examples of this peculiarity, where a clump of trees are growing on a high rock, on which they will necessarily feel the want of water when they have grown to a respectable size. One of the trees in such a position sends down a long arm, which is not a root or branch, but merely a sucker, to the nearest water. All the other trees on the rock then send out similar arms, and fasten them onto the one which has first found water, and in this way the whole clump benefits and flourishes. Further evidence of this peculiar law of nature is found in cases where seedlings have been deposited on a narrow ledge on the face of a precipice. Their position is a very precarious one when they grow to any size, for a high wind will probably prove too much for them. They therefore send an arm up the face of the rock or sometimes along it, on the same level, until it finds a crevice, and here it fastens with a wonderfully tight grip. These offshoots are found quite newly grown on trees that must be of considerable age. Immediately above our camp, the river came boiling and foaming out of a gorge, walled by sheer rock cliffs, which would compel us to blaze a track up some height and along the top of the bluff. From here, about two miles further up the river, and some height on the slopes of Ryan's Peak, we saw a rock with scrub growing on the top, which looked extraordinarily like Her Majesty's head on a jubilee coin. Instead of a crown, the scrub formed a cap, and with the snow sprinkled on the scrub, it had the appearance of a black cap with white bands trailing out behind. This rock must be two hundred feet in height, from neck to crown, and the overhanging piece forming the nose cannot project much less than thirty feet. It is as perfect a natural bust as I have come across, as seen from this camp, and one or two points on the route past the gorge. The next day, the thirtieth, Douglas began to blaze a track over the bluff, while I returned to the digger's hut for the sixty-pound load we had left behind, and making a long day of it, reached camp again at dark. If the journey up to the camp had been hard work, with two of us together, it was doubly hard by myself, and the manipulation of the pack at some of the large boulders much more difficult. The down journey without the handicap of sixty pounds was made in three hours, but the return took a good five hours, chiefly owing to the number of times the load had to be roped up a boulder behind me and let down on the other side. 
the worst place of all to manage alone was passed far more easily than i had any right to expect for while making up my mind how to get down without damaging my burden i overbalanced and fell thus solving the weighty problem without sustaining any damage when a man has a heavy load on his back a fall for a reasonable distance is of little consequence for the weight always causes him to fall on to the swag thus having a more or less soft buffer to resist the shock on the first of may we had time to look over some papers which we had received at ryan's a week previously the latest news in them was three weeks old but prior to seeing them we were nearly three months behind time we here first read the telegram announcing mr gladstone's resignation douglas had not been able to reach the open river beyond the gorge on the previous day so we spent the second in taking the track on through the gorge when two work together we generally arranged that while one blazes the track the other follows and carries a load which we leave at the end of the day and return to camp the next day bringing up the remainder of the stores we camp at the point where the load was left and while one prepares a shelter the other if necessary continues blazing the track the route through the gorge had to rise some seven or eight hundred feet before we could begin to edge down again to the river at one point the track followed the brink of the rocky cliff for fifty yards or more and from here the precipice fell away sheer into the river for five hundred feet while the opposite or eastern side was almost as precipitous away below was the river looking like a small stream now diving under and now foaming over immense boulders while above and around us there were towering hills covered with snow to within a thousand feet of where we stood opposite us was the deep gorged valley of mcbain's creek at the head of which mount tasman's ice-clad summit was just visible behind the deep valley the lower portion clothed with luxuriant bush could be seen to the inflow of the balfour river while craig's range and peak rose abruptly in the background looking very fine in its coating of autumn snow two hundred feet or so above this we were able to begin edging down and after crossing two large creeks which fell in fine cascades over large boulders we descended rapidly to the river wending our way down a very steep hillside with great erratic blocks scattered on all sides it is wonderful that some of these stones do not roll over into the river below so precarious do their positions appear on reaching the river we were dismayed at the task before us it is hardly too much to say that here we found no small boulders at all they were all of immense size and completely filled the bottom of the valley the river in places disappearing underneath them in the middle of the stream was one we named the egg cup rock a large boulder some forty feet high and one hundred and fifty feet round estimated had a hollow on one side of it like an armchair in which rested an egg-shaped stone about fifteen feet long and perfectly loose evidently left by a flood it must not be supposed that a stone of this size is too large for a flood to move during the great storm in february there was as already described a high flood on the Callery River. After the flood went down, there could be seen a large flat-shaped boulder of some fifteen feet square, by six or seven feet thick, which had been moved from its old position in the middle of the river, and was lying on its side on some other stones, quite ten feet above, and some thirty yards from its original place. The probability is that during a flood a large amount of debris fills the bed of the rivers, owing to a slip in the valley above, and the boulder is rolled along on the top of the false bed and then the debris is scoured out again, leaving it high and dry. Whatever the means by which these large stones are moved, I feel confident that anyone who has seen a Westland River in an old man flood would credit the actual upheaval of, of any sized boulder. The power, force, and rapidity of the stream is simply appalling, and even the oldest west coaster will watch the mad career of the river bringing down large trees, and listen to the boulders pounding and thumping along the bottom as it was after midday and beginning to rain again we left the load we had brought up under a stone and made our way back over the bluff to our camp some idea of this kind of work may be gained from our experience for the next three days as the weather looked settled and in order to lighten our loads we had taken most of our stores ahead leaving one day's food with the instruments etc in camp expecting to be able to rejoin the stores again next day heavy rain however set in and flooded everything so we were cut off from supplies ahead and had no chance of returning down the river expecting fine weather next day we finished the remainder of the meat that evening and consequently had two days in camp 
with only a very limited amount of flour and rice. The remainder of our stores, namely flour, rice, oatmeal, suet, and cocoa, was above the gorge. On the evening of the second day, we had finished the tuckering camp, having made the one day's food last two days. Therefore, we were very thankful to find the sun shining next morning. Having to some extent dried our things to avoid the extra weight of carrying wet canvas, we went on through the gorge to our other load, intending to have a good meal before going any further. But as soon as we arrived, more rain set in. So, in spite of the fact that we had had nothing to eat since the previous evening, we at once began to make a shelter. After some fossicking and a good deal of talk, we found a suitable place under a large stone, which, overhanging a little, sheltered a ledge of some six feet broad by twenty feet long. Below this shelf there was a perpendicular drop of thirty feet, and then a slope to the river. Here we decided to rig our canvas in case the wind changed and drifted the rain under the rock. In camp, I always slept on the side away from the fire, which in this case we made against the rock. Thus I should have no protection against falling over the thirty feet in my sleep, a very uncomfortable proceeding in a sleeping bag. I therefore stipulated for a substantial barrier. We felt a tree above us, intending to roll the trunk down and place it on the outer edge of the shelf. But of course, with the usual cussedness of things, it slid down nearly to the river. Having got it back to a level with the ledge, we proceeded to put it in position, and it just got it fairly straight when one end took charge and fell over the side. A fork at the other end hooked Douglas's leg, nearly carrying him over too, but luckily he grasped a root in the ground and hung there, with the whole weight on his leg. To fasten a rope round and secure the log to relieve him of the strain was the work of a minute, and then we had to struggle with the other end to heave it back into position. In due time, and after much unparliamentary language, we had both ends secured with a rope, and the canvas pitched. All this had to be done in a deluge of rain which, combined with our long fast, did not improve our tempers. On the way up in the morning, we had luckily shot a kaka, which we had prepared and put into the billy to stew as soon as we arrived, having kindled a fire before building our shelter. At four p.m., taking off our wet things, we hung them in front of the fire, and having put our blankets round us until our clothes were dry, we sat down at last to discuss the stew, which by this time was ready. It may be imagined that the billy looked very foolish when we had finished. Hard work and a twenty-four hours fast tend to give a man a good appetite. This camp was no place to stay in if we could find a better, because it was on a very steep hillside, and there were many loose boulders lying about, which showed that falling stones or slips had to be feared in wet weather. It is never quite safe to camp on a steep sidling in heavy rain, for in Westland large landslips are common in the ranges during or after a storm. Consequently, we left early next morning, and in three hours had succeeded in advancing about three-quarters of a mile further up the river. Here we found a large boulder forming, with two others, a fair cave, which we soon turned into an excellent shelter, and spent several days in perfect comfort. This three hours was, I think, about the hardest bit of travelling we had, and as we toiled along, now crawling, now climbing, under and over the great boulders, I could not help comparing our progress to that of two ants crossing a newly metalled road. The difficulties in our path proved too much on several occasions for poor Betsy, who had to be hoisted about in the most rough and ready manner. Fortunately, our loads got lighter by a pound or so every day, so we knew that, on having to face this part of the river again, our burdens would be considerably lighter. Considering the contents of the swags we carried, and the usage they received up this river, it is wonderful that so little damage was done. There were fifteen pounds weight of instruments, photographic material, and field books in each load, before any things in the shape of camp or stores were added. And as these have to be rolled in a blanket and a piece of canvas, with a lot of mixed articles, it would not be surprising if damage ensued from the hauling and dumping they received over the large stones, which were too slippery to negotiate under a handicap of sixty pounds. But I do not remember having an instrument, camera, or plates damaged once during the season, in spite of rough usage, damp, fire, or floods, with the exception, by the way, of half a dozen glass plates broken before exposure, and four half plates after. The latter, however, were probably damaged in the pack horse mail up the coast. 
The cave camp, though airy, was very comfortable. It had, like our usual shelters, a roof and two walls, but there was only room to sit and lie down. It was a foot too low to allow one to stand up. The weather was now becoming very wintry and cold. Snow fell two or three times, but did not lie permanently within three hundred feet of the cave. Our food, too, was getting monotonous. Flour and rice were all we had, and a very limited amount of each of those, because, having got no birds, on which we always relied, the stores brought up had to bear a double strain, or we had to be satisfied with very small rations. We used often to wish that we could see the picture which would present itself to a man coming up the river. If anyone had by chance followed us, he would have seen a low-roofed cavity under a huge boulder in which sat two ragged men on a log in front of a large fire, and a hungry-looking dog lying close by. The men would be of doubtful nationality, having long, unkempt hair and beards, and with skins as brown as a penny. In all probability their clothes would be hanging at the side of the fire drying, and they would be sitting, with their blankets wrapped round them, smoking their pipes, and possibly playing a game of cribbage, with a pocket-book marked out as a board, or perhaps both would be reading, one lying down on the dry scrub, which served as bedding, and the other sitting up. Periodically the dog would get up and, stretching herself, would put on a piteous blind man's dog look in hopes of coaxing a little something to eat, but without success. A picture of this kind appears dismal, and I suppose the reality was about as depressing as one could imagine. The hours would drag slowly along because we could only afford two small doughboys or suet dumplings for each meal and only two meals a day. The weather was too bad to allow us to work, and it seemed little use looking at the aneroid barometer, which, however, we did constantly, in hopes that it would rise, but even the barometer seemed to have very little effect on the weather. Wet days with plenty of food are not unpleasant, as we could spend considerable time in cooking an elaborate, question mark, meal, but when hungry and with nothing to cook, it is painfully dreary. After consulting our watches periodically during the day, one of us would exclaim, "'By Jove! It's six o'clock at last. Let's sling the billy. Right you are. What are we going to eat? I vote for grilled chops, some bread and cheese, and a long beer. Oh, I'm tired of chops. Let's have some steak and kidney pie, and a Welsh rarebit to follow. The steak is too tough. What do you say to deviled kidneys? They give me indigestion. Well, then, goose and applesauce. I'm sick of geese. You're so confoundedly particular. Shall we have some doughboys? Good idea. Let us have a doughboy for a change. Now, we had been eating doughboys for breakfast and doughboys for tea for some days, and even then, only one doughboy the size of a man's fist. But such is the depressing effect of wet weather and short rations that we were really amused at our little joke, and probably repeated it again next morning. I recollect one evening when very hungry, telling Douglas of the winter dinner of the Alpine Club in London, at which I was in 1892, and we both felt quite cheerful after thinking of so many good things. In the evening we generally had a game or two of cribbage, discussed various items of news, three or four days old, which we had just gleaned from the papers, and at soon after eight o'clock boiled the billy again and made a small drink of cocoa. At nine p.m., having made up a large fire, we rolled into our respective blankets and dreamed of city banquets and good living until daylight. End of chapter nine. Chapter 10 of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 10 Cook River Concluded and Ancient Glaciers. As soon as possible, we went on, partly by track cutting and partly in the riverbed, amongst the worst boulders we had yet seen. It was not a case of climbing over those stones because that was impossible. We simply had to crawl and squeeze in and out amongst them until we could find a place to leave the river and get onto the hillside where we blazed a track. This was rendered necessary because the boulders were practically impassable for half a mile. In three and a half hours, when we had gone perhaps a mile, certainly not much more, we came to the largest boulder in the river. This is named Tony's Rock and must have come down on an ancient glacier from a mile and a half to two miles up the valley. It is not the same formation as that of Ryan's Peak, under which it lies. Behind it, on the slope, 
and leaning against it are several other giant stones, but not nearly so large. Above it, the riverbed is easier and more open, only a few large boulders appearing. The dimensions of Tony's Rock are height, 156 feet, aneroid, circumference, 843 feet. We were unable to measure more than the three sides of the stone, as the fourth had other stones heaped against it. However, we agreed at the time that the figure quoted was not over the mark, as the three sides alone exceeded 700 feet. I do not know the dimensions of known erratic blocks in other parts of the world, so cannot say how this compares with them. Douglas states that he measured one in the Waipara, a branch of the Arawata River, behind Jackson's Bay, and it showed slightly over 200 feet in height, with a girdle a trifle under 1,000 feet. In that locality there are several nearly as large, and one, which he could not measure, perhaps a little larger. Of these, however, I cannot speak from personal observation. The boulders in Cook River between Castle Rock and Tony's Rock are only approached by some in the Copeland River below Welcome Flat, for number and size. As the lower side of Tony's apparently gave capital shelter, we decided to move our quarters at once, but before reaching cave camp again, more rain set in, so we stayed there for the night. Next morning was cold and wet, snow falling at the cave, but at noon we packed our loads, and during a lull in the storm made for Tony's Rock. Before reaching it, however, another snowstorm came on, and making the bush cold and wet drenched us and our loads very quickly. A short distance below Tony's Rock, the whole river goes over a fine fall of some fifty feet in height, caused by two large boulders obstructing its course. In the middle of the narrow channel, a knob of rock, not unlike a camel's head, makes the water rise in a wave six or eight feet high, and spread out in a fan-shaped mass of foam. Behind this fall, I believe one could walk and cross the riverbed dry shod, for it shoots out a considerable distance. The effect is very striking, as the river is by no means a small one, and in summer it would be even finer, for there would be a larger volume of water. The difficulty of obtaining a photograph of this fall afforded a good example of the size of the boulders. Hearing the roar of the water when cutting the track, we climbed a tree to look ahead, and saw the fall some two hundred yards or more further up the river. We therefore went to the edge of the bush, and found that, in order to get a good view, the camera should be out in the open. It was by no means easy to get down again into the river from the bank, which was formed of a series of large stones, against which the debris from the hillside has been heaped up. Determined, however, to get my photograph, I slid down the smooth surface of one of the rocks, and landed safely on to the top of another, some twenty-five feet below, and was even then thirty feet above the water, on a flat boulder, off which I could not get, for it was standing in the river separated from the others, except on the side I had come down. Having taken the photograph, it was impossible to climb back, without help, up the smooth face down which I had come, and as we had left the rope at the cave, Douglas had to go back into the scrub to look for a pole, which was not easy to find owing to the vegetation, being gnarled and twisted at this altitude. However, he found one, which was just long enough for me to catch hold of, and having passed up my boots and camera, I was able with bare feet and help from Douglas to scramble to the top again. There is nothing exciting about this incident, but it helps to some extent to show how large the stones were. Just before reaching Tony's Rock, Betsy caught us the second bird we had found since leaving Castle Rock a week before. It was a decided curiosity in the shape of a white kiwi, and no doubt its skin would be valuable, but as usual, hunger for meat overcame scientific ardor, so we made it into stew. The skin is the most nutritious part of a kiwi, therefore we could not afford to keep it for stuffing. Heavy snow fell again in the night, covering the ground round our shelter, which was some three thousand feet above sea level, and to our disgust we found that this palatial residence was a fraud for the water trickled down on the inside and wetted us wherever we tried to sleep i have always noticed that whenever there is a leak in canvas or rock it always happens to occur exactly above one's face the night was bitterly cold as we had left our canvas at a lower camp and the shelter under tony's rock was so large that it was practically the same as sleeping in the open we had not even our roof and two walls the morning broke clear and frosty but snow was lying a foot or more deep all around, and instead of melting, would in all probability lie in for the rest of the winter, gradually increasing in depth, until the valley would be entirely blocked. 
it is hard to credit the amount of snow which collects in these narrow valleys in winter. Some must have two hundred or three hundred feet piled up in them during a bad winter by the heavy storms and frequent avalanches. More snow falls in the winter in New Zealand Alps than most persons would imagine, considering the temperate latitude, and in the spring it melts with great rapidity, causing heavy floods in the rivers. As our stock of provisions was now nearly finished, we decided to push up the river for one day, lay off the head of the valley hastily, and retreat before more bad weather delayed us indefinitely. Following the valley for some little distance, we turned up a creek off Ryan's Range on the right, and after a great deal of wading and pounding through soft snow and snow-covered scrub, reached a point from which we could complete the map of the valley. The snout of the La Perouse Glacier lay below us, a mile to two miles further up the valley, and the river flowed over a bed of smaller stones, which were easy to travel on until Tony's Rock was reached, after which it begins a rapid descent through the boulder-filled valley up which we came. Such a large basin at the head is unexpected, and like the Balfour Valley, is a great deal wider than we had anticipated. This is owing to the very precipitous nature of the Balfour and Copeland Ranges, between which the river flows. Above Tony's Rock, the valley turns with a wide sweep to the left, and opens out on the south bank, while on the northern side the Balfour Range continues steeper than before. From the glacier to the bend in the river, the south bank slopes back more or less gently for perhaps half a mile, showing three or four old moraine terraces covered with low, dense mountain scrub. Behind these slopes, Mount Copeland and Little's Peak rise abruptly in immense precipices of two or three thousand feet. Mount Stokes, La Perouse, and Hicks apparently block the head of the valley, while Mount Cook shows over Harper's Saddle. The La Perouse Glacier, however, comes off the main range between Mount Tasman and Dampier, the upper portion lying away to the left, round another bend, only the snout and lower portion of the glacier being visible until a higher point on Ryan's range is reached. As seen in May 1894, the picture describes description. The valley was blocked with snow to the water's edge, the river looking like a black ribbon in the white snow, as it flowed down the valley in graceful curves. The giant cliffs of Copeland and Little's Peak were white from base to summit, the snow having been blown against the steep faces and frozen by the cold wind and frost of the night, formed glistening icicles. At first there was little black rock to relieve the dazzling whiteness of the landscape, but after the sun had been up some hours, the precipices began to shed their white mantle, and the steep buttresses and couloirs began to show their shapes and forms. Now and then the stillness, which was almost oppressive, was broken by a slight hissing noise, which gradually increased into a roar, as a great avalanche poured down over cliffs of Little's or Ryan's Peak. One descended within three hundred yards of us, bounding over a sheer drop of seven hundred feet or more, like a great waterfall about fifty yards broad, and lasting for two or three minutes. Our clothes had become very tattered and worn, owing to the rough usage coming up the river, and afforded us very little warmth. Consequently, the morning's work, wading through snow and bruising under and over snow-covered scrub had chilled us to the bone. Yet when we had finished our observations, we were loth to leave such a glorious view, in spite of the cold and hunger. I have often wondered what we should have thought of that scene, if we had been warmly clad and well fed, because my experience is that discomfort spoils the enjoyments of a view to some extent, and if we admired the head of Cook River, as we saw it in our somewhat wretched condition, how much more beautiful would it have appeared under pleasanter circumstances. Down the valley to the north, we could see a bank of angry-looking clouds rolling in from the sea, and already settling down over Craig's range, so we dared not stay any longer, in case another storm prevented our getting down the river. Therefore, hurrying back to Tony's Rock, we packed our loads without delay, and made for the cave, which we reached about sunset. Here a good fire and an extra doughboy each, including Betsy, soon made us forget the discomfort of a day's work in soft snow and ragged garments. On the way down we saw a cuckoo, and his usual companion the check-shirt bird. It is not customary to find these birds in the mountains during the early winter, as they generally migrate to warmer latitudes at the end of the summer and return in the spring. The former is the Maori Koikwa, Eudinimus tetensis, and like his English namesake, he makes use of other birds' nests. The check shirt follows him in his migrations, and is often seen with him in the lower hills. I heard a curious story connected with this little wanderer, told by a friend of mine in a digger's hut. 
He said that sailors believe these birds to represent the spirits of drowned men, and that it is therefore unlucky to kill them. On one occasion he was down south, below Gillespie's, and with five others was trying to shoot a check shirt bird close to the hut of another digger, whom I shall call Mac. Old Mac came out to where they were shooting and begged them to desist, for it was bad luck, he said, and meant a violent end to those concerned in the death of the bird. Of course, his hearers laughed at the idea, but he was very earnest, and said he would give them evidence of the truth of his statement. Taking them into his hut, he related his own life's history. He was one of a party of Newfoundland fishermen, who left their homes in a ship built by themselves for Australia in the early days of the gold diggings. When a few days away from land, they discovered that, though all were sailors, they knew nothing about navigation. Consequently, the ship drifted about aimlessly for weeks. In the course of time, they fell in with a man of war, and discovered that, instead of being near the Cape of Good Hope, they were off the horn. The commander of the warship put a man on board, with a knowledge of navigation, and he piloted the unfortunate ship to Adelaide, from whence they all went to the gold fields. Mac had no luck, so he shipped on board a trading schooner to the islands, and all went well till some man was fool enough to kill a check shirt bird. From that day their luck changed, and ultimately they lost the schooner in a gale. Five or six men succeeded in getting away in an open boat, and were afloat for many days. The boat was picked up by a steamer near Auckland, and in it were four dead bodies and a living skeleton, almost a maniac from his fearful sufferings. This was old Mac. It was a long time before he recovered and was able to go down to Westland to try his luck again on a goldfield. My informant assured me that the manner in which the old fellow related his tale and the power with which he described his awful time in the boat with the dead bodies, too weak to throw them overboard, exceeded anything he had ever read. Mac ended his yarn by saying, Anyway, you can't kill them with shot. You must use silver. Out of consideration for the old sailor's feelings, my friend took no further part in the proceedings, but he remembers as he went away, seeing a man cutting up a half-crown. Whether they killed the bird or not, he never heard. All he can say is that three out of the five died violent deaths, and as the others have gone away, he cannot say what became of them. As he said, it is one of those curious coincidences which tend to strengthen people's belief in superstitions. One long day from the cave camp took us to the diggers' huts, where one of our friends insisted on our staying, and we enjoyed a good meal for the first time for ten days. But as he was short of meat, we pushed on next morning to Ryan's hut, to find it empty and nothing to eat, only one or two rotten potatoes. These were naturally hardly good enough. Therefore, on the following day, we started breakfastless to Mr. Wilson's survey camp at Cook River Settlement, seven miles away over the flats. Here Bill Boyd, the cook, with the help of mutton, vegetables, and plum duff, soon persuaded us that life was, after all, worth living. It may perhaps be thought that we only had ourselves to blame for short rations and starvation on this trip, but I think it was our misfortune, not our fault. In the first place, the valley was unexplored, and we had every right to look forward to as many birds as we had need of for food, and as we always rely greatly on these, we only took enough food to last us for the trip, with help of birds. Again, we did not anticipate more than ten days' work at the most, so we took flour, rice, oatmeal, tea, cocoa, sugar, a little meat, treacle, suet, for cooking dough boys, and a tin or two of sardines in sufficient quantity, plus birds, to last us for that period. Had we found birds, as we reasonably anticipated, the provisions we took would with care have lasted more than two weeks, and even if they were exhausted, we could have lived well with the help of the pea rifle. The luck was against us in every respect. For the first three or four days we had meat, and went on eating as if there was no need to economize. By that time we had gone some way up the river, and the bad weather not only prevented a retreat, but delayed our advance. Consequently, having only caught the kiwi and kaka, we had to live for ten days relying entirely on the stores which were left, and which, owing to delays, would only keep us reasonably if we had found plenty of game. To give some idea of the help that we derive from birds, I may safely say that stores, which would usually last for ten days comfortably, would only give perhaps three days of good meals in the event of finding no birds. 
it is no joke to be compelled to divide six good meals, consisting of flour and rice, into rations to extend over ten days, and at the same time do a considerable amount of heavy work. The less said about our clothes, the better. After a long season of eight months in the ranges, the constant wet, rough usage in bush and scrub, etc., soon made havoc of the best materials. The only original garment of mine now in existence is a coat of Burberry's gabardine, which lasted me without tearing for the whole of this season and the next, and is now gracing the back of a digger down south, and he still swears by it. Some valleys are so narrow that, if they run east and west, there are places in them which never get the sun, winter or summer. Here the bush, which grows just as luxuriantly, is always wet, and if we are above bush line, snow or creeks wet us daily. Ordinary tweeds, therefore, become rotten, and are easily torn. I find the best costume to be a flannel shirt, woolen jersey, and thick knitted woolen drawers, without trousers, and some spare canvas to patch with. It is absolutely necessary to wear flannel or wool next to the skin, owing to the constant wet, and woolen garments underneath trousers are too hot for my comfort, so I generally dispense with the latter. After a few months, one may be said to be wearing a number of patches, connected together by woolen material. After leaving Cook River, I decided to go north to Hokitika, as winter would prevent further work, and there were two hundred or more photographs to develop and print, also sundry work to be done in the office to complete the field work. Accordingly, having spent a few days in photographing the wondrous panoramas and other views from the flats and sea bluffs, I tramped with my goods and chattels some thirty miles along the beach to Okarito. Here I obtained a horse from the mailman, and in three days arrived at Hokitika, after a spell of nearly eight months in a batwing, six of which were spent in the ranges, chiefly on new ground. Our work up Cook River finally settled a doubtful point in the topography of the district, namely the course of the Balfour Range. When in 1890 Blackiston and I made the first ascent of Harper's Saddle at the head of the Hooker Glacier, we were unable, owing to the fog, to see clearly down to the west coast. On our return, I was asked by the Westland Survey Department, firstly, what was the true course of the divide? Secondly, was the Balfour Range an offshoot of Hicks, St. David's Dome, or Tasman? The first question I answered without hesitation, but the second had to be left for future solution. On looking at the map made from distant trigonometrical stations, I was inclined to believe that there was an error and the Balfour Glacier and Range, because, if the latter was an offshoot of the divide near Tasman, it left such a ridiculously small neve for the glacier, which was shown to be four or five miles long. The La Perouse Glacier had been put in by guesswork, and it was more than probable that it was shown far too large, and that its upper basin really belonged to the Balfour Glacier. This would mean that the Balfour Range was an offshoot of Mount Hicks, and not of Tasman, or possibly might be a detached range. In the event of the latter being the case, the large neve alluded to would supply both glaciers. However, up Cook River and from Ryan's Peak later on, the truth was evident, and it is now finally settled that the Balfour Range comes off the divide just south of Mount Tasman. Also, the La Perouse is a large glacier, as shown on the map, and nearly clear of surface moraine. The glacier is nearly five miles long and descends by a fine ice fall from its neve, flowing in graceful curves between high precipices, with one or two tributaries from the east. It has but little surface moraine as compared with other New Zealand glaciers, having only a fringe of debris on each side, and being completely covered near its terminal face. About a quarter of its length from the snout, a peculiar bar of moraine running across it from side to side, looks as if a large slip had come down and shot right across the ice. The course of the Balfour Range having been settled, it only remains to find some reason for so large a glacier as the Balfour, which is six miles long, flowing from such an insignificant neve. I have already described this glacier with its neve detached from its trunk. The only available theory, so far as I can see, is that the great western face of Tasman, which rises abruptly in precipices for over 7,000 feet from the glacier, is too steep to hold much snow. It faces southwest, the cold quarter, and must catch an immense quantity of snow in the winter, which comes down frequently in large avalanches, filling the upper end of the valley and forming the trunk of the glacier. 
There are also, no doubt, avalanches from Craig's Range on the northern side of the glacier, and these bring down masses of debris and broken rock, which completely cover the ice and, to a large extent, protect it from the sun's heat. The steep ranges surrounding the valley must also prevent the sun from reaching the glacier in the winter, and also part of the day in the summer. When Douglas explored the left-hand branch of the Copeland River, a tributary of the Karangarua, in 1892, he noticed that, though Mount Stokes apparently dropped without interruption to the Strontian Glacier, the avalanches from the peak never reached the bottom, but appeared to be swallowed up halfway down the slope. This led him to expect one of those peculiar instances of the broken nature of the ranges in the form of a large fissure in the mountainside, or a narrow deep gorge with an outlet into Cook River. We were therefore looking out for such a cleft, when at the head of the river, and found that his suspicions were correct, for a narrow and dark gorge comes into the valley, evidently containing a small glacier formed by avalanches. There was too much snow to see whether a glacier really existed, but we decided that there was a small one. The stream from it flows into Cook River, a short distance below the La Perouse Glacier. The Cook River glaciers were evidently, in the past, of considerable size, to judge by the numerous moraines and terraces in the upper and lower parts of the valleys. The stream of ice which came down the main valley was probably the largest, and its marks are to be seen on the lower end of the Balfour Range, a considerable height above the river. On the slopes under Ryan's Peak, the erratic blocks scattered on the hillside show that the ice must have been 700 feet thick, at the least below Tony's Rock. After forcing its way down the valley of the Cook River, it would be joined by a stream of ice which came down the Valfour Valley from Mount Tasman of the day. Between McBain's Creek and the Balfour River is a rounded hill which has evidently been shaped by glacier action and must at one period have been completely covered with ice. Behind this hill to the east is a low, flat depression showing that the ice, after shrinking somewhat, had still found its way into the main glacier down McBain's Creek as well as the Balfour Gorge, and on shrinking still further, it had ceased to flow down the creek, and only found one outlet through the gorge of the present river. After being augmented by this ice stream, and a smaller one from Craig's Range, the glacier would flow down to the flat country, probably joining the ice from the Fox Valley and from the south. There is little doubt, from Douglas's observations in the many rivers he has explored, that the general direction of the ancient ice flow was north. My own observations, small though they are in comparison with his, tend to support his theory. In the south there is, perhaps, as fine an ancient moraine as anywhere in Westland, namely the Cascade Moraine, which begins at 200 feet and goes back gradually rising to 1,900 feet in height. Formerly, it projected four miles out to sea to Open Bay Island, which has some moraine debris on it. In this moraine, Douglas, who explored that country some years ago, found several red stones which had come north from the Red Hill country. In no case has he discovered any red rocks lying south of that country, but always north. An interesting feature about the Cascade Moraine, from a geologist's point of view, is that it is stratified, and in some of the layers seashells are to be found well inland. Other evidences of the northern flow of the ice is to be found in the old Wanganui and Hokitika glaciers. In the two rivers of these names there are belts of serpentine rock, pieces and blocks of which Douglas has found north of these rivers, but never south. In the Waitaha River, for instance, he found several proofs that an ancient glacier came over from the Wanganui country to that valley, carrying with it blocks of serpentine rock. The moranic drift of the ancient Franz Joseph and Callery glaciers is to the north, round Lake Maparika, and could be traced even further than that, and the greatest mass of drift near Cook River lies to the north, and if this theory of the ice flow is correct, it would belong to the old glacier. The whole of the low country is covered with moranic hills and terraces of various heights, up to 300 or 400 feet. At intervals along the sea beaches, these terraces form the bluffs already mentioned. It has been assumed from past observations made in the low country only that the old glaciers flow direct to the sea between these high terraces. This, however, I venture to think is the wrong view to take. My belief is that the ancient glaciers, being some 600 feet thick at the point they left the valleys, would spread out over an immense area when the lateral pressure of the hillsides was removed. Probably at one time they joined and formed a vast sea of ice at the foot of the hills, 
covered with a heavy mass of moraine, caused by constant denudation in the mountains. When the period of retreat began, they separated again, and gradually retired up the valleys, leaving a confusion of moraine hillocks all over the lower country. This vast accumulation of moranic drift would be gradually cut through by the rivers, thus forming the high terraces now seen along the river sides, and which have hitherto been taken for lateral moraines. If the theory here advanced be correct, then the terraces would not necessarily be either terminal or lateral moraines, but merely accidental embankments, carved into their present shape by the rivers. Should, however, the theory that they are lateral moraines be the right one, then I am at a loss to understand what caused the vast collection of moranic deposits between the rivers and in places along the foot of the hills where no valleys exist. It seems that those accumulation of drift hills lying north of the Waiho River and also north of Cook River must have been left by the great ice flow extending all over the low country, and had it not been for the rivers of a later date cutting broad valleys to the sea, they would have extended over the whole coast in hopeless confusion, and no long terraces would have existed at all. From the Taramakau River to Bruce Bay, twenty miles south of Gillespie's, the rivers have cut through old moranic accumulations, which extend from the hills in many cases to the present sea beach, and from Bruce Bay to Jackson's Bay, the sea bluffs are rocky, and the old moraines do not appear again till after the latter place is passed. There has been in the past a considerable amount of gold brought out of Cook River, but at the present time two or three diggers only make a small living, just above the point where the river leaves the hills. Traces or colors of gold have been found a considerable distance up the main branch, but not payable. And in the Balfour gold was obtained in the sixties, which paid well, I believe, at the junction of the two rivers, and was traced right up to the glacier. Harry the Whale and Dick Nicholl, two old fossickers, are said to have discovered the Balfour Glacier in 1866, but it is quite useless to consider the journeys made by diggers, for they never bring out any information that is reliable. How far up Cook River they went, it is hard to say, though a tradition exists of Harry the Whale, German Harry, and Tony the Greek, having gone up some miles and crossed the Copeland Range into Architect Creek, which flows into the Copeland River. The enterprising old school of diggers and prospectors is fast dying out, but Paddy McKenna, an old man, now and then makes solitary trips up the Balfour, where he is commonly supposed to have located a gold-bearing reef. It is sad to see these old-time prospectors disappearing, and no one to take their places. The younger generation on the West Coast have a strong dislike, I may say fear, not only of the hard work and life entailed by journeys into the ranges, but also have a rooted objection to going off the beaten track. They are good enough men on horses after cattle near their huts, but neither love nor money will tempt them to go far afield. End of chapter 10「Eleven of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Eleven The Franz Joseph Glacier. Second Visit Winter Snow. Successful Ascent to Neve. Ice Formation. Moraine Formation. Old Moraines and Glaciers. Advance and Retreat. June, July, and August, being our winter months, it was useless to attempt any hill work. Therefore, after six weeks' office work in Hokitika, I returned to Christchurch for a few weeks' holiday. Unlimited golf and sundry expeditions of my lantern slides before the New Zealand Alpine Club and other institutions made the time pass quickly, and before I had well shaken down to civilized life, it was time to return. From our work on the Franz Joseph Glacier during the previous summer, it was evident that early spring was the best season for attacking the icefall and upper ice. I therefore obtained permission to try and reach the Neve in September, and at the same time to make observations as to winter retreat or advance, and generally supplement the former report. On September 13, 1894, I arrived at the Forks, and after some difficulty obtained a man to accompany me to the glacier. The mere mention of going on to the glacier frightened most of the young fellows in the district. However, one of them joined me, in spite of warnings from his mates, prepared to face all sorts of unknown evils. 
Friday, September 14th. We pitched the bat wing in the same place as last year at Camp 1, and had everything ready by 3 p.m. While looking about in the scrub round camp in the evening for a straight pole to use in camp, I found a small case for carrying soap, which I had lost last year. A weka must have taken it away from camp before we left in February. Saturday, September 15th. Grand weather, very cold, even here in the mornings. Made a traverse of the terminal face, which showed general retreat, a new rock appearing by number one Harper's Rock. In the afternoon we fossicked a route over to the north side landing, a little further up than last year, near the first small ice fall, ice very broken and troublesome. Went along the side to Rope Creek, and found the ice so far retreated that we could not get down without a rope. Left a small load here, which we brought along to lighten the weight tomorrow. Hailstorm in the evening. Sunday, September 16th. Moved to Camp 2 in the afternoon with fly only. Raining all the morning and showers during the afternoon. Cold quarters up here, with only one blanket at this time of the year. Rigged up fly in the usual way, with two end windbreaks. Our little female weka of last year still here, and seems very glad to see us. Very tame. Monday, 17th. Tried all the morning to find a route onto the glacier. My mate did not appreciate the pleasures of being let down into a crevasse to cut steps, nor of going along steep sides of the hummocks in small footholds. After three attempts we found a route two hundred yards further up than last season. Not by any means a good one, but safe enough at this time of the year. Went up to Camp 3 to see if we could camp there. Also marked our line with rotted twigs through the extraordinarily crevassed and broken ice below Cape Defiance. Found deep snow on the bank at Camp 3. Should only save an hour and a half by camping there, and should have to break a day if we moved up tomorrow, so returned to Camp 2. Found that the rotted twigs saved about one half of the time taken in going up. The ice here is simply a maze of long ridges, very narrow, between deep crevasses, and in such an uneven fashion that I could not see a route for certain more than one hundred yards ahead. Consequently, we were often forced to retreat our steps, having been blocked. Fixed three measurement cairns between camp and point E, the rocky cape on eastern bank, in the afternoon. Bathed, baked bread, made a stew, changed my plates, and lost my temper in the evening. N.B. I presume the fire smoked when I was baking, but cannot remember. Tuesday, September 18th. Glorious moonlight last night. Up at 2.45 a.m., but did not leave camp till 4 a.m. My mate did not see much catch in getting up so early in the winter and wanted to know, what's the odds of an hour or two? Glacier and ranges looked simply magnificent by moonlight. Could see everything quite clearly. Even on the low country we were able to distinguish some features, and beyond it the sea. Travelled quickly to just below Cape Defiance, when the moon dipped down behind Mount Moltke, leaving us in deep shadow right in the middle of the rough ice. Blundered along slowly, the deep crevasses looking very ghostly, as we crawled along the narrow ridges in the dark. Now and then would see a rotted twig faintly. As dawn came up we got out of the crevassed ice, and were opposite the Unzerfritz waterfall. Had it not been for the rotted twigs, we should have been quite an hour longer in the rough going. Unser Fritz was silent, frozen from top to bottom in one icicle, 1,209 feet in length. The absolute silence of so large a fall was very imposing. We put on the rope halfway up the ice fall, and were opposite Almer Glacier at 8 a.m. and had breakfast. Snow covered everything, but all the seracs were standing just the same, the snow bridges being some 10 or 15 feet below the general level of the glacier. For a few chains above the inflow of the Almer, I thought every moment that we should be stopped, the hummocks and seracs formed a perfect labyrinth, and the crevasses between them were not bridged very strongly. I have never in all my experience seen such a hopeless confusion of broken, crevassed, and generally rough ice. The snow became painfully soft after 10 a.m., but we pounded along, taking turns in the lead. And as we were now high up in the neve, there was little or no chance of going through into crevasses. The snow was so deep. At noon we were well up into the southeastern corner of the head basin, and there I was able to do all that had to be done for the map. The plan which we made the previous summer is practically correct, and only one or two minor corrections to be made. 
we went on a little further to within about a mile and a half, perhaps less, of Graham's saddle to the Tasman. I wanted to go on, and at least, ascend Graham's saddle, but my companion was a firm believer in the eight hours day, and would not consent to more, so I had to suit myself to him, more or less. I told him that now he had done all that was necessary, and anything else we did would be voluntary work for our own amusement, and asked him if he was willing to go over to the Tasman. He was decided in his objections, as he had had enough of this bloomin' work and didn't give a D for the scenery. He was paid for a day's work only, and had done that. I therefore gave up the idea, wondering at such a lack of enthusiasm. We started back at 1 p.m., travelled as fast as the very soft snow would allow to the top of the icefall, and having our tracks to follow, took very little time in passing the Serac ice. I feared that the snow bridges would be weaker, so lengthened the rope to thirty feet, and always kept a hummock of ice between us. This was necessary, for the leader on two occasions crossed a crevasse safely and mounted a hummock, but on going down into the next hollow, to be ready in case the second man broke the bridge, he would go bodily through the snow, and the bridge, which he had safely crossed, would let the second man through. Thus we were both in crevasses with the rope taut over the intervening hummock. To scramble out was no trouble, and beyond confirming my mate in his opinion that he had got into most dangerous company, no harm was done. We reached camp about 5 p.m., very burnt with the new snow, the day having been cloudless throughout. I very much doubt if the snow would last for another two weeks of sufficient strength to allow a route to be found in rough seracs at the top of the ice fall. The neve of the glacier is, roughly, a circular basin of three miles in diameter, and is surrounded by some fine peaks between 9,000 and 10,000 feet. Out of the southern side the peaks of the dividing range rise in pinnacles and knobs of rock out of the sea of ice, affording interesting rock climbs. The first ascents of the peaks from De La Beche, 9,835 feet, to Conway, 9,611 feet, will probably be done from this glacier, as their slopes toward the Tasman are clothed with hanging glaciers, which send down avalanches night and day during the summer. On the southeastern side, the range dividing the Franz Joseph from the watershed of the Callery branches from the minaret, 10,022 feet, and has three nice peaks in St. Mildred's, Drummond's, and Stirling Rock. The two latter are very easy climbs of snow, the former a rock climb entirely. The peaks of the Bismarck Range are, on the whole, disappointing from this side, as they are merely small peaks of rock, standing 500 to 1,000 feet out of a snowfield, which slopes up to them in a series of broken ice falls. In the summer the neve is almost all broken and crevassed. The lower portion, as it approaches the ice fall, is, I feel sure, impassable after Christmas. It is quite bad enough in the early spring. To make a sense of the peaks surrounding the neve, a party must cross from the Tasman via Graham's saddle or from the Fox Glacier. They can try to reach the neve from the terminal face if they wish to, and I hope they will enjoy the experience. Wednesday, September 19th. Note. See Appendix Note 7. End of note. I fixed some measurement cairns along the side below Camp 2, and we returned to Camp 1 in the afternoon. Thursday, September 20th. My horse had gone away down the river, so I tracked and caught him below Nisbet's hut. Returned to the camp in the afternoon and packed the whole of it to the hospital, where I found Arthur Woodham alone. Stayed at the hut. Friday, September 21st. I rode down to Forks and found instructions from Hokitika to go at once to Gillespie's and, with Douglas, explore the Karangarua River. This visit, together with our work in the previous summer, was productive of some interesting facts concerning the movement and general conditions of the Franz Joseph Glacier. In the first place, the ice of the lower portion of the glacier appeared to be very soft and rotten, in comparison to that of other glaciers, a natural consequence of its low altitude. The ice crystals were very large and easily detached and separated from one another. It was very difficult in some places to form a step, as a blow of the axe would scatter the loose crystals in every direction, and sometimes, when a step had been cut, which to all appearance was as strong as necessary, the floor would give way by crumbling under one's weight. In the winter, however, during the last visit, I found it much easier to get about, because the ice was firmer and there was far less likelihood of rapid changes. The constant alteration in the forms and shapes of the crevasses and seracs was in the summer most puzzling, 
and sometimes an absence of a week would be sufficient for the ice to alter to such an extent as to render a new route necessary. This activity is no doubt due as much to low altitude as to the speed with which the glacier descends over its rough bed. It is not noticeable all over the lower portions of the trunk. After an absence of a day or two, we have found new crevasses open, even on the dry ice, and as already stated, we constantly heard reports and felt a slight shock pass, like a tremble over the surface. While sitting in camp, too, we could hear the glacier cracking and groaning on a still night. In fact, one of the first things I noticed on my second visit was the absolute stillness of the nights compared with our summer experience. I have already given some idea of the very broken surface of the glacier, and need only add that I have never seen one with so little good travelling on it. Having had a considerable experience on glaciers, I can generally find a route through rough ice without much loss of time, and certainly never expected to be reduced to leaving a line of marks behind for use on the return journey, as we did here. It was not really necessary, but it saved a lot of time and was very little trouble. The broken surface will account for the absence of large deposits of surface moraine, which might be expected here owing to the broken nature of the hillsides and spurs in the upper part of the valley. Below Point E and Cape Defiance, there is no broken rock at all, save the slip which has recently come down and is the cause of the single patch of surface debris now fast approaching the terminal face. The glacier seems to descend in two, and sometimes three, distinct layers. The upper one is pure white ice, and the lower one's generally dirty. The stones which fall into the crevasses are ground up like grain between two millstones, and wherever it finds an opening between two layers, the silt, resulting from the grinding, oozes out in the form of mud. I have found a hollow under such an outlet full of mud, to a depth of two feet or more. Owing to the nearness of the surrounding trees, there is a large amount of timber in the ice, and lying at the terminal face in the small moraines. Once or twice, while cutting steps near the junction of two layers, my axe struck a piece of wood and stuck fast in it. The timber on the glacier and at the terminal face has a smooth, worn look about it, as if it had been well sandpapered. It is chiefly rata, a very hard wood, and must have undergone a great deal of rubbing and grinding. In some places, the upper section of the ice could be seen standing away from the lower. Half a mile from the terminal face, I saw a space of three inches or more between the two layers, extending back into the ice for some distance, and everywhere on the glacier, if one happened to be cutting a step near the junction, a large piece of ice would break away, leaving a smooth, mud-covered surface at the top of the lower layer. The comparative motion of the ice in a glacier at different depths is little known and could I think be measured at places on the Franz Joseph with little difficulty. I fully intended to do it on my second visit, but had no time. It is here perfectly evident that the surface ice moves far quicker than the lower portion, for the upper layer of white ice can be seen at the terminal face, pushing its way over the lower layer, and periodically breaking off in large pieces. This possibility is due to the rocky obstacles at the terminal face, and underneath the glacier, obstructing the flow of the lower portion, while it does not interfere with the upper. The layers are horizontal in some places, and in others incline slightly against the flow of the ice. One very noticeable result of the large quantity of moraine debris falling into the crevasses and being ground up between the separate layers of ice is that the old terminal moraines are composed of a layer of rolled stones, with angular blocks on the top of them in some places, and in others are almost entirely made up of the former. This is, of course, because other slips have occurred in the past, and covering the glacier have travelled down with the ice. A large proportion of the stones, having dropped into crevasses, come out at the terminal face in a rounded form, while the balance has come down on the surface of the glacier, and been dropped over in an angular form onto the top of the other, thus forming the two sections in the terminal moraines. In some of the sea bluffs, the layers of rolled stones under angular blocks are easily to be seen, where the sea has cut into them and exposed a section of their formation. I have heard many theories put forward to account for this stratified appearance, though it is common in all old moraines. Douglas, in his report on the Franz Joseph, note, New Zealand Lands and Survey Report, 1893-94, to 94, end of note, written after our visit, mentions the process which is evidently going on at present in the glacier, 
and assumes rightly that a similar process went on in ancient times on a larger scale and would account for the formations in the bluffs which are of course old moraines he is inclined to put forward a theory based on that assumption that the old moraines now forming the sea bluffs are not lateral but terminal moraines from what he has told me of his own observations and from like observations in a much smaller degree of my own i agree with him that they are not lateral moraines but i cannot go as far as he does and say that they are therefore terminal there is i imagine no reason why the evidence of stratification should be confined to terminal moraines may it not also exist in lateral moraines when the ice is pushing its way over level country and not between hillsides for it would be depositing rolled stones from its lower portion and dropping them from its upper portion in the form of angular blocks along its sides as well as at its terminal face if this is a sound conclusion then the inland moraine hills which contain the two forms of stones may be either lateral or terminal moraines if the reasoning is not sound then all or nearly all the old moranic deposits must be terminal moraines and that i do not think can be admitted some ideas concerning the ancient glaciers and their deposits were put forward in the last chapter and if they are correct there would be a field of ice extending over almost the whole of the low country fed by the numerous glaciers from the ranges such an ice field before it broke up would not have either lateral or terminal moraines on the flat country for the debris would drop into the sea on one side or form a lateral terrace at the foot of the hills on the other on the period of retreat beginning it would gradually divide itself into separate streams corresponding with the glaciers supplying it and would leave behind it a confused mass of moranic accumulations which could hardly be classed as terminal or lateral moraines until it had almost retired into the hills these would be stratified having layers of glacier drift and angular blocks throughout other glaciers like the tasman balfour etc which are covered with great masses of angular rocks are not sufficiently broken or crevassed to swallow up a great amount of moraine thus the double process does not now go on to such a noticeable extent on these glaciers as on the franz joseph it is only during the next few years that it can be seen on the latter for when the present surface moraine caused by the slip has dropped over the terminal face there will be no more to come down on the surface unless another landslip covers the ice with debris the ancient waiho glacier may or may not have been of first-class importance douglas thinks that it was not because he cannot find any of the higher old ice lines which he has found in other parts in the upper valleys of the karangarua as will be seen later i noted several instances of these old ice lines which appeared in the form of distinct terraces in the rocky hillsides abraded by ancient glaciers douglas's remarks on the subject i quote, quote in valleys containing large glaciers i have always found four tiers of terraces or old ice lines these lines keep a wonderfully regular distance from each other and their inclination is very uniform from say four thousand feet to six hundred feet or seven hundred feet where the river valley breaks out of the hills the longer the valley the more gentle the slope the best places to see these lines are up the host near the eighteen mile bluff and better still the wonderful terraces of mount Cariah, up the arawata river where the old lines can be seen quite distinctly for four thousand feet up and running for miles down the valley in the smaller valleys two or three terraces are visible and in still smaller ones there are none from this i would conclude that the franz joseph although the largest glacier at present was during the great ice period of second or maybe even third rate importance it must have been far eclipsed by cooks and the karangarua end quote note new zealand lands and survey report eighteen ninety three to ninety four page seventy three end of note it is true that in the franz joseph branch of the waiho there are not four ice lines visible like there are in the two last named rivers but i do not think it necessarily proves that this was of second-rate importance the cooks karangarua and host river to my knowledge and the arawata river from douglas's accounts flow through harder and more solid country and therefore would show these old ice lines in a more distinct and lasting form the waiho is shattered country and the lines have probably worn away by the action of the climate and weather generally the enormous moranic accumulations around lake mapurica and even north of that 
point to a glacier of considerable importance. About three miles below the junction of the two branches, or five miles below the terminal face, there is an old terminal moraine almost semicircular, through which the river has cut a channel. This is perhaps a hundred feet high, but we had no time to examine it. Comparatively speaking, this is a recent deposit, but to which of the ice lines at present visible it belongs, I would not pretend to say. At no very remote period, the Waiho River flowed north into Lake Maporica, and it is quite possible that this old moraine divided the river northwards until it was cut through by the water, which again resumed its old course to the sea. While speaking of moraines, it is worth calling attention to the very ridiculous attempts this glacier has made to form lateral moraines. Below point E, the rocky cape on the eastern bank, there is a line of boulders about 200 feet above the ice, which have been left balanced in the most insecure manner on the bare rock slope. Just below camp 2, another small lateral line of stones can be seen in a precarious position. The only real piece of lateral moraine to be found is above Cape Defiance in the bend by Harper's Creek. The ice has flowed down the valley and meets this obstruction, causing it to eddy into the bend and force its way up in great waves against the cape. The likeness of a glacier to a river is here most evident, for the ice has done exactly the same as a river would do in a similar case. Having flowed against the cape, which projects twenty chains across the line of flow, it has banked up behind it, and turned round the rocky point in high pinnacles corresponding to the waves in a river. And whereas a river would, in a similar case, deposit large masses of driftwood on a bank, the glacier has thrown up a high lateral moraine of stones, which have come down in the ice from above the ice fall. It has also caused the debris to come to the surface, and the ice in the bend is covered with stones. The absence of all other lateral moraines is due to the solid rock walls which line the glacier on both sides below Cape Defiance, and which are too steep to allow any stones to rest on them, with the two exceptions mentioned by Camp 2. Also, the broken nature of the glacier has caused all the debris to fall into crevasses, and therefore has left very few, if any, stones for it to deposit on the sides. When Douglas and I were in the valley during our first visit, we concluded from various signs at the terminal face and along the sides, that a winter advance of considerable importance took place annually, followed by a large summer retreat. We had ample evidence of the latter, and my visit in September was made in hopes of finding a decided winter advance. We based our conclusions on the fact that in November 1893, when we arrived at Camp 1, there was a beautiful cone of ice, 110 feet in height, between the Strontian and Muller rocks. This was covered apparently with riverbed shingle, and seemed to be due to a recent advance during the winter. It touched the latter rock along its base to a height of 25 feet. Other evidence was found in the fresh-dressed surfaces, just beyond the edge of the ice, which were of a lighter color than the rock above, and also there were signs of recent disturbances in small terminal moraines. During our stay in the neighborhood, the rapid shrinking, due to the low altitude of the ice, was most marked. The level of the top of the ice at the terminal face fell 70 feet between November 1st and March 1st, by breaking and melting, and the retreat during the same period was considerable. The most noticeable was at the ice cone. This was, at the beginning of November, quite perfect in shape, and in the position already stated. At the end of February, it had lost all shape, and collapsed into a small heap of dirty broken ice, some thirty feet high, besides retreating twenty-two yards in the front, and about ten yards from the rock against which it originally rested. A new rock, which we named the Outlet Rock, was uncovered during February near the outflow of the glacier, to the extent of ten yards. All along the eastern bank a general shrinkage was visible when we left, and as far as we could see on the western side as well. I was not, however, prepared to say that the ice was retreating on the whole, because we fully anticipated that it would recover its lost ground again in the winter, when the melting would not be so great. For behind the sentinel, an ice cone was thrown up considerably in advance of the rest of the glacier, to a height of forty feet, in five weeks, at the end of the summer. This lifted with it riverbed stones, but did not last long, for when we left it had begun to decrease in size again. We made two marks, by means of which a future visitor might test the retreat, 
and I was able to use them again in my second visit, when I also made several more cairns for future use. Instead of the large winter advance which we had anticipated, I found a general and considerable retreat all over the glacier, with the single exception of a slight advance between the barren and Strauchon rocks. The ice behind the Sentinel had, in February 1894, been 120 leagues distant from the rock, and in September of the same year had retired to a distance of 225 links, or a retreat of 1.05 chains. Between Harper and Park rocks, a new rock appeared, which, however, may be part of the former. It was buried in the ice and raked by pieces falling from above. Where the ice cone had stood, there was a further retreat of about three chains, and at the outflow, the outlet rock was exposed for one chain, or fifty links more, than in February. On reaching the eastern bank on the route to Camp 2, the general shrinkage was most noticeable. Just below the point at which we left the ice was a creek we named Arch Creek. It descended into a deep gorge, with a rock wall of two hundred feet on the northern bank, and perhaps one hundred feet on the southern. In the mouth of this there was a large isolated rock, the Eye Tooth, estimated 120 feet in height. The ice which flowed past the end of the gorge was pressing against the outer side of the rock, and in November 1893 was almost on a level with the top. On our second visit it proved to have retreated on the south bank of the creek for 40 feet, and continuing along the glacier up the valley there was a general shrinkage of 10 or 15 feet, while below camp two large holes appeared in the ice showing the rock and indicating a still further retreat in the future. On crossing over to Camp 3 at Cape Defiance, we found that though the ice had pushed its way a little further into the mouth of the creek, yet it was not banked up so high as formerly at the Cape itself. When pitching Camp 3 the previous summer, it will perhaps be remembered, we built a flat platform of large stones in the bottom of the V-shaped valley formed by the moraine and hillside. This was still there, but the ice having retired and caused a subsidence of the lateral moraine, the platform had fallen over, or capsized, without breaking, towards the ice, and instead of being level was now lying at an angle of twenty degrees. Opposite Cape Defiance, above point E, the ice had banked up higher at another rocky point, but the gain there did not exceed the loss at the Cape. This may perhaps be merely a temporary upheaval, and in the course of a few months the pendulum may swing again, and the ice rise at the cape, and fall on the other side. It may only be due to the oscillation or lurching of the glacier in its downward path. The temporary advance behind the sentinel, observed in February, followed by retreat, and the retreat by the barren rock, followed by advance in the winter, may also be due to the same cause. Though all this had taken place in one winter, it is possible that the glacier is only passing through a temporary period of retreat, and that a great part of it is due to a mild season and heavy floods, causing large pieces to break off frequently. If the ice recedes at the same rate every year, the glacier will, in a comparatively short time, become of second-rate importance. I anticipate from the manner in which the Fox Glacier is holding its own, that though no future advance will recover the ground lost by present retreat, yet it will to some extent repair the damage, or at least remain stationary but it is evident that this glacier is slowly but surely losing ground. There are many interesting problems to solve in this valley, but they would require considerable attention during prolonged and frequent visits. It is little use for a man to go there in the way I have been. He must have leisure and be able to afford good instruments and plenty of time. Here he would have a glacier at an exceptionally low altitude, obviously flowing at great speed over rocky obstacles, giving good opportunities of solving some of the most interesting questions of glacier motion, such as the comparative rate of the surface and lower ice, its effects on rocks, and the variation in position of the great waves or undulations on the glacier. The speed at which this vast body of ice flows would give more pronounced and satisfactory results than could be obtained on one of the slow-moving glaciers of other districts. There are also many questions as to the position and extent of the ancient glaciers to be determined, or at least, the solution is to be looked for in the old moraine hills on the flats, and in the old ice lines in the valleys. The fact of there being four different ice lines or terraces shows, I presume, that the old glaciers had four separate periods of rest, and possibly advance, during their general retreat. 
how long these various periods were, and the distances between them, have to be discovered, and the Franz Joseph or Fox Glacier may offer evidence on these points to anyone who is competent to collect and apply it. The terraces of bare ice-worn rock without vegetation, followed by another with vegetation of a certain age, and yet another with trees of greater age, may go far to help in the solution. I shall always regret that I have not the means at my command to enable me to make a collection of data on the subject of the great ancient glaciers. The answer to these problems is not to be found only in the low country, but in remote valleys to which as yet no one but Douglas and I have been, and the most interesting one of all, namely, the valley which gives the key to the old glacier which formed the Cascade Moraine, was explored by Douglas and since then only visited by prospectors. End of chapter 11「Twelve of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 12. Karangarua River. With Douglas again. Topography. Futa Camp. Floods. Castles Flat. Bark Camp. Twain Gorge. Alone. Regina Creek. On September 23rd, Mr. Ned Gibb, who has a store on the Waikukupa River, came up to the Waiho on a visit to the diggers, and I returned with him. We had a long talk about golf, for he was a caddy at St. Andrews before he came to New Zealand, and hadn't had a good pitch about the old game for nearly thirty years. After staying a night at his house on the beach, I continued my journey to Gillespie's on my horse, with my goods and chattels in two saddlebags strapped one on each side. When a few miles from Gillespie's, I discovered that one of my rolls had fallen off, so started back at a gallop to pick it up, because I had been riding close to the surf on the hard sand, and was afraid that it would have gone out to sea. After going about a quarter of a mile, I saw it floating fifty yards out, beyond the first line of breakers, and traveling up the coast with a strong current, which sets up the beach, while the tide is going out. Before I could go in after it, the bag sank, and I had to sorrowfully jog on to Gillespie's without it. A week later, the mailman, coming down the beach, picked up the contents at various places, scattered over the sand some miles north of where I dropped it. As generally happens on these occasions, the most precious things were lost, namely, two pounds of boot nails, tobacco seven pounds, and two dozen quarter plates exposed on the Franz Joseph Glacier. On reaching Gillespie's, I found a note from Douglas to say that he was at Mr. Scott's farm on the Karangarua River Flats. I therefore went on, crossing Cook River and the Saltwater Creek, one of the worst and most treacherous fords on the beach, and reached Scott's that evening. Here I found that Douglas had been suffering greatly from rheumatism all the winter, and though not really fit for it, he was determined to come up the river, at any rate as far as he could. For some time previous to this, the government were desirous of finding a pass by which a road or track for tourists could be taken from the Hermitage to the west coast. This pass they required to be, quote, free of snow and ice for three months in the year, end quote. It was well known from the eastern side of the divide that no such pass existed from the head of the Godley to Mount Sefton, and Douglas had been up the Copeland River, a branch of the Karangarua, in 1892, and reported no such pass as required up that river. Our work, therefore, in the season of 1893-94, to 94, had been the exploration of the Waiho and Cook Rivers, to prove that there was no route such as they required by those valleys, and also to get reconnaissance surveys of this new country completed. Now, however, we had instructions to explore the Karangarua and its branches, and report on the possibility of a track up this river, over some saddle, into the Landsborough River, and down that valley to a pass, found by Mr. T. N. Broderick, from Lake Ohal, on the eastern side of the Divide. This would, I pointed out, be a very roundabout route, but as it would combine both a report on the route, and an exploration of the only district in South Westland, still unexplored, the authorities decided to have it inspected. The Karangarua had been traversed up to Castle's Flat, a large open basin in the hills, twelve miles from Scott's house, or sixteen from the sea. Beyond that point, the Twain and the main branch were both unexplored. Six miles above Scott's, the Copeland River, draining the divide from Mount Stokes, La Perouse, to Mount Sefton, joins the Karangarua, 
and on Castle's Flat, the Twain, draining the divide from Mount Sefton to Mount Monga, flows into the main stream, which takes its rise from the northern end of the Hooker Range. The topography of this district is rather puzzling and somewhat difficult to describe clearly. The dividing range, after leaving Stokes, 10,101 feet, runs practically south for four miles, and then circles round in a southwesterly direction for another four miles, passing the footstool, 9,097 feet, Sefton, 10,359 feet, to Mount Brunner. From there it takes a southerly direction to Mount Monga, 8,335 feet, a distance of some two or three miles, and again strikes in a southwesterly direction to the Host Pass, upwards of 40 miles away. From Stokes, the Copeland Range branches off, and divides Cook River from the Copeland River, and from Mount Sefton, the Karangarua Range, runs slightly north of west for 12 miles, dividing the latter river from the Twain River. From Mount Monga, the Hooker Range runs for five miles, to Mount Howitt, due west, separating the Makaro Glacier from the head of the Twain River, and then turns in a southwesterly direction, continuing for about 30 miles, parallel with the dividing range, and with it enclosing the Landsborough River, which flows from the Macaro Glacier. From Mount Howitt, a short, precipitous offshoot runs parallel to the Karangarua River for about seven miles, and divides the Twain River from the Karangarua main stream, which takes its rise from just under Mount Howitt, and has a saddle leading into the Macaro Glacier. The Hooker Range, therefore, has cut off the Karangarua Valley from the dividing range. The so-called main branch is really not the most important, and is, strictly speaking, a tributary of the Twain River. But when the lower part of the valley was traversed, these branches received their names, and they have been retained for convenience. In referring to them, I shall consider the Twain River the tributary of the so-called main branch. On the 1st of October, we left Scott's house, and camped some four miles above the farm, at the point where the river leaves the hills. We pitched the batwing in some tutu scrub on a sheltered flat, and remained there for a week. From here we blazed or cleared a track up the river for three miles, one mile above the inflow of the Copeland River, where we built a futa and made our second camp. A futa is a small shelter of bark and canvas, raised off the ground, in which to leave provisions and stores sheltered from the weather, wekas, and rats. The one we made here was four feet off the ground, with a floor of seven feet by four feet, and five feet from floor to roof. It was built of rata bark and saplings, and will in all probability stand for several years. Two of us put it up in half a day. On Saturday the 6th, three horses arrived, by previous arrangement from Scots, at Camp 1, and we packed enough provisions in the footer to last us for five months, with the help of birds. Above this camp our hard work began, for we had to carry everything up on our shoulders, this being the last point to which a horse could go. The stores we brought up to the foota were flour, soda and acid, side of bacon, rice, sugar, dry figs, chocolate, cocoa, tea, jam, treacle, a splendid thing for this work, oatmeal, a few tins of sardines and meat, two half-axes, two bill-hooks, a small frying-pan for baking, three billies of different sizes, three mugs, two plates, a tin prospecting dish, ice axes, ropes, instruments, cameras, plates, two bat wings, three flies, biscuits, soap, candles, matches, tobacco, alpine climbing lantern, salt, and pepper. The provisions were supposed to last for five months, with the help of birds. The luxuries, such as cooking utensils and bat wing, would only be taken to the head of the Karangarua. Any further work in the Landsborough or Twain we intended to do in light order, that is, with a fly only, and the stores. The half-axes were necessary in case we had to cut a tree down to spar the river or a bad creek. The bill-hooks were for blazing a track. By way of amusement I had Cook's Voyages, Milton's Poems, and Pliny's Letters, in pocket editions, also two packs of cards. The latter I found most useful when alone, as I played patience, or had a game of cribbage, right hand against left, by way of a change. It is curious how one generally has a tendency to cheat in favor of the left hand. A blanket each and one spare one between us, sewing materials and boot nails, must be added to the above list, and in order to remind myself that I was a civilized being, and only temporarily a savage, I took a toothbrush and a comb. For medicinal purposes, Douglas carried 
quote, painkiller, end quote, and pills, and I, quote, eucalyptus, end quote, depending on natural medicines for other things. Since I had last seen Douglas, he had lost Betsy. She had been with him on a spur of Ryan's Peak, and disappeared in a fog on their way down, no doubt having fallen into a fissure in the rocks, or perhaps over a precipice. Douglas had written asking me to bring him down a, quote, various pup, end quote. The greater the variety of breed, the better. But curious as it may seem, I could not get one at a reasonable price. It is really remarkable how valuable mongrel pups become when you want one. A dog which the owner was on the point of drowning yesterday is worth two pounds today when you make inquiries. Consequently, no sale results. The owner loses a sure half-sovereign, and the puppy probably loses his life in a week or two by running against a stray bullet which happens to be travelling near him. Douglas, however, had picked up a pretty little dog, and we decided to name him after the first bird he found. Soon after we started, he discovered a nest of blue duck's eggs, so we dubbed him Eggs. It was fortunate that we did not wait for him to catch a bird, for he turned out to be quite useless, and only caught one weka some six months later. Poor dog! It was not his fault, even then, because the weka charged him, and he had to kill it. A week of wet weather followed, during which we staged three or four loads, about two miles up the river, and left them under a piece of canvas. The place we named Poison Camp, being the scene of one of Douglas's many extraordinary escapes, when working alone as he used to do. A few years before, he had started up the river by himself to explore it, and got as far as this camp with his stores. From here, he went on to Castle's Flat to reconnoiter the route, and returned in the evening, intending to move his camp next day. He had with him a tin or two of sardines, and one of them poisoned him. He was ten days there by himself, very ill, and sometimes delirious, finding himself more than once away in the bush without any recollection of leaving the batwing. It was also raining a great deal, so besides sickness, he was nearly all the time wet. No one but Douglas would have survived such an experience. This misfortune, of course, terminated his exploration of the river, for a time at any rate. On reaching Scott's again, he opened another tin and gave the cat some of its contents, to see if they were the cause of his illness. The cat only ate one or two of the sardines, and died a few hours afterwards, which was fairly good proof of the exceptional quality of those fish. The return of his rheumatism compelled Douglas to go back to Scott's on the 17th, and in three days a young fellow arrived at the camp to go on up the river with me. While alone at the foot of camp, I had the opportunity of seeing how quickly a Westland River can rise in heavy rain. On the 19th, having been up the river with another load, I turned in early in the evening, and at 9 p.m. the weather was quite clear. I do not know when it clouded over or began to rain, but at 2 a.m. I woke up, finding the bat wing flooded by three or four inches of water in which I was lying. I got up and drained the camp with my ice axe, and could hear the river, which was about twenty yards away, coming down in a regular flood. At five a.m. I went across to the bank, and marked the height of the water, which in the early morning light looked splendid. There was not a boulder to be seen, and branches of trees were careering down in the swirling yellow water. Opposite the camp, there were some stones ten or fifteen feet in height, and they were invisible. Turning in again soon, I slept till ten o'clock, and on waking found the sun shining brightly, and the river already lower. I afterwards measured the rise and fall of the water carefully, and found that between the commencement of the rain and five a.m., say five hours, the river had risen fifteen feet, and by four p.m. had fallen eight feet, regaining its normal level some time during that night. The great rise is due to the course of the river being narrow at this point. From the Futa to Poison Camp was, for a west coast river, good going, but beyond there was half a mile of very rough boulder travelling, not nearly so bad as Cook River, but quite rough enough. It is purely a matter of comparison as to good and bad travelling on these rivers. I have no doubt, whatever, that anyone who had no previous experience of a west coast river would consider the piece from the Futa to Poison Camp decidedly rough going, as the stones are from one to three feet in diameter, and the half mile above the latter place he would only be able to describe in superlatives, for Cook River would either be left undescribed, or the description would be unparliamentary. When I speak of good travelling, I mean only good, compared with the average river going. It is really quite bad enough. On the 22nd, 
my new companion and I went up with heavy loads. I had eighty pounds, and he had sixty-five pounds, to Castle's flat, and when doing the last half-mile were very sorry we had not made two trips with light loads, instead of one with heavy. At four o'clock we reached a knoll or hillock, covered with rata trees, three-quarters of a mile above the lower end of the flat, and here we camped, about twelve miles from Scott's. Two more days were spent in staging up some of the stores left at Poison Camp, and by the 25th we had made everything snug at Camp 3, putting a bark wall six feet high in a circle of twelve feet in diameter right round the camp. As we intended to make this our base of operations, and as it would probably be left standing for three months, we made it very substantial, pitching a large seven-by-four-foot batwing and ten-by-twelve-foot fly inside the bark wall. Bark Camp, or Camp 3, though airy, was the most palatial residence we ever had the whole time we were out. But, of course, it was only our head camp, and unless wet weather compelled us to stay in it, we should be away for weeks at a time. As it turned out, however, I had nearly two months on this flat, as will be seen later. Similar flats are to be found on many of the West Coast rivers, luckily for the unfortunate explorer. It would be heartbreaking work to toil up narrow, boulder-filled valleys or rock-bound gorges, without some hope of a piece of easy going, and the relief of a mile of flat walking after several days of crawling and climbing over large boulders is beyond belief. One feels quite a new man, and after leaving the flat, ready to attack the inevitable gorge with renewed vigor. One or two rivers, however, are without any easy travelling for their whole length. Cook's, for instance, was more or less all rough, and certainly had no flat, and Douglas speaks of the Turnbull River further south, which he explored as having sixteen miles of gorges, out of a total length of eighteen miles. A small flat of half a mile on such a river would make the whole difference to the exploration, for instead of being a grind, it would be a pleasure. Like most of these basins in the heart of the ranges, Castle's Flat is the centre of some magnificent scenery. In fact, from the time the low country is left behind, until we come back down the rivers, notes of admiration are necessary, so far as scenery is concerned. It is a level patch of ground surrounded on all sides by high rocky mountains, which form an oval basin, one and one-half mile long and one mile wide. About the middle of this basin was Queen's Knoll, at the foot of which we made Bark Camp. It is a matter for scientific men to decide how these flats are formed, but here, I believe, a lake existed at one time. The surrounding mountains are steep and bare, with rocky slopes incapable of holding any glacial deposits, rising for some thousands of feet very abruptly out of the flat. At the southern end, or the corner, as I named it, the main branch of the Karangarua comes in, through a rocky gorge and over high cataracts. On the eastern side, the Twain River and Regina Creek flow through similar great gorges and cataracts, divided by a high conical hill of rock and join the main river about the middle of the flat, the former about a quarter of a mile above Bark Camp, and the latter immediately opposite, across the stream. At the northern or lower end of the basin is a large bar of glacial deposit, augmented probably by slips from the hills. This bar has, perhaps, caused the river to flow more slowly, and consequently to deposit a large amount of small gravel, gradually filling up the valley to its present level and at the same time spreading out to a greater breadth. But I think it is more probable that a lake has existed here in the past, for there are numerous terraces on the flat, showing that it was once considerably higher, and it has since been cut down by the river. The bar of old moraine at the lower end would have caused the river to back up and form a lake, while the constant denudation of the hills in the upper valley, and the numerous slips of which there is evidence, would by slow degrees have filled up the valley until the lake ceased to exist. The channel through the bar has then, in the course of time, become lower, and allowed the river to reach its present level, leaving the flat high and dry, and also the above-mentioned terraces. In the middle of the river opposite Bark Camp was an island which, with Queen's Knoll, is nearly all that remains of an old terminal moraine. They are both composed of great boulders, heaped up promiscuously, amongst which large rata trees are growing. The island had a single kiwi on it, so I named it Crusoe's Island. The rest of the flat was lightly timbered and covered with very dense scrub of ten to twenty feet in height, until some of the higher terraces were reached, and these had older and larger trees on them. 
There were also three or four small pakehis, or spaces of open grass, perfectly useless for pastoral purposes, but pleasant to walk over after emerging from the scrub. The general level of the flat was 680 feet above the sea. My present plan was to follow the Duane to its source and cross over a saddle into the McCarrow Glacier and Landsborough River, follow that valley down to Broderick's Pass, some twenty-five miles or more, and then, returning to the McCarrow Glacier, find my way over into the Karangarua main branch and follow it down to Castle's Flat again. This would probably have taken two months if the weather was not unusually bad. On the 25th, we forded the main branch, just above the inflow of the Twain River, and blazed our way with billhooks along the south bank of the latter stream, hoping to find a route through the decidedly ugly-looking gorge. In this we were disappointed, for after a day's hard cutting, we emerged from the stunted vegetation onto a sheer smooth face of rock, rising hundreds of feet out of the water, without any chance of a route. As we got further into the gorge, the hillsides became steeper, and the vegetation more stunted and at last it was evident that we should hardly be able to traverse this side with heavy loads, though we might do it in our present unburdened condition. Telling my mate to await my return, I went on to see what the place looked like round a rocky point ahead. The sides now were practically sheer precipices, and I was clinging on to the scrub entirely. Having at last come to the end of the vegetation and reached the bare rock, I could see that no man could get along on this bank, for the rock was smooth and perpendicular, throwing out short buttresses of rounded water or ice-worn rock, affording no more hold than the side of a house. Hearing the water a long way below, I caught hold of a shrub above with one hand and leant out to look at the river, and it proved to be two or three hundred feet below me. To show how precarious a hold the vegetation has in such places, my weight caused the whole mass of scrub for twenty feet above me to leave the rock and stand out a foot or two in a perfect network of roots, with apparently no hold on the cliff for twenty feet, where there was evidently a crevice or a ledge. It can be imagined that I did not waste many minutes getting back to where the side was sloping less steeply, having no wish to further test the strength of the roots. I believe if the roots were cut along the ledge above that the whole network of vegetation would fall outwards like a curtain for twenty or thirty feet. The gorge, now that we could see into it, was truly magnificent. The south bank rose nearly sheer, that is, precipice after precipice, with ledges here and there for some three thousand feet, straight out of the water. In places, great overhanging rocks frowned down upon us from above, and seemed to be ready to topple forward as we climbed along beneath them. At one point the rocks leaned over to such an extent that a stone would have fallen one thousand feet without touching the cliff once on its descent. The opposite side sloped back at an angle of nearly forty degrees, and was covered with luxuriant bush. Through this gorge the river descends some five hundred feet, in about three hundred yards, over large boulders, up to and over forty feet in diameter, which are jammed in magnificent confusion into the narrow rock-walled channel, forming a cataract to which I have never seen its equal. Above the cataract the gorge continues with its stupendous walls, for over a mile and a half and then the valley takes a bend away southwards toward the glaciers of mount sefton this river descends two thousand five hundred feet in three and one quarter miles through two gorges it was quite evident that the north side would be the best to attempt for it was not by any means so precipitous and had trees growing on it which would afford shelter and firewood the twain was without doubt going to give us some trouble and it would be by no means easy to take our loads through so bad a gorge my companion thought it very grand, and was surprised when I told him that of course we should take our camp through if possible. He seemed to have some idea that we should make no further attempt to get up the river. The next day, sending him down to the Futa for a load, I traversed some of the larger creeks below the flat, and brought up a fifty of flour in the evening. And on the 27th we both went to Poison Camp for the rest of our stores there, spending the afternoon in completing our shelter and bathing in a fine pool close to camp. During these two days my mate was somewhat silent, and occasionally sounding me as to the idea of going on into such bad-looking country. He couldn't understand how we were to find our way if no one had been in front of us, nor could I excite his enthusiasm by saying we were the first two in that country. I was hardly surprised, therefore, on Sunday morning the 28th, to find that he was going back to Scots before it was too late. I remonstrated with him, 
but all to no purpose. It's too lonesome, he said up here. I'm going back. As long as we are together, I suggested, it would not be lonesome. Oh, well, he answered. I'm not the sort that likes being stuck away up here anyhow. I like seeing life. I admit the idea of anyone seeing life in South Westland or anywhere else on the coast amused me somewhat, and as I knew he had never been away from the district, I said, Good heavens, man, where can you see life? At Gillespie's, of course, was the answer, given with considerable surprise at my ignorance. A somewhat feeble description of Gillespie's has already been given, so it may be imagined the idea of seeing life there was rather too funny to be taken seriously, and I fear that the guffaw which greeted his answer hurt his feelings. He left me alone in my glory that morning, taking down a message to Douglas to try and send someone else, and also some letters to post. The fact of the matter is that he was frightened of the rough work, like most other young fellows of the district, for, except south of the Host River, it is hardly possible to induce a man to go into the ranges. This has been Douglas's experience in the past, and is the reason why he did so much of his work alone. The weather up to this point had been rather finer than usual, but on the 28th it began to rain, and continued for a week without interruption, confining me to my shelter with little to do. Luckily I had brought up a flute, but something went wrong with the works, and the lower three notes refused to make any sound. There are not many tunes which one can play on three notes only, so beyond several hours of vigorous puffing, to get more than a wheeze out of the low notes, the instrument afforded little amusement, but a great deal of hard work. Heavy rain has its advantages in the ranges, as well as its drawbacks, for, when amongst the great rock peaks, the waterfalls are wonderfully fine. One day during this week, I counted no less than eighty-six good falls within half a mile of camp, varying from two thousand to three thousand feet in height, those coming down the great rock slopes of Mount McGloin being magnificent. This peak is situated on the southern side of the flat, and its bare rock slopes rise to a very steep angle, and in places sheer precipices, to a height of over five thousand feet above the flat. The weather cleared on Guy Fawkes Day, but as the rain had been cold and snow had fallen on the tops, the river was not high. Deciding, therefore, to explore the creek I had named Regina, I forded across from the camp to Crusoe's Island, a distance of eighty yards, and again from there to the other side, another fifty yards, finding the stream just strong and deep enough to necessitate the use of a pole. Regina Creek joined the river at this point, after descending through a boulder-filled gorge, and over a grand cataract of seven hundred feet, in a quarter of a mile. Not only is the course of the creek filled with large stones, but the hillsides, far up into the bush, present as rough a piece of travelling as I have seen since Cook's River the year before. It took no less than an hour to go the last six chains at the top of the cataract, through large forest trees growing on and amongst boulders of all sizes, up to sixty feet in height and two hundred feet in girth. Sometimes deep gaps between these would be spanned by an old tree trunk, over which was the only way to cross, and very uncanny it was. One never could be sure that the bridge would bear, and the hole in most cases had water at the bottom, in semi-darkness, in which I could see my reflection as I passed over. At the top of the cataract, the valley, as usual, opened out into a broad basin, lined with bold precipitous mountains, at the bottom of which the stream flowed through a small flat. A mile above the great cataract, a smaller one was met with, beyond which the valley again opened out, and showed another rock-bound basin, with a small secondary glacier at its head, which supplies the creek. Though Regina Creek is on a smaller scale than the Twain Gorge, it has very grand scenery, and would eclipse many favorite resorts in Europe with its attractions. I should, however, prefer not to be the unfortunate man who has to engineer a track or road through those terrible boulders, which have to be negotiated before the upper valley is reached. At the foot of the cataract, there was another instance of that reasoning power of trees, already referred to, on an isolated boulder in the stream, two large rata trees were growing and evidently found their rocky home too small to give sufficient nourishment. No doubt when young saplings, they had quite a good time, but now they were full-grown trees and had to find better means of support. The rock was ten yards from the bank, and one of the trees had sent out a sucker, or arm, across the intervening riverbed to the richer soil of the terrace. The sucker was about the thickness of a man's arm, and had twined round two stones, about one and two feet in diameter, on its way to the bank. 
On reaching the terrace, it had lifted itself from the riverbed, and raised with it the two stones, which were to be seen quite four feet from the ground, firmly held in its clutches. The sixth and seventh were wet again, and the river rose too high to allow me to ford it safely, so instead of going to the Twain Gorge, I carried the traverse up to the foot of the Karangarua Cataracts, and went for a quarter of a mile along a very bad and precipitous hillside into the gorge. It is not so fine as that of the Twain, but, if the latter was not so close, the Karangarua Cataract and Gorge would strike anyone as a very grand piece of scenery. The only result of this day's work is summed up in my diary. Quote, the gorge will give us some trouble. End quote. And it did. I now had nine more wet days, during which the river rose eight feet, even on the flat, a real old man flood. It must have been very high in the narrow valley by the futa and in the gorge. It was, of course, impossible to go up to see the cataracts, but they must have been a wonderful sight. I could see great jets of water shooting up now and then, above the high trees from the Regina Gorge. On Sunday 18th it cleared up again, so I took a day off and hung everything out to dry and had a general washing of clothes. I do not mean to convey the impression that this was the first time I had washed clothes since leaving Scots. That very tiresome operation was carried out every week when possible, and as we never took a change except an extra shirt and pair of socks, we had to sit in our blankets while washing and drying the garments. On the 19th I went down to the Futa for a fifty of flour and some odds and ends. The long spells of wet weather had been rather dismal for me by myself, for it had put all the creeks in flood and prevented any work. It also cut me off from Scots, because no one could have come up in the present state of the rivers. However, the last three notes of the flute had not yet given forth any music, therefore until they did I had some employment, and if by any chance I had made them sound, then there were reasonable hopes of a tune sooner or later. Stores also were plentiful, and so far there had been no lack of birds, so I was able to spend considerable time in preparing meals of several courses, and in more time in discussing them, for I generally had to cook the next course while eating the one just cooked. The menu on a wet evening, when there was plenty of food and time to cook, it may be interesting. Potage, weka kiwi and pick a pick a fern, poisson, sardine à l'ouïe, entrée, sardine à la carangarua, relève, boiled kiwi, légume, boiled picky picky fern, roti, roast weka, entremet, flapjack and jam, savory, sardines on toast, dessert, one dry fig. Sometimes the birds would be roasted on the end of a stick, and on Sundays we allowed ourselves one onion, if we had any, by way of a treat. We tried, on these swell occasions, to imagine our tea was brown sherry. Of course, only in wet weather did I try to raise a smile on my own face, by going through the formality of a long dinner. In fine weather there was too much work to do, and when anyone was with me, time did not pass quite so slowly. Sardine a la carangarua is a rather good dish. Cut a thin strip of bacon, roll a sardine in it, fry for a few minutes, and, as the cookery books say, serve hot on toast. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 13. Karangarua River. Continued. Bad weather. Twain Gorge. A Maori arrives. Douglas returns. Karangarua Gorge. Lame Duck Camp. Douglas again ill. Head of the river. A lonely Christmas. Allowing the river another day to reach its proper level, I left camp on the 21st, and, fording just opposite, went up the north bank of the Twain to see if a route was practicable on that side. These rivers are glacier streams, and very cold indeed to ford. After a long crossing, like the one opposite camp, which was about eighty yards of actual wading, the cold made one's legs sting painfully. Though we had to ford creeks or river four days in a week during the work in the lower part of the valley, we never really got used to it, and always found the stinging cold very disagreeable for a few minutes. The weather, at this period of our work, was so bad that it would be monotonous to record my daily experiences. The 20th and 24th were wet days, but very cold, 
so the river did not rise enough to prevent a certain amount of work. On the 21st and 23rd, I made trips into the Twain Gorge, trying first a high level and then a low level route along the north bank, and in each case was stopped by a bluff or terrace of smooth ice-worn rock, some two hundred feet high, facing up the valley and running obliquely from the top of the range down to the water's edge. A party of three could no doubt find a route through the gorge with help of a rope, but for one man it proved too difficult to make it practicable. About seven miles along the Karangarua range from Mount Sefton is Mount Glorious, which sends off a spur in a southwesterly direction for about four miles. The spur divides the Twain Gorge from the valley of Regina Creek, and is the only offshoot worth mentioning from the Karangarua range on either side. The slopes of the range and the spur are smooth, and lie at an angle of thirty-five degrees, showing here and there large patches of ice-worn rock and high bluffs. The soil all along this slope is very thin, and has in many places slipped away, leaving the bare rock. On the north bank of the Twain Gorge, the vegetation, consisting of large trees, has only a foot or two of soil in which to grow. In several places in the bush, there are large bare faces of rock, and the trees seem to have formed a network of roots to help one another to stand. The high-level route took me a mile into the gorge at a height of 1,700 feet above the water, and the lower one I could only follow a very short distance, as the above-mentioned rocky terraces, which ran down obliquely to the course of the river, kept forcing me up before a way over them could be found. The view of the gorge from the furthest point I reached was very imposing. The opposite side, which had proved too much for us before my companion left me, showed a bare face of perpendicular grey rock of hundreds, nay thousands, of feet, with a ledge or shelf here and there on which some trees found a precarious foothold. Several springs of water were to be seen, shooting out from the rock face for a foot or two, and then, dropping downwards, would be lost in space, only reaching the bottom as spray. During the second attempt, I was fortunate enough to witness the effect of a thunderstorm while in the gorge, an experience I should have been very sorry to miss. The echo and re-echo of the thunder from those vast precipices, combined with the mists swirling across their faces, can never be forgotten, and the effect was intensified and appeared far grander, because I was alone. How feeble one's pen feels when attempting to describe such wondrous scenery as this. The Twain Gorge, with its awful grandeur, Regina Creek, with its beauty of a quieter sort, and the Karangarua Gorge, with its fantastic surroundings, require a form of word painting entirely beyond my powers. Again, the charm of a quiet evening after a storm, in the midst of such wet and boisterous weather as we had at Bark Camp, has to be experienced before it can be realized. When sitting out on the river bed below the camp, listening to the murmur of the river, the weird cry of the cacas flying across the valley, the clear note of the tui, and more familiar sound of the English blackbird, which has found its way into these solitudes, and when looking at the picture of blue ice water flowing round a dark bush-covered island, backed up by a gloomy gorge, through which the ice-capped summits of the higher mountains could be seen, lighted up with a warm glow by the last rays of the sun, I used to feel that in spite of my loneliness I was to be envied. The absolute peace and restfulness of such an evening is better appreciated after a hard day of climbing and rough work, alone, forcing one's way into an unknown gorge, or after a long spell of stormy weather, such as there had been lately, when the very elements seemed determined to hinder one's attempt to push ahead. While smoking in quiet contentment, and looking at the magnificent surroundings, one would mentally picture other similar evenings, by no means uncommon, in other localities, and wonder why one never got tired of such things. I suppose a true lover of nature never does tire. On the evening of the 26th, I was sitting in my ragged clothes over the fire, and having been unable to make those three lower notes sound on the flute, I decided to have some songs. While singing, as only a man can sing when he knows there is no one within miles of him, I was startled, in the middle of a verse, by seeing a yellow three-legged dog, and then a Maori, emerge from the darkness into the firelight. Both were evidently very much amused at the picture they had seen before I noticed them. This proved to be Ruera Timahi, or Bill, as he is more commonly called, and he told me that, quote, Tarly, Charlie Douglas, he say you fell go up find Harper, end quote. Having given him some cocoa, which he said, make very good tea, I asked him if he had any letters or papers for me, 
to which he replied, like all Maoris, oh yes, plenty time. However, I was not prepared to wait so long, having been without news for nearly six weeks, so I unrolled his load, and to my delight, found a great roll of papers, Graphic, Detroit Free Press, Strand Magazine, Weekly Times, Pall Budget, and Sketch, etc., also letters, and some fresh meat and onions. Douglas was coming up in a day or two, as he was better, and Bill was to go on with us in order to help him with his load, as he was determined to reach the head of the river. On the twenty-ninth Douglas arrived, not really fit for work, but as plucky as usual, and we had seven days of uninterrupted rain by way of showing him what it had been doing for the past month. However, the budget of papers gave us plenty to read, and the time did not hang heavily on our hands. At last, on the 6th of December, the weather cleared, having been exceptionally bad for six weeks, and raining on thirty-three days out of forty. From this date till the end of summer, the season was as good as we could wish, and fully made up for the previous long spell of rain. Since it was not possible to take our impedimenta through the Twain Gorge from Castle's Flat, it was quite evident that, in order to explore its headwaters, we should have to find a route into the valley by some saddle higher up the Karangarua Valley. In 1893, Messrs. Fife and Graham had crossed from the Muller Glacier into the Landsborough Valley, and finding that river too rough to follow, had gone up the McCarrow Glacier and dropped over a saddle onto a small flat, but had not gone any further, returning to the Muller Glacier again. From the photographs and their description, we knew that they had reached the head of the Twain Valley, but had not attempted to follow it down. We therefore decided to push on up the Karangarua River and get into the Landsborough Valley, and from thence into the Twain River, and coming down it, join on the traverse at or near the point I had reached from Bark Camp. Another route equally good would have been up Regina Creek and over the spur into the Twain Valley, but there was no advantage in taking that line. Sending the Maori down to Scots with a mail and to get a few odds and ends, I went up the river, and crossing Niblick and Tui Creeks, cleared a track through the gorge. It was a difficult and rough piece of work, taking three days to reach the more open valley above, a distance of three miles, of which only one and one-half mile required a track, and was responsible for the whole three days' work. The route, after mounting a steep broken slope, overgrown with tangled vegetation, had to be taken along above the walls of the gorge, some two hundred feet above the river, and below high overhanging cliffs of black rock. The two or three creeks which flowed into the river here dropped over the precipices in fine cascades, having pools between each fall, and wherever the water flowed the bare rock had been exposed, showing only two feet of soil on the surface. There will be terribly large landslips some day in this district, because the hillsides are very steep, and the soil has little hold. In the pools between the waterfalls we found some cockabullies, a small fish of three or four inches in length, unhealthy, black-looking beasts, with bullet heads. One pool had five or six in it, and was between two waterfalls of about fifty feet, so it was rather hard to understand how they had got there. Douglas tells me he has seen these fish climbing up the wet moss at the edge of a waterfall, evidently finding sufficient moisture from the spray. They are also to be seen on the move in very heavy rain. Some of these same fish have been found in the water at the bottom of a deep shaft on the Ross Goldfield. The river descends eleven 1 hundred feet in this gorge, over two large cataracts, which have been formed in the same manner as those in the other branches, by great boulders filling up the narrow rock-bound channel and preventing the water from cutting the valley floor down to a lower level. Above the upper cataract, the valley opens out and has, on one bank, the south, a terrace of hard nice rock, three hundred feet high, at the top of the cataract, which gradually becomes lower as the floor of the valley rises, until it ceases altogether, some two miles further up the river. The opposite bank has a series of rocky bluffs, with good shingle beaches and small grass flats between them, and affords good travelling. On December 11th, the Maori and I took a light camp up to a spot I had chosen a quarter of a mile above the gorge. On the 12th, I sent him back to Bark Camp to bring another load and help Douglas over the track while I pushed on up the river to reconnoitre. The camp we were now in was rather an awkward place to be caught without stores in bad weather, for in order to return to our head camp, it was necessary to ford the river, which ran deep against the rocky side, and cross two large creeks. Had the river risen a foot, it would have been impossible to cross, 
and one's retreat would be cut off. We therefore called this camp the Rat Trap. About a mile and a half above here, the river has cut a most fantastic gorge through the rock. The sides are some forty feet high, and in places approach to within three feet of one another, while the water has worn a very tortuous channel for itself. The banks resemble two pieces of rock, which have been roughly dovetailed and not placed quite into position. Between these walls the water is twenty feet deep in places, and very clear. On emerging from the gorge there is a small flat, two thousand eighty-three feet above sea level, which seemed a good place for the next camp, and was surrounded as usual with high rock peaks. From one of these a fine waterfall, Theodore Falls, descended in four leaps over rocky precipices from a height of seventeen hundred feet. This flat I named Lame Duck Flat, because Jack, the Maori's dog, pursued a duck which had young ones and nearly killed himself by going over a waterfall into the gorge. When a pair of ducks have a brood and danger threatens, the female goes away with the young ones, and the drake draws the pursuer after him in the opposite direction by pretending to have a broken wing. Most dogs know that it is only pretense, and make no attempt to follow, but poor Jack gave chase and, for nearly half an hour, was now swimming and now running on his three legs on the river bed, while the drake kept just five yards ahead of him. At last the bird drew him towards the gorge and, before I could prevent it, Jack was over a waterfall between rocky walls. However, I believe that dog had nine lives, for he reappeared lower down, grinning as usual, but looking very foolish. Next day I went down through the big gorge to Bark Camp, and on the following morning, the 14th, we all returned up to the Rat Trap Camp, Bill and I with heavy loads. On the 15th we moved camp again to Lame Duck Flat, and while the Maori made two or three trips down to Bark Camp for stores, I went on up the river alone with a fly, leaving Douglas at Lame Duck Camp with a batwing. Passing through another troublesome but beautiful rocky gorge, I put up my shelter a mile and a quarter further up the river, at the point where a large tributary, which I named Troit River, joins the main stream. This drains Mount Fetz, 8,092 feet, and flows through an imposing gorge between towering mountains. Half a mile after the Troit stream joins the river, it flows through a short gorge of twenty chains. At the lower end, the rock sides form a great arch over the water, which is twenty yards wide at this place, and approach to within six feet of one another at a height of forty feet from the river an almost complete arch, and sixty yards above this the two sides actually touch from below the water to fifteen feet above. The river here goes down in a whirlpool on the upper side, and bursts up with a furious seething and bubbling on the lower side, evidently having only a narrow passage below the water line. This must be a wonderful sight in a flood. Starting from Troit River Camp early on the morning of the 18th of December, I pushed on through some bad travelling to the head of the river, and, climbing 2,800 feet, reached the saddle 5,641 feet, leading into the Macaro Glacier about noon. A short climb down a snow-filled couloir of 300 feet brought me on to the glacier about a mile above the terminal face. Having thus proved that a practical route could be found into the Landsborough Valley, I decided to return at once down the river to see how Douglas was getting on, and by dint of some pretty fast going, reached Lame Duck Camp at dark, after a day of fifteen hours. Here I found poor Douglas quite unable to attempt further work, and reluctantly making up his mind to return to Scots. It was very hard luck, because he had explored, or shared in the exploration of, every river on the west coast, from the Wataroa to the Sounds, and had set his heart on reaching the head of this, the last unexplored valley. However, he showed his usual pluck by swallowing his disappointment without grumbling, and the next morning began the return valley. Sending the Maori down to Scots, two days' journey, Douglas and I made a long day, and were able to reach Bark Camp at dark, as we had nothing to carry. Douglas was to wait here till Scott sent up some men, and a horse to the Futa, in order to help him down, for he was really not able to walk much, having had to be carried over the creeks and river by me the day before. Leaving him therefore in good quarters, with instructions to the Maori to bring up a load after me, I returned to Lame Duck Camp with a load of four-day stores, to leave at the Rat Trap for use on our return after finishing the Twain and Landsborough Valleys. Having to fix a station on the north side of the valley, the next morning I went down to Coleridge Creek, a large tributary flowing into the river just below the Dovetail Gorge, and draining a small patch of ice 
on the top of the range. The hillside here is bare rock, for some 2,500 feet above the river, varying from 32 to 36 degrees, off which the whole surface of soil and scrub has slipped. The slope was too steep and smooth to attempt in my boots, so I dispensed with them and found that bare feet made the walking quite easy, though the slope was rather steep in places. On reaching 1,300 feet above the river, I sat down to take bearings, and was greatly amused at poor Jack, who had accompanied me. He was looking at me in a very reproachful manner, and trying his best to sit down, first with his head uphill and then down, but of course, a slope at such an angle is not an easy seat for a quadruped, though he could walk up it well enough. However, five hundred feet higher there was a small tarn, ten yards in diameter, on a shelf in the rock, and here he was happy, while I was making further observations. Going down again was rather difficult, but beyond one approach to an involuntary glissade of some nine hundred feet, the descent was uneventful. Leaving two pounds of oatmeal, a tin of hare soup, and one of jam, under a stone at the camp, for use on our return, I made my way to Troit River Camp, taking all the things up in one load. While passing through some bad boulders, which at two places completely bridged the river, I nearly came to grief by trying to get through a hole formed by two of these monsters, lying against one another on the top of a third stone. The opening roughly resembled a single oriel window, about four feet from the ground, and narrow. Therefore, I put one leg through, and lifting my arms over my head got my shoulders through, but the load proved too large and became firmly jammed. Owing to the position of my arms, I was unable to get back, or to reach the sheath knife in my belt to cut the shoulder straps, and I could not use my legs, for they were both off the ground. After some three or four minutes of pulling and straining, which seemed more like an hour, I began to fear that I should never get out, but one more desperate effort was successful, and I extricated myself with numb arms, and pretty well exhausted by the brief struggle. There is no excuse for this mishap. It was gross carelessness on my part to risk the chance of sticking in a place like this, when alone. The proper plan, and the one which I generally adopted, was to get through the opening first, and pull the load after me, instead of endeavouring to pass with a load strapped on my back. Like all other dangers, it was a case of familiarity breeds contempt. From Troit River Camp I tried to follow the Troit stream down through the gorge, but without success, as it was rock-walled with cliffs of three hundred and four hundred feet in height, and full of waterfalls. To go up this branch would require a climb through the scrub, over the spur forming one side of the gorge. I therefore made a climb on the north bank of the Karangarua, and was able to overlook and make all necessary observations for mapping the Troit Basin. Mount Fetz, 8,092 feet, with a small hanging glacier, lies at the head of this stream, and shows a magnificent rock face of some 4,800 feet, cut up in ridges, buttresses, and couloirs. To the right, about two miles up from the junction, a low saddle shows where Jacob's, Makawiho, River, takes its rise, which flows behind Mount McGloin, and reaches the sea eight miles south of the Karangarua. On Christmas Eve, I took half my impedimenta up to a small flat, 2,803 feet, under the saddle at the head of the river, a journey of a mile and a half, taking a good three hours, and leaving them in shelter returned to camp that evening, where I had some observations to make. Not particularly relishing the idea of spending Christmas under a sixty-pound load, and over bad travelling, I decided not to begin festivities until my shelter was rigged up on Christmas Flat. Leaving Troit River, therefore, at five a.m., I reached that flat at eight o'clock, and had the camp pitched two hours later, and having brought up a small piece of suet and a few raisins, on purpose for Christmas, I made a pudding and had it boiling by noon. When everything was snug, I shook hands with myself, wished myself a Merry Christmas, and offered my congratulations on reaching the head of the river. I then produced the flute, and, sitting on a stone near the fire, so that I could watch the pudding, struck up a Christmas tune or two, but, as the three lower notes were still silent, the only part of the tune that my audience could hear was the part that happened to wander amongst the upper three notes. My audience, which, by the way, consisted of two wekas, I killed, after the concert was over, and prepared them for my evening meal. It has since been insinuated, by kind friends, that the audience probably died from the effect of the performance. The best mode of roasting a weka is to make an opening at the back of his neck and clean him, then get a stone about an inch in diameter, and having made it red-hot, put it inside the bird, and, passing a stick through his body, stand him in front of the fire to roast. When the bird is cooked, in about half an hour, we plant the stick in the ground and proceed to carve slices off as it stands up in front of us. 
My Christmas dinner consisted of five courses, namely, Weka's liver and heart on toast, roast Weka, one onion, deviled Weka's leg, plum duff, three dry figs, and I ventured to say that, though I had no brandy for the pudding, and the suet was too old and made it taste tallowy, I spent as happy a Christmas as most people. But I confess that a man must have succeeded in reaching the head of his river after some pretty rough work before he can really appreciate a duff made of bad suet. After a short smoking concert in the evening, I hung the remains of my socks on a branch over my head and turned in. But I suppose there were too many holes in them, for in the morning the contents panned out very poorly, a little hoarfrost only. It must be admitted that a man must be rather a maniac before he can enjoy these sorts of discomforts. Bill, one day after he had rejoined me, put on my cap by mistake, and found it too large, so he said, You fell got Perry tick head. Possibly he was right, and that may account for my enjoying this solitary Christmas. Just after I had hung up my socks and turned in, I heard a shout down the flat, and on going out found that the Maori had arrived, having slept at Lame Duck Camp the previous night. We therefore put up a shelter for him by the light of the fire, near my own quarters, and made another brew of tea before finally turning into our blankets. He had a good load of stores and a grand budget of papers and letters for me, which I spent the next day in reading, for, owing to my custom of going about barefooted, when anywhere near camp, I had burned my instep and was unable to put on a boot or do any work. A most tantalizing invitation was amongst the letters from Mannering, who, writing in November, stated that a large party were to be at the Hermitage for Christmas, and were anxious for me to find some Passover and join them. This would probably be easy to do, had my companion been any good on hills, but he proved to be of little use, so I dared not attempt a high pass with him, and had to give up the idea. The newspapers contained news of the Tsar's death by cable, and were more than six weeks old when they reached me. The Maori made a first-rate companion, and his English was amusing, it was rather like Chinese pidgin English. He always said, I me, for I, and you fell, for you. He could not pronounce the letter R, but always substituted L, and many other little peculiarities. Forgetting birds, he was capital, and, if any were near, he and his dog Jack always found them. The only drawback was that he was painfully slow, and no good on hills or rocks, so I had always to leave him in or about camp, and do the high work alone, sometimes a risky performance. One thing which interested me greatly when he arrived was that he said, You fell son of white man? I asked him what white man he meant. Oh, de white man long time ago he come down with Terapuhi. By this, of course, I knew he was referring to my father, who was the first white man to cross from the east coast to the west. In 1857 he went over at the head of the Hurunui River with a few Maoris and explored the coast down to the Haast River, as it is now called but having written very little about it, the expedition had been practically forgotten. Bill, however, told me he was a little boy, and that his father took him up to Okarito to see the white man, and the old chief, now living at Jacob's River, told him, when he was coming up to join me, that I had the same name, and might be the son of the white man. On the 27th, I sent the Maori up to a rock on the saddle, to leave a load of stores under it, and leaving camp at 4.30 a.m. myself, I made an ascent of Mount Howitt and another peak, Cairn 4, between the Karangarua and Twain rivers. By 6 a.m. I had topped the range, some 3,000 feet above camp, and after spending an hour or more observing and photographing, I went along the arete between the McCarrow Glacier and Twain River to the latter point, 7,400 feet above sea level. The climb was uninteresting from a gymnastic point of view, but being alone, I had to be careful of the large snow cornice on the arete and of some rather steep ice. Also, on the return in the usual fog about noon, it was difficult to see my way down the steep and rotten rocks for a short distance. But topographically, the view was grand. The Twain Valley could be seen over 3,500 feet below, walled in on the left by immense cliffs, which extended from the source down to the gorge by Castles Flat. Across the valley the Karangarua Range, with Mount Sefton at its head, could be followed down to the junction of the Copeland River. On it is the large ice field of the Douglas Glacier coming off Mount Sefton, and then a high offshoot, which I named Pioneer Peak, divides the Douglas from the neve of another fine primary glacier, the snout of which was seen sweeping down a tributary valley into the Twain. 
This, which I christened the Horace Walker, with some smaller glaciers, which I named Wilkes, Pilkington, Morse, Fitzgerald, and Fife, drains into the Twain River, and accounted for the volume of water seen at Castles Flat. To the south, the Landsborough Valley could be traced from the Macaro for some thirty miles, and peak after peak of the dividing range towered up, like the teeth of a huge saw, carrying little snow and ice, but forming some fine rocky summits. The twenty-eighth we spent on the saddle, completing the observations for the Karangarua Valley, and also bringing stores to place under shelter of a rock up there, in order that on our return from the Landsborough to the Twain, we should replenish our supplies as we passed up the Macaro Glacier under the saddle, thus avoiding a descent to Christmas Flat. The ascent to the saddle was an easy one, up an open rough creek for twelve hundred feet, and then one thousand feet or so over open grass slopes covered with large erratic boulders. The creek ran at the foot of a huge precipice of ice-worn rock, the top of which was rather higher than the actual saddle. Beginning at nothing just above the saddle, this cliff became higher as the ground sloped down to the flat, until it was fifteen hundred feet high. A waterfall, the sisters, came over this in one leap of eight hundred feet, halfway up the slope to the saddle, and formed one of the sources of the Karangarua. Four other creeks flowed down in various directions, and joined on Christmas Flat, draining small snowfields on the hilltops. Very stunted and thick mountain vegetation grows for six hundred feet on the lower slopes of the hills, and in places on the flat itself the scrub was fairly thick, and grew to a height of ten or fifteen feet. The greater part was, however, open grass and young scrub, which we burnt. We also fired one or two spurs. At the head of a valley, if the weather was dry enough, we generally fired the scrub, but rarely got a good burn. It never grows again when burnt, and thus, in the future, a few open spaces may delight the heart of any other maniac who tempts Providence by following in our footsteps. End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 14 Landsborough River Into Landsborough Valley New Year's Day No Birds Starvation Rations A Forced March Hast Pass Track Return Up River Broderick's Pass Back at Christmas Flat it is always best to camp, if possible, near some scrub, in case of bad weather, for it would be very wretched to be without a fire for two or three days. From the Karangarua saddle, it seemed that four hours' good travelling would be necessary before the first scrub was reached, which meant about seven hours from Christmas Flat. Accordingly, on the morning of December 29th, I sent Bill away at six o'clock, and followed three hours later with light loads. Unfortunately, instead of two hours to the top of the pass, he took nearly seven, finding the climb, quote, too tipi, steep, peri luff, end quote. Consequently, instead of leaving the pass at 11 a.m. for our descent into the Landsborough, we did not leave until 2 p.m. On looking over the stores on the saddle, I saw that we should be running very close to short rations, unless we had luck, for there was a distance of at least 25 miles to go down this valley and after the return there was the Twain Valley to do. The trip down the Landsborough and back, I calculated, would take at least eight and perhaps ten days, but as no one had been into the valley since it was first explored some years ago by Douglas, we expected to find an unlimited supply of cockpose. It would not therefore be necessary to take much food. These birds, as stated previously, live only in districts covered with birch forests, and the whole of the country from the Landsborough to Jackson's Bay and even further, is birch country. About five years before, a party, of which Mr. Muller, then chief surveyor of Westland, was a member, led by Douglas, made the first exploration of the Landsborough River by the North Bank. During that trip, the whole party of six had only carried a little flour and limbed entirely on cockapoes, which were so plentiful that Douglas says they, quote, had to tie the dog up. She caught too many, end quote. The river is unfordable, from the moment it leaves the glacier, and hitherto no one had traversed the south bank, so I had every reason to anticipate no trouble in finding birds, for we should be the first to travel down that side. Accordingly, I decided to leave as much food as possible under the rock, on the pass, for our two days' work on the Twain River. We therefore took seven or eight pounds of flour, some tea, sugar, a little chocolate, cocoa, and treacle, 
enough to last us with luck and birds for ten days. In fact, so certain was I that we should have no lack of birds, that I almost decided to take nothing but tea and sugar. In addition to the food, we had camera, instruments, a blanket each, field books, ice axe, eight by ten fly, a small axe in case it was necessary to cut a tree for sparring a creek, the homemade light loads of about thirty-five pounds. The Maori no likey, the climb down the snow couloir, but the rope eased his mind greatly, and when he got onto the glacier below, down which we had to go for nearly a mile, the poor old fellow was very unhappy. He pushed one foot gingerly along in front, and brought the other up to it, and so on, having grave doubts whether the ice would bear his weight. However, in a quarter of an hour he felt happier, and when he got onto the surface moraine, he, like he more, and stepped out like a man, being quite convinced that he was off the glacier. I here unroped, and was pushing ahead, when I heard an exclamation behind me, and found that the Maori had stepped on a piece of thinly covered ice, with the usual result of sitting down with more speed than grace. On turning round to get up, he saw that he was still on ice, and with a most ludicrous expression of surprise, he said, Golly, I may tink no more ice. When we ultimately reached the lateral moraine, he was still very doubtful and fully expected to find ice cropping up somewhere. I do not know if anyone has had a Maori on a glacier before, but imagine this was the first time that one has been on alpine rope, and, considering all the superstitions concerning the ranges that Maoris have, I consider Bill showed uncommon pluck in facing it as he did. I could see he was in a regular funk, but he showed his courage by setting his teeth and not betraying it, except by his color, which was yellow. Below the glacier for two miles, the river runs between high terraces, in a channel cut down through old moranic and other deposits, there being a large grassy plateau, 4,300 feet above sea level, on each side of and 300 feet above the river. This is covered with large erratic blocks, and is cut through by the Spence Creek at one mile and Leblanc at two miles, which flow from the glaciers of those names between high terraces. These two glaciers are both near the river, and the streams from them are black with slaty silt, and rush down over large boulders at a great pace. Both gave us considerable trouble to ford, and the latter especially being really dangerous enough to be unpleasant, for we had to step on to large stones a foot under water, between which the stream was deep, and owing to the dirtiness of the water we could only find the next stone by feeling with the ice axe. The stream was running like a mill race, which made it the more difficult to make a sure step. Here, at 3,520 feet, we found the first burnable scrub, and made a rough shelter with a piece of canvas under a rock about sunset, having taken thirteen hours over a journey, which could have been done in seven hours, had my companion been any good in rough country. The Maori worked like a man and did his best, but owing to short-sightedness was painfully slow. It was fortunate that I had made a point of reaching a place where we could have a fire, for it rained for two days but we were not at all happy as there was only room for one of us to sit up at a time however bill was peri tiffy stiff so he was not sorry to lie down most of the day the reason of this discomfort was that we could not find any poles to pitch our fly properly had we been in a better place for timber we should have been happy enough on the moraine of the mercaro i had killed a kia with a stone but had seen no other birds consequently our flower began to dwindle rapidly and by the end of the second day we had little left, though limiting ourselves to a small slice of bread per meal and a stick of chocolate. On the last day of 1894, my diary states that, quote, This is a poor game when caught in bad weather, under a stone where only one can sit upright at a time. We can neither return nor go on. Everything is in flood. When limited to two small slices of bread a day and no birds, the fun begins. Bill and I have been talking of our first kakapo all day, and are beginning to doubt if any birds exist. Menu for the last dinner of 1894. Quote, a conversation about kakapo and wekas, dessert, a slice of bread and cup of cocoa, end quote. This shelter we named Musk Camp, because here our only firewood was mountain musk, as it is generally called. It is a scrub of the myrtle species of a sage green color, and grows to a height of four feet. The leaves, when burnt, smell very like incense, and are not unpleasant to mix with tobacco. It only grows above the 2,500 feet level, a pure alpine shrub. There is another kind, 
of which I have only found two specimens, with a large leaf and slightly different scent when burned. This I call the incense plant, and found it in the Douglas River, near the Margent Glacier. Also one specimen in the Waiho country. To burn a little of either shrub in a room has a delightful effect, and is much liked by those who have had it brought to them from the ranges. The former is found on both sides of the divide. January 1st, 1895 was dull, but the rain had stopped, therefore we pushed on down the valley. A few miles below Musk Camp, on the northern side, a fine glacier sweeps down off Fett's Peak, right into the valley to 2,950 feet above the sea, having its terminal face for a quarter of a mile washed by the Landsborough River. About four miles from the camp, a very large creek from the Arthur Glacier, on the dividing range, descends in a series of cascades through a fine gorge, and then bursts out over great stones into the river. We arrived here at 3 p.m. and found it uncrossable, so built a shelter for the night, hoping it would be lower next morning. We dined off one skinny hia and a quarter of a scone each. Bill felt peri sore inside, making knee peri weak, but it could not be helped. A rough day after breakfasting off a conversation concerning wekas is not easy work, and to have to finish it with only a mouthful or two of kia and bread is trying, to say the least of it. About sunset, we heard wekas, kiwis, and kakapos within fifty yards of us, across the river. The Landsborough has a mighty volume of water in it, and rushes down at a great pace in its rapid descent. It is unfordable from the glacier for thirty miles of its course. It spreads out onto large flats at this point, and could be forded by a horse, if such an animal could by any chance be brought to the spot. Consequently, unable to cross the river, we had to sit and listen to the birds quite close to us, and hunger in silence like Tantalus. Quote, Egens benigne semper dapis, end quote. On the morning of the second, thanks to a hard frost in the night, the creek was four inches lower and enabled us to cross by jumping from boulder to boulder, most risky work, but accomplished without accident. A mile or so below camp I saw a weasel in the bush close to the river, which explained the absence of birds on this bank. Weasels have been turned out over the Haast Pass by some officious person, and have found their way all along the south bank of the valley, but so far have not been able to cross to the other side. Soon after midday we reached the first piece of flat travelling, and continued to meet with small flats, between a mile or two of rough travelling, until the evening when we camped opposite Mount Dechen, some eight miles from, and 1,283 below, the last camp. We got no birds, and were pretty well done up for want of food, having to breakfast and dine off the same conversation, and a small slice of bread, about four by three inches. Next day we again moved on, and travelled till 6 p.m., over extensive flats of open Pakihi land, in the birch forest, with short stretches of bad travelling in between, and one or two nasty creeks to cross. At 5 p.m. we found three wekas, and as soon as we came to a good place to camp, in about an hour, we kindled a fire and had the three birds roasting on three sticks, and with three hot stones inside them. In half an hour they were standing up in the ground in front of us, while we cut, sliced, and devoured them. In another half hour three sticks were all that remained, Jack, the Maori, and myself, having given a very good account of ourselves. A weka is equal to a common or garden fowl, so three birds between two men is a fair meal. I had very little to guide me, as to the whereabouts of the pass I was to report on, and did not know where it could be on this side of the range, but from instructions received before starting up the Karangarua, I imagined that it would be near this camp. However, Bill's boots were quite worn out, and even had we plenty of stores, it would be folly, if not cruelty, to make him attempt a return journey in such footgear. I therefore decided to push on down the river next day. About fifteen miles below here, the Haast River joins the Landsborough River, flowing from the Haast Pass, 1,800 feet, over which a transinsular horse track has been formed for some years from the west coast to Otago. On the beach at the mouth of the river, 25 miles from the junction of the Haast, is a store, and the same distance up the valley track from the junction would take us to Stewart's sheep station in Otago. Mr. Stewart had been the first to cross the pass, on which Sir Julius von Haast afterwards placed his own name, in the early sixties, and put cattle on the very extensive flats which are found at the junction of the two rivers, three hundred feet. 
To reach these flats and the track which skirts them involve fifteen miles of rough travelling, interspersed with long stretches of level going. I decided to go on as far as this track, and then either to go over to Stewart's station or down to the store on the beach in order to get Bill a pair of boots. I had heard, however, that part of the track was to be repaired during the summer, and was in hopes that we should find a road party at work, who could perhaps satisfy our wants, and save the extra twenty-five miles. I intended to go alone, but Bill did not care about being left in these solitudes, so we both set out on the following morning, leaving everything in our shelter. The travelling seemed easy, unburdened as we were, but a climb of eleven hundred feet over a bluff was trying to us after our long fast. This is a good illustration of the trouble caused by bluffs on the rivers, where a spur descends toward the stream and ends abruptly in a cliff, at the foot of which the river flows deep and swift. After ascending and descending eleven hundred feet through bush, we emerged five or six hundred yards only from the point at which the climb commenced, or two hours' work, and little over a quarter of a mile gained. It was dark before we reached the great flats, at the junction of the two branches, but we managed to find an old hut near the track, the remains of one of Stuart's mustering fares, in which to pass the night. At eight o'clock next morning we were wakened by a blast of dynamite, about two miles away, and knew that for the present our spell of short commons was over, for a road party was at work on the track. Leaving Bill to follow, I hurried across the wide flats and riverbed, forded the host stream, and in an hour was near the road camp. Here I met one of the men, and he would not believe that I had come down the Landsborough, terra incognita to them, but thought I had come over the pass from Otago. However, he soon saw something was wrong when he took me along to his tent and saw me sampling a cold stew, for I could not wait until he had cooked a meal. When I explained that the two of us had travelled forty miles down the river, and had only two kias, three wekas, and a little flour between us, in eight days, he said that accounted for my eating a, quote, cold, greasy old stew, end quote. It also accounted for a good hot meal, which he had ready for me when the stew was finished. I knew Mr. Nightingale, the overseer, so went on and found him, but he did not know me at first in my rags, and with four months' growth of hair and beard, nor did I recognize myself when he gave me a looking-glass. The Maori turned up in due course and ate twelve large cold doughboys, suet dumplings, while waiting for something to be cooked, and like me, he, quote, feel peri gland, quite full, end quote. We spent four days in this hospitable camp, and were fed up like two turkeys being prepared for Christmas. It will perhaps be remembered that Bill brought me some old newspapers when he rejoined me at Christmas camp, after having taken word down to Scots about Douglas. Consequently, as there were then rumors of complications in Europe resulting from the Tsar's death, I was anxious to know whether I belonged to England or Russia. The men at this camp, being on the track, were able to get a mail every fortnight, so they were only two weeks behind in their news, and had papers of more than a month later date than those the Maori had brought me. During our first evening, sitting round the campfire, I asked what the news there was, and was told by one man that Jackson and Corbett, or some such names, had decided not to fight. So I said, Is there no other news? and was informed that there had been no news for months. However, on looking at the papers, I found them full of the mail reports of the Tsar's death, not short cable messages and reassuring cables that the general peace was not likely to be broken. This had apparently not been worthy to be called news, as compared with a possible prize fight. This, however, is the same all the world over, for I recollect, when quite a small boy, going to England via San Francisco in 1878, the last news from Europe as we left Auckland said that, quote, war inevitable between England and Russia, end quote. On arriving at Honolulu then, the only port of call, a Russian man-of-war lay near the entrance of the harbour, and my parents were most anxious to have the latest news. When the pilot came on board, there was such a rush that my father could not get near to him, so waiting until he got an opportunity, he said to one of the passengers, well, what news? to which the passenger replied, Confound it, his name begins with a P. The rush had not been to ascertain whether war was declared, or whether the man of war was going to cut off the mails, but only to settle a sweepstake on the pilot's name. It was most amusing to see Jack's behavior here. 
when we arrived he was as well behaved as possible and did not attempt to steal but he was only waiting to find out which camp we were going to patronize as soon as we had established ourselves in mr nightingale's camp he began to thieve right and left from the other tents it is owing to this failing that he lost his leg some months previously bill caught us plenty of eels and wekas which were plentiful here and prevented the double strain of our presence from affecting the stores of our hosts to any extent before the packer came up from the beach with more provisions the maori's boots were quite worn out by the time he reached nightingale's camp and we had a good deal of trouble to get another pair the packer arrived in due course and returned to the beach for a few stores for us but could get no boots so bill had to content himself with two old odd ones belonging to some of the men having got these we started on our return trip up the river on january eleventh with a few pounds of rice and flour the maori took two days over the journey as i wanted him to catch some birds on one of the lower flats but i pushed on and reached camp the same evening doing fifteen miles in eleven hours which is pretty fast going the camp was one thousand and three feet above sea level and seven hundred and fifty above the junction of the hast in eighteen ninety messrs t n broderick and sladden crossed from lake ohau in canterbury over a low saddle of four thousand three hundred feet and descending to the landsborough river stayed a night in the valley and returned to the canterbury side of the range as already stated i did not quite know where to look for this saddle but on going up the river to the camp i crossed three open grassy flats absolutely alive with rabbits and then a fourth and fifth without any of these vermin the small flat on which we were camping was the sixth and this had literally thousands of rabbits the ground being as bare as a barrack yard when we reached this open space and came out of the trees on to the grass it seemed as if the whole surface of the ground turned a somersault in sections in such countless numbers were the rabbits diving into their burrows the ground looked honeycombed the fact that there were two grassy flats free of bunnies between this point and number three flat showed that they had not come up the river therefore they must have come from the eastern side of the range via some low pass probably broderick's having left the pea rifle at christmas camp and owing to the extreme shyness of the rabbits we could not have got any had we wanted them and the three wekas caught on our arrival here on the way down had saved us the trouble of a possibly useless hunt there were none on the smaller flats above this point the next day was too foggy to attempt an examination of the high country so i hunted wekas and snared two or three while the maori who arrived in the afternoon brought four kakapos and two wekas a heavy load the thirteenth was a wet day but we got nine more wekas a little farther down the river and spent the fourteenth which was again wet in smoking them for future use having lost our salt we had to depend on smoke we now had enough birds to last us till we reached the stores on the pass the fifteenth i spent in ascending broderick's saddle which as i anticipated was above the camp and the rabbits must have come over by that route i also looked at another low pass more to the east but neither was of much use for a road being too precipitous the view into canterbury was very extensive and i gloated over the grand open grassy hills for some time before descending again to the terrible west coast scrub and forest there was however no reason to complain of the bush in the landsborough valley because like all other country covered with birch forest it is fairly easy to travel in the bush is fairly open with fine timber clean-limbed trees of five and six feet in diameter and little undergrowth and when the grass line is reached at three thousand five hundred feet there is none of the usual mountain scrub the trees merely become smaller until they cease from near broderick's pass i took several photographs which were unfortunately spoiled by damp like so many others this year i had to leave the boxes of exposed plates sometimes for weeks under a stone or other shelter to be picked up on our final return to habitation and the damp marked them rather badly a grand view of the hooker range was to be seen from this spur mount hooker eight thousand six hundred and forty four feet across the valley with its great horn of rock rising out of fine ice fields looked as if it would give some trouble to ascend the pure white ice dome of dechen eight thousand five hundred feet some ten miles up the river has a snow line of under five thousand feet and except for innumerable berkshrunds would make an easy climb Dechen is, I think, one of the most beautiful snow domes or cones I have seen. 
it rises at a gentle angle which gradually becomes deeper at the top and in its perfect symmetry almost reminded one of the volcanic cone of taranaki eight thousand two hundred and sixty feet in the north island though the actual cone only began at four thousand feet beyond Detchen, the rocky pinnacles of strachan eight thousand three hundred and fifty nine feet rose out of sundry fine secondary glaciers and a little further away fett's peak eight thousand ninety two feet showed his fine rock peak an equally hard nut to crack as his neighbor from a climbing point of view miles away to the northeast i picked up the footstool sefton and dwarf which lie at the head of this and the karangarua river four thousand feet below the valley could be followed for twenty miles the first few miles having a broad flat bottom with many large pakihis or grass flats through which the river twisted here and there flowing close against the base of a spur dividing the different flats gradually however as the eye wandered up the valley became narrower till at last no flat places appeared but each spur descended right into the river and formed difficult and rough travelling on the immediate right hand mount mackenzie over eight thousand feet raised his rocky summit with hardly a vestige of snow or ice a miniature matterhorn which with his shattered rocks would be a troublesome fellow to climb on this side at three p m a storm of rain wetted me to the skin and compelled me to descend to camp on the way down jack caught me two cockapos but the climbing being beyond his powers by the route i took he went home by the line we ascended so no further birds could be found on the sixteenth we went up to our third camp on the down journey and had reached a point halfway to arthur creek the next day when more rain compelled us to camp here i made another ascent on the eighteenth but beyond obtaining some observations and photographs there was little worth mentioning we had two empty treacle tins which we brought in case of necessity and these we filled with the oil of the cockapoo this liquid is of a light straw colour and though not as good as weka oil is very nourishing as i knew we should find ourselves short of flour till we reached the rat trap on our return down the karangarua i saved all the oil i could to mix with the flour it is a good though not very palatable way to economize the maori was very happy now for we had unlimited food having not yet finished the smoked wekas and because i got one or sometimes two kakapo on each ascent they seemed to have been all above the bush line at this time of year which accounted to some extent for our bad luck on the way down the river one evening sitting over the fire bill mentioned a man whom he had seen at the road camp and said he never poor never poor i replied what do you mean he always fat never poor course he's always fat you old fool i said when once a man is fat he generally remains so de maori said bill he sometimes poor sometimes fat he no tucker he peri poor but belly full he peri fat same as de hen he meant by this that a maori gets in good and bad condition in the same way as a weka does according to his food i laughed at the notion at the moment but on looking at my companion next day i saw that his dusky old face was now shining like a copper kettle and he looked like a well-groomed horse in a ragged cover certainly but still well-groomed a fortnight previously he cut a sorrowful figure and looked in wretchedly poor condition after the short spell of starvation i have since been told that the change is quite noticeable amongst maoris according to their food the nineteenth was cold and wet the snow was quite low down but we pushed on in order to cross arthur creek before a warm wind came and caused it to flood and getting over far more easily than before we made a rough shelter opposite fett's glacier in a storm of sleet and rain on the following morning there was little improvement and we travelled on and crossed the leblanc stream also very low owing to the cold and bivouacked out on the grassy plateau three thousand nine hundred and ninety three feet about a mile and a half below the mccaro glacier reaching there about five o'clock the day had cleared during the afternoon and the peaks began to show as the clouds slowly disappeared and by sunset they were all visible looking glorious in their coating of fresh snow this was a wild-looking sight for a bivouac a great grassy basin of two miles by one with great erratic blocks scattered over it surrounded on three sides by towering rock and ice-capped peaks down which avalanches would thunder every half hour making poor bill start and look nervously round over his shoulder for he never got over his fear of the avalanche thunder 
while from a hillock behind we could see miles down the gradually darkening valley of the landsborough in descending which three weeks before we had had such a bad time as the darkness closed in we gathered some stunted vegetation which grew in tufts here and there a few inches high and coaxed the billy until it boiled and sitting down watched the last three of the smoked wekas being cooked they had to be all cooked that evening as bill informed me they were a bit long i e high but they were none the worse for that, luckily, as we always had good appetites. As usual, when we trusted to the weather being fine, and put up no shelter, it began to rain as soon as we had rolled into our blankets, and with equal cussedness, no sooner had we put the fly up on a rope between the ice axes than it stopped again, and the stars shone out. The Maori explained this by saying, He come, he see over de hill, he say, Golly, two men no camp, he lane. He see again, he say, Demfell have camp. He stop. We were therefore able to use the canvas as an extra blanket after all. Bill's boots were again nearly done for, so instead of going directly into the Twain River, we returned on the 21st over the Karangarua Pass to Christmas Flat, taking some of the stores from the depot on the saddle. It was hardly worth while spending three or four days in going down to Castle's Flat for more stores, though we only had bare provision for a week left. It may have been foolish to risk another starve in the Twain Valley, but I venture to say that most persons would have acted as I did and risked it, instead of going down and up that awful river again. This is one of the occasions on which I cursed my fate at having to do such hard work with only one man, and I am afraid I sometimes wished those who were responsible could have had a few of our experiences before refusing us a third member of our party. However, the Twain was still in front of us, so we could not afford to waste time. Accordingly, we only spent a day and a half at Christmas Flat to allow Bill to make himself some Maori sandals, or parara, out of flax. These do not last long, but are capital footgear for ordinary riverbed or other traveling, one pair a day being about the average. On sharp stones, however, as will be seen, they are soon cut to pieces, and three pairs will only do a day's work. Bill was convinced that three pairs would be sufficient for the Twain River, so he made five and left two at the camp when we started on the following day. I spent my day off in washing and generally mending my rags, which hardly resembled clothes, and making a few extra observations in order that no time need be wasted when we came back out of the Twain River. The geology of this district forms an interesting study, and I greatly regretted my ignorance on that subject. Of course, we brought in hand specimens every day, which we looked upon with little favor when they increased to several pounds in weight, for though a fifty-pound load weighs fifty pounds, I am sure it is heavier if there are twenty pounds of stones in place of twenty pounds of food. These specimens, which have been collected for years by Douglas, and during the last two years by me, are from every valley and almost every range of the southern Alps, on the western slopes, from the Waiho River to Jackson's Bay. They are all in the Hokitika Survey Office, labelled and classified according to their locality, with a dip and strike of the rocks noted on each one. A most valuable collection, which should enable a geologist to do good work. When these will be made use of, I do not know, but only hope they will not die the death of most things, which find their way into a public office. Generally speaking, the main dividing range of the Southern Alps is composed of a reddish sandstone, and a great deal of slate, in fact, the prevailing rock is slate, at most of the places I have crossed. The outer ranges are schist and gneiss. The junction of the two formations is generally near the divide. In the district at the south of Mount Sefton, however, the slate formation appears to extend from the dwarf across to the Hooker Range, and to continue along it for some twenty miles, where it again crosses onto the dividing range. The latter seems to be of schist formation, from the dwarf to near Broderick's Pass, and then again runs into the slate formation. The Landsborough River, down to this point, follows the junction of the two formations, the valley having schist on the east and slate on the west side. About Broderick's Pass, the river, however, leaves the schist formation and has cut through the slate and, sweeping round, has found its way to the sea on the west coast. This would lead one to suppose that the Hooker Range is the original dividing range, and that the water of the ancient glacier found its way eastwards. Of course, it requires a geologist to decide this point, and many other interesting points, 
but at present no geologist has been into the West Coast ranges. A great deal that has been written on the subject is pure guesswork, and in some cases quite incorrect. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 15 Twain River, Karangarua. Douglas Pass, Head Basin of Twain River, Douglas Glacier, Camp, Horace Walker Glacier, Moraines, Lower Valley, Hasty Retreat, Bivouac, A Night with the Typo, Return to Habitation. From Cairn 4, on December 27th, I had been able to examine the Twain Valley from Douglas Glacier to the Great Gorge, and could see that we should have a long day's work, with the Maoris slow travelling, before a suitable camping place could be found in that valley. I therefore decided to sleep near the saddle on the night of the 23rd of January. Leaving one day's food on Christmas Flat, and taking the remainder of our stores, now reduced to sufficient for four days, with reasonable luck in birds, we ascended the slopes toward the saddle, and having found a fairly level place, 1,298 feet above camp, slept out on the grass. At 5.45 a.m. on the 24th, we again moved off, and dropping over into the McCarrow Glacier, went about a mile and a quarter up the ice to a saddle, the Douglas Pass, 6,115 feet, on the north side, reaching it at 10 a.m. Here I had to spend two hours making observations and continuing a short distance further up the glacier. The formation of the country is most peculiar here and needs a word or two of explanation. As already stated, the Hooker Range branches off from Mount Munga and runs to Mount Howitt before turning in a southerly direction. The Douglas Pass is a high saddle over this part of the range, but lies only twenty or thirty feet above the McCarrow Ice. On the Twain side of the pass, however, there is a steep slope, cut up into ice-worn rocky terraces, descending for 1,550 feet onto a small gravel flat half a mile wide by one mile long. Thus, this offshoot of Mount Monga seems to me an imposing range from the Twain, but from the McCarrow Glacier appears merely a low rocky ridge rising out of the ice. From the pass the view is weird and magnificent, as indeed is the whole of the Twain Valley, though very limited in extent. Looking northwards, we had on our right and left a ridge rising sharply from us towards Mount Monga and Cairn 4, respectively, and forming the saddle. To the right front, a deep short ravine, surrounded on three sides by overhanging black cliffs, on the top of which several small ice fields are scattered and keep up a running fire of avalanches, forming in the bottom a moraine-covered glacier, which I called after Mr. Fitzgerald, who was in New Zealand at the time with his guide Zulbringen. Forming the eastern end of the ravine in which this glacier lies is the dividing range, well over 8,000 feet, Mount Monga, a very graceful two-horned peak rising at its head. The glacier flows for a mile between the enormous cliffs to the edge of the small gravel flat, 4,562 feet, across which the stream flows to the foot of some immense terraced precipices, which form the left of the picture, and flowing along their base finds its way out of the flat at the northern end under the moraine-covered ice of the Douglas Glacier, which flows past the opening of the basin on the north. Straight in front of us lay the grand neve of the Douglas Glacier, coming off Mount Sefton, which stood in all its white majestic grandeur, framed by these dark and gloomy precipices. This great ice-field lies on the sloping rock roof of the Karangarua Range, and is bounded on the east by Mount Sefton, and the west by some precipices, five thousand feet high, rising up to the summit I named Pioneer Peak, when on Cairn 4. It is nearly four miles long and slopes down to the top of a long, sheer, black precipice, varying from 2,000 feet at the west end to 1,000 feet at the eastern end, over which ice avalanches constantly fall, and to form the trunk of the glacier in the valley, nearly four miles in length. Consequently, we have the peculiar picture of a neve running along parallel with the trunk of the glacier, supplying it with avalanches over great cliffs, and not any single point having direct connection with it. The simplest way to form some idea of it would be to imagine an ordinary lean-to, with a roof about three and a half miles by one, and the back wall averaging five hundred feet. 
the neve lies on the roof and drops its ice over the back wall, forming the glacier which flows along the base of the wall and for half a mile beyond it. The approximate area of the ice field lying on the roof is 2,500 acres. It is probable that a body of water, like the Marleyan Sea by the Alleged Glacier, was at one time in possession of this basin, fed by the Fitzgerald Glacier, and upheld by the Douglas as it flowed past the northern outlet of the flat. When I met Fitzgerald and Zurbriggen later in the season, I could not help regretting that they too had not seen this wonderful sight, which of its kind is the finest seen in our Alps, and I doubt if it can be surpassed anywhere. Looking to the south, the view was cut off by the spurs of the dwarf, but the fine sweep of the Macaro Glacier, as it curved past under the great precipice from the Karangarua Pass and Mount Townsend, was beautiful. Beyond the pass, Fetz, as usual, showed prominently, his fine peak reminding me very much of the Weisshorn. At noon we began the descent into the Twain, and I had the most trying bit of work of the season, for not only had the loads to be lowered down on the rope over the rocky faces, but the Maori and his dog also. Poor old Bill did his best, but is not a mountaineer. He is only an honest Maori who was never built to do alpine work. We had the pea rifle with us and managed to shoot two kias on the way down. A short, quick tramp took us across to the northern end of the flat, and four hours, three of which were occupied in going two miles over the worst moraine I know, brought us at 7 p.m. to a small flat, a quarter of a mile below the Douglas Glacier, where we rigged up a rough shelter near some stunted scrub, 3,600 feet above sea level. The Maori's sandals, of course, made him very slow, and were cut up quickly by the sharp stones of the moraine, and the last of the three pairs he had brought with him came to pieces on his arrival at camp. While making our shelter of scrub we got four wekas, and though without salt or sugar, indeed, we were getting used to it now, had a good meal, the first since 6 a.m., and were soon asleep in our blankets. On the 25th, I went down the valley to the terminal of the Horace Walker Glacier, 3,511 feet, about a mile below camp, and skirting along its great lateral moraine traversed the grassy and rocky slopes, until I could see through the great gorge into Castle's Flat. Having completed the lower portion of the valley, I descended to a most interesting system of lateral moraines near the Horace Walker. This glacier flows from a basin formed by Pioneer Peak and the Karangarua Range, and descends in a westerly direction for nearly two miles, and then sweeps round until, at its terminal face, it is almost flowing in an easterly direction, the whole roughly forming a large horseshoe. At the point where it comes out of its valley, it has formed a very fine lateral moraine on the outer side of the curve, and behind this moraine is the perpendicular series of smaller moraines mentioned above. From the top of the present lateral moraine on one side to the ice is over 100 feet, and on the other to the river there is about 450 feet descent. About the middle of the curve on the river side of this lateral moraine, and 60 feet below it, there is a series of semicircular moraines with great gaps or openings in their sides, like gates in an old Roman fortification. And in front of each such opening a small moraine has been thrown up, as if to cover the entrance to the fortress. These small terraces are 10 to 20 feet high and extend in curve after curve for 200 or 300 yards in the widest part until there is a large unbroken semicircular moraine which falls away nearly 400 feet on the river side but is only 30 feet high on the inner side of the fortress. It would have been an ideal place to defend in ancient days and really seems to have been built by human hands, each earthwork being thrown up with great accuracy. I find some difficulty in accounting for these old moraines, for they are lower than the present lateral. Had they been higher, there would be good reason to suppose that the glacier at one period of its existence took a wider sweep before turning up the valley. There may have been a large terminal moraine thrown across the valley by the ancient ice flow of the Douglas Glacier, and the horse walker, being unable to cut its way through, has been turned in its course. I'm not, however, prepared to allow that these great moraine deposits belong to the Douglas Glacier, but am of opinion that the Horace Walker has been responsible for them entirely. It is more than probable that the ice originally flowed directly down its valley and came out at right angles to the Twain, forming in the first place an outer moraine across about two-thirds of its terminal face, and having its outflow at the other side where the moraine did not exist, and then, retreating a little way, deposited another great moraine, partly terminal and partly lateral, 
which now forms the high lateral moraine. This was followed by a considerable shrinkage, until the glacier was smaller than it is now, and then a period of advance set in, causing the ice to flow down against the old terminal moraine, and being unable to push it aside, turned along its base and flowed down to its present position. Had this been the case, the glacier would have the old terminal moraine along its side, and make it appear to be a lateral moraine. Otherwise, I am at a loss to account for the easterly curve of the glacier up the valley, unless some such old moranic deposit caused it to do so. The natural course would appear to be down the rapidly descending main valley of the Twain River. From point H, above this lateral moraine, a general view of the valley can be obtained, and the wonderful precipices bounding it on the south are seen to advantage. From the Douglas Glacier to Castles Flat, the whole of the southern side is walled in by rocky precipices, descending from terrace to terrace for 2,000 and even 3,000 feet. At the base of these the river flows, having formed here and there a small flat of an acre or less, behind the short buttresses, they can hardly be called spurs, of the range. About a mile and a half after it leaves the Douglas Glacier, the river is joined by the short but deep stream from the Horace Walker Ice and a mile further, having passed along the foot of the moraines of that glacier, it descends rapidly through a narrow and deep gorge. Apparently, it has here encountered a rocky bar across the valley, and has cut a narrow, black-looking channel of over two hundred feet in depth at the lower end, while at the upper end, where it first encounters the bar, it has only been able to wear away a shallow channel of a few feet. On each side of the gorge is a level floor of water-worn rock, and at the lower end the walls cannot be many feet apart. I had not time to go down and inspect this place closely. Lower down the valley, after another deep but short gorge between two picturesque rocky bluffs has been passed, the precipices, as it were, retire back from the river and rise out of a gentle slope of debris, which lies at their base for three or four hundred feet, and is covered with vegetation. Above this slope the cliffs are more sheer than before, and in places look as if they had been rough-hewn by human hands for hundreds of feet. After flowing along the foot of the short slopes, for a mile the river turns to the left, and descends rapidly over the great cataracts through the gorge to Castles Flat. On the northern side of the valley the Karangarua Range rises gently, at an angle of about thirty degrees, broken here and there by terraces of rock, and its grassy slopes evidently having little hold on the rock underneath for spaces of smooth rock can be seen where the soil has slipped or been washed away. Above the Horace Walker stream is a grassy flat of about twenty acres, on which numerous heaps of old moraine are to be seen, and after passing along at the foot of the terrace, another flat is to be found higher up the valley of similar size, at the edge of which we were camping. For a quarter of a mile between the camp and the glacier, there was a confused mass of moraine hillocks and large erratic blocks, more or less covered with stunted scrub, and beyond this again, filling the upper portion of the valley, is the moraine-covered trunk of Douglas Glacier, 3,663 feet, flowing at the foot of black cliffs, parallel with its grand neve, which descends like a great white mantle from Mount Sefton's mighty shoulders. During the day I had been rather anxiously looking out for some flax to take back to Bill, with which he could make some more parara, and at one time I feared there was none growing in the valley. If there had not been any, it would have been very exceptional, for it grows as high as any other mountain scrub. It would have also been most awkward, because Bill could not have gone back barefooted. However, on the Horace Walker moraines I found some, and cut enough for all purposes, for I wanted some for the bread also. This year, when away from Castle's Flat, I used to knead the flour on a flax mat, and bake the bread on a flat stone over the fire, which turned out, perhaps, better bread than the frying pan. Having cut all the flax that we were likely to require, I set fire to the scrub on the old moraines, little thinking that I was starting more than an ordinary conflagration. The scrub, however, was dry, owing to a prolonged spell of fine weather, and burnt for three whole days, filling the valley with a dense cloud of smoke, which was seen, so I heard afterwards, over Mount Sefton at the Hermitage. This burning of scrub will benefit any future expeditions, for it never grows again, and will leave a few open patches in unexpected places. On the way down from camp in the morning, I had avoided the Horace Walker stream by crossing on the ice, but as I was now traversing the main river up along the side, I had to ford the stream near where it joined the river. It has a very rapid descent, and was dirty, 
and fairly high after the hot day, so I found it rather awkward to cross, and when just in the centre I trod on a large loose stone and fell over. Luckily, my hands came onto another stone near the surface of the water, so I was able quickly to recover my footing. But had they gone into deeper water, nothing could have saved me from being washed out into the main stream, which was rushing along toward its rapid descent into the gorge. The Twain is unfordable in the summer, from the glacier to Castle's Flat, and like all other such mountain torrents, it would kill a man by dashing his head against a boulder before it drowned him. The cold of the water is, of course, intense. Even where it joins the Karangarua, miles below the glacier, the temperature was just under 40 degrees Fahrenheit. When at Bark Camp on my return, I measured the daily rise and fall of the river in fine weather, due to the melting of the ice up the Twain. The stream at that point was about 80 yards broad, and the rise and fall varied from 3 to 6 inches in the 24 hours, according to the temperature of the day. No doubt, if such measurements could be extended over a long period, some interesting figures could be recorded as to the melting caused by the sun in summer and winter. My measurements only extended over three days, and were therefore of little value. Arriving at camp about 7 p.m., I found that Bill had cooked the rest of the birds, which we found on the evening before, but had failed to find any more. On the 26th, I was again working in the lower part of the valley for nearly ten hours. These long days of heavy climbing were hard work, as the Maori was no good on the hills, and had to be left in camp. Also, I had to carry twenty-five pounds of instruments, cameras, and books all day, a constant handicap. In fact, ever since the beginning of December, all the high work had to be done alone, and I had no companion on any expedition from camp on the mountains. Bill spent his day in making sandals and looking for birds, but had no luck, so we were again reduced to small rations. We had only brought enough stores into the Twain to last us for four days, if we got plenty of birds. In fact, we were practically depending on the latter entirely, and the little flour, etc., was not equal to more than one or two fair meals. No one had been into the valley before, therefore birds should have been plentiful, as they were in the Karangarua Valley. But not only did we get none, except the four above mentioned, but also those four were too poor to be of much use. There was still work for two days to be done and I dared not risk being caught in bad weather here, because our retreat would have been cut off. So instead of taking a day off on Sunday, the 26th, I went up the Horace Walker Glacier to the foot of the ice fall. Though of no great size, this glacier is very fine, and has only one small patch of surface moraine on it, about a mile from the terminal face. Before it reaches the Twain Valley, it is bounded on the northwestern side by fine precipices of 900 to 300 feet in height on the top of which a large secondary glacier lies, and drops frequent avalanches onto the trunk of the Horace Walker. This upper ice field I named the Pilkington Glacier, and it comes from a nice-looking peak, Mount Glorious, and forms a snow saddle between the Twain and Regina Creek valleys, draining partly into the latter. The neve of the Horace Walker is of considerable extent, and lies in a basin formed by the Karangarua Range, and the short high spur on which is Pioneer Peak a fine icefall between high cliffs connects it with the trunk. Had there not been several photographic plates and some notebooks left in various parts of the upper Karangarua Valley, I should have endeavoured to pilot the Maori over the Pilkington snowfield into the Regina Creek Valley, making an ascent of Mount Glorious on the way. From that peak, a view into the Copeland Valley could be obtained, and much useful work done. But it was not a fit climb for one man, and my companion was not equal to it. He was willing, but utterly unable to do these things. How I regretted that Douglas, or some good man, was not here with me, wondering why this work was not considered worth the additional slight expense of a third member to our party. On returning to camp, I was aware that had the Maori found no birds, our meal would only consist of a small slice of bread, and I could see by Bill's face that he had found nothing, so did not ask any questions. When the billy had boiled and tea had been made, I took the last scone but one out of the bag and quartered it, one piece each for tea and one piece each for next morning. These scones were round and six inches in diameter by nearly an inch thick, so it can be seen that a quarter is not a sumptuous repast. To my intense surprise, Bill said, I mean no hungry, and refused his quarter. I knew he had not eaten anything all day, any more than I had, because there had been two scones in the bag that morning. I therefore exclaimed, Not hungry? 
That's all humbug. I me big feed today, said Bill, belly full. Me feel gland. What did you have? I asked. Oh, plenty food. You fell half bleed, he said. I me had Maori hen, weka, very good. I knew this was not true, because there were no feathers round the camp, so I said, You old sinner, where are the feathers? But he stuck to his point and replied, You fell work all day. I me lie down all day and have good sleep, sleep, and no hungry. You fell half bread. It was evident then that the old boy wanted me to have all the food, because I had been working, and go without himself, having tried to tell a lie about the weka, but protesting was no use. He still held out and said he was not hungry. At last I said, All right, old man, if you can't eat that bread now, put it aside till tomorrow. You are not going to starve yourself for me. We are both in the same boat. This did not satisfy him, but after half an hour I saw him take the bread and eat it quietly, as there was evidently no chance of my taking it. I could not help being touched by his unselfishness, which fully corroborated the many stories we hear of what fine characters some of the old Maoris have, quite different to the younger generation of natives, I fear. So far the weather had been cloudless and perfect, but a great change appeared on the following morning. Instead of the beautiful clear blue of the New Zealand sky, there were high, black, windy-looking clouds drifting from the northwest, the forerunners of bad weather. The effect of an approaching northwest storm is very grand in the high ranges of the west coast. It first shows in the shape of high, light, filmy clouds, which drift slowly over and far above the dividing range, gradually thickening and closing together, until they appear like a coal-black curtain against which the eternal snows of the Grand Peaks stand out with weird distinctness. A few hours after this black-looking pall has passed behind the range, ragged and torn clouds roll in from the sea at a level of from 4,000 to 6,000 feet, and cover everything, bringing with them the rain. Accordingly, I could see that we should be fortunate if the weather remained fine for even 24 hours. Hastily swallowing our quarter scone and cup of tea at 6 a.m., we rolled everything up preparatory to a quick retreat out of the valley. I gave the Maori most of the things to carry, and sent him on up the moraine-covered glacier to the small gravel flat under Douglas Pass, and followed with the instruments and camera, making rapid observations, and carrying the traverse up the trunk of the glacier. On reaching the flat about 2 p.m. I spent two hours traversing it round, fixing more stations, and going a little way on to Fitzgerald Glacier, and at 4 p.m. returned to the large rock at the northern end of the flat, near the moraine of the Douglas, under which we intended to bivouac if necessary. By this time, however, the rain clouds had obscured the main peaks, and I was unable to fix the point from which my baseline was to start, so reluctantly decided to make the best of a bad job and stay here in spite of the storm and no food. From this flat we could retire to Christmas Flat at a pinch in any weather, but at the camp below Douglas two hours' rain would have cut us off completely by flooding two creeks which we had to cross. Rather than go away, leaving the work incomplete, I determined to stay on this flat for another day at least, though there was only enough grass to boil the billy with difficulty. By sunset we had chained the baseline and turned into our blankets, having eaten a quarter of the last remaining scone. I shall never forget the grandeur of that night, and I do not think the Maori will either, though for a different reason. Within fifty yards of us the hillside rose sheer for nearly one thousand feet, and then in tiers and ledges for the same height, above to near Cairn 4, and looked as if it might at any moment fall forward and annihilate us. Half a mile away the Douglas Neve sent down its ice avalanches all through the night, sometimes twenty-five, sometimes thirty in the hour. These crashed down with a sharp report like a great gun, echoing and re-echoing from cliff to cliff, surrounding that great basin. The thunder of one had hardly died away before the next began. And then at midnight the storm burst on us with its peals of thunder and its vivid lightning, adding to the noise of the avalanches and causing an indescribable din, as the crash of the thunder and roar of the avalanches echoed from the surrounding precipices, sounding as if all the demons of ancient and modern times were loose. Poor old Bill, no likey, and during the hour or two after midnight, while this overwhelming noise was going on, I believe he was calling all the gods to witness that he would never come into such a place again. Every now and then, with a nervous laugh, he would say, I'm a tinky typo, devil, here. Fortunately, 
At 3 a.m. it had calmed down, so I got up and saw that the mists were lifting, giving me an opportunity at 4 o'clock to fix my baseline. At 7 a.m. we ate the last quarter of the remaining scone, and rolling up our loads, went over to the foot of the ascent to the pass. The mist, however, would not give me a chance of seeing the proper route, till we had waited for an hour or more, but at last an opening gave me the line to take, and we began our climb. The rope was necessary three or four times to give my companion and his dog a help over the rocks, but he travelled well, and needed much less nursing than on our descent. After reaching the pass, descending the Macaro Glacier, and dropping over the Karangarua Pass in a thick, wet mist, we made Christmas flat in the afternoon, having got three kias on the way. Here a glorious stew and a large feed of porridge soon made us less hungry, and helped us to enjoy the luxury of even a batwing after our long spell of a month in makeshift shelters. The three days of starvation in the Twain was my fault entirely, for I deliberately took the risk, instead of going down to our depot for more provisions. However, I believe that anyone in my place would have done the same, that is, taken the risk, rather than going down the river and punching up more stores over that rough ground. The 30th of January was very cold and wet, snow falling round the camp, so we stayed in our batwing by a good fire all day. On the following morning we went down to Lame Duck Creek, as there was nothing to eat at Christmas Flat, having given up waiting for the few additional observations I had hoped to obtain, for the weather was still bad. Here we were again amongst our friends the birds, catching three ducks and two weckas. On the 1st of February we again moved on, reaching the rat trap in the afternoon, where I stayed for four days, having to make a climb on each side of the valley. I sent the Maori down with part of our impedimenta to Bark Camp on Castle's Flat, telling him to bring back some sugar, flour, and salt. It may be remembered that we left four days' provisions at the rat trap on our way up the river, but of these the flour had turned black with damp, and the jam was fermenting in the tin. On the Maori's return he stated that there was no sugar at Castle's Flat, a great disappointment, as it was now more than two weeks since we had any. Consequently, I was tempted to eat the jam, which, owing to fermentation in a tin, may have become poisoned. On turning the pot round in my hand, however, I saw a guarantee by the maker, Kirkpatrick of Nelson N.Z., that his tins were especially prepared, and no chemical action could be produced by fermentation. So I decided to take the risk, for we were hungering for something sweet. I suggested to Bill that we should toss up, as to who was to try it first, but he laughed and said, You me both eat. We therefore each took some, and between us finished the whole of it. Next morning I had forgotten all about the jam, when Bill suddenly said, You me no dead, jam no bad. This reminds me of an occasion some weeks before, on which the Maori lost his footing, and fell over a sheer drop of fifteen feet, onto some rocks below. I did not hear him fall, but was astonished by a shout from below. I mean no dead, I mean right. And on making investigations, we found he had fallen onto his load, which, as is usually the case, had turned him over onto his back, and he was practically unhurt. On the 4th of February, we went down to Bark Camp and spent two or three days, generally washing up, patching our rags, bathing, and posting up the field books. The Maori had a complete change of good clothes here, but mine were at Scott's, so I had to do the best with my present rags. It was little use trying to mend my nether garments, for they consisted of canvas patches fastened together by other patches, very little of the original stuff remaining, but care enabled me to make them sufficiently decent to appear at Scott's by binding them round my legs with flax. When Bill put on his good clothes, he looked a terrific swell beside me, and I told him so, saying, Well, Bill, old man, they'll think you are my master. But he would not admit it. Oh, no, he said, you fell to boss still. On the seventh we wended our way down to the low country, and calling at the foota for a pair of boots which I had left here in November, those I had on having completely come to an end, we arrived at Scott's farm in the evening, just a day or two over nineteen weeks since I last saw habitation, for I had been in the ranges ever since we originally left on October 1st, 1894, and never been nearer to it than the foota during that period. End of chapter 15